This is the Ford Theater, a full hour of radio drama. Our play today, Michael and Mary, the love story of two people who took a risk to find happiness. The Ford Theater, presented by the Ford Motor Company, makers of Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln cars, and Ford trucks, farm tractors, and motor coaches. In the past three generations, millions of Americans have learned to rely on Ford products. For three generations, Ford has led the way in the development of more dependable, more economical transportation. Today, in the third generation, more than eight million Americans prefer Ford products. They know from experience you can depend on Ford. Our regular Ford Theater spokesman, Mr. Howard Lindsay, is away today in Detroit, supervising with his colleague Russell Krauss their forthcoming production of Life with Mother. In his stead, we take great pleasure in introducing the eminent actor, star of the current Broadway hit Joy to the World, Mr. Alfred Drake. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today's Ford Theatre play was written for the American stage by an Englishman who has spent his life making people laugh or making them think. His name is Alan Alexander Milne, A.A. A. Milne, author of those delightful books for children, When We Were Very Young and Winnie the Pooh. In Nancy Moore's adaptation for the Ford Theatre, Michael and Mary is presented as a story within a story. <laughs> begins in a distinguished house on East 63rd Street in New York City. This is the home of Michael Rowe, the well-known novelist. And like all writers, Michael knows that truth is difficult to express, that the full truth often cannot be told at all. This afternoon, Michael, his wife Mary, and their son David are discussing David's forthcoming marriage. I don't know if I like this big wedding deal. But Linda does, David. Mm -hmm. And so does your mother. So I'm outnumbered. <laughs> when you two were married, did you obtain the cooperation of your respective papas and mamas, get solemnly engaged for a decent length of time, and then get solemnly married? Well, no, it wasn't quite like that. <laughs> Not quite. Well, all I can say is I hope Linda and I have a life together that's as fine as yours. In general, I hope you do too, David. But Mary and I have had a few ups and downs you don't know anything about. I've only seen the ups. What downs? Being poor once? Huh. Linda and I could take that in our stride just the way you did. No, I wasn't thinking of that. Hmm, what then? <laughs> Mind your own business. Oh, come on, <laughs> Dad. Stop being mysterious. Michael's only teasing, David. Refusing to tell his son the facts of life on the eve of his marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, were you and your father good friends the way we are? Uh, hardly. You and I joke together. We're on easy, casual terms. I respected my father, but he always held himself aloof. I never told him a joke in my life. There's your phone, Michael. I'll take it in the study. Hello? Mr. Michael Rowe? Yes? This is Inspector Colliers, Mr. Rowe. Who? I was Lieutenant Colliers when we met ten years ago. Now, do you remember? Oh, yes. Uh, of course, Inspector. I'm sorry. Ten years is a long time. That's all in how you look at it. Have you forgotten the occasion of our meeting? Why... No, I uh, just haven't thought of it. That's so? The police never really closed that case, you know. I didn't know. I thought... Yes, I'm sure you did, Mr. Rowe. Well, I've just turned up some new evidence. I'd like to see you this afternoon. Inspector Colliers, is this necessary? We went through enough unpleasantness ten years ago. Very necessary. I'll be at your house within the hour. Very well, Inspector. We'll be ready. Mary... Yes, dear? Would you come here a minute, please? Oh, Michael, don't tell me your publisher wants you to do some rush job. Close the door. Michael, what's the matter? It's come, Mary. What's come? That was Lieutenant Colliers, Inspector Colliers now. Michael. There's new evidence. He's coming here in an hour. Oh, no. <laughs> Ten years. Ten years of stolen happiness. Every year feeling more safe, more certain. And it was only a reprieve. I think I knew it would come, Michael. 
I think I always knew. But why now, just when David... We have to tell him, Michael. Yes. Maybe we were wrong not to tell him before. No. At least he's had 22 years without the shadow we've lived under. He's had that anyhow. Oh, but Michael, what will this do to him? To his marriage? To his feeling for us? Hmm. Always thinking of David. Never of yourself. But don't you remember? We did it for David, not for ourselves. And now, it was all for nothing. Was it, Mary? I don't think so. But only David can answer that after we've told him. Come, darling. There isn't much time. David. Mary and I have something to tell you. It's a story we always hoped you'd never have to hear. But something happened just now, that phone call, which changes everything. What's wrong, Dad? Maybe we should have told you before. I don't know. All through my life, that's been my trouble. I didn't know. In my father's age, almost everything a person wanted to do was wrong. In this age, almost nothing you want to do is wrong. I came in between the two. When one still felt right was right and wrong was wrong, but didn't quite know which was which. Sit here beside me, Mary. Yes, Michael. For a long time, what we're going to tell you only concerned Mary and me, David. And then you, without your knowing. But now it concerns Linda, too, and your whole future. Linda? Well, for Pete's sake, what is it? It's the story of Michael and Mary. It begins 24 years ago here in New York by the Hudson River. I was meeting a girl for dinner, a girl named Carol. It was a celebration. I'd sold my first story that morning. I had the world by the tail. As I walked toward the place, it was just dusk. Carol wasn't there. But another girl was. A shabby, forlorn-looking girl standing by the shore, staring at the water. She didn't see me or hear me as I moved across the grass. But something about the expression on her face and the tenseness of her body made me stop and look at her sharply. Such hopeless misery and utter dejection I've never seen. And I had the strong feeling that I'd better say something to her, anything, because soon it might be too late. I said the first thing that came into my head. Wonderful weather, isn't it? Is it? Well, spring's always nice, don't you think? I used to think so. Are you waiting for someone? Please, I... You want me to go away, don't you? Yes. I don't think I'd better. Then I'll go. Oh, please, listen. I, I'm not trying to be fresh. I... Well, you look as if you need someone to talk to. What's the use of talking? Sometimes it helps. Not anymore. Oh, go away. No, I'm, I'm not just curious. I'm not prying. I want to help you. Please. Please don't be nice to me. I can't stand it. Oh, things are never as bad as... You it... can say that. But you're not me. And you don't know. Tell me what's wrong. Everything's wrong. People, promises, marriage. Everything. Oh, why did you have to come? Just when I... And now... Go away. I can't go. Come and sit on this bench. Oh. All right. But it won't do any good. Nothing's any good anymore. I didn't try to make her talk at first. She needed to cry, and I let her. Better she should drown in tears than in... Well, that was the scene Carol walked in on. A shabby but very lovely girl crying on my shoulder. Oh. Well. Oh. oh, hello, Carol. Very pretty and touching. Do introduce us, Michael. Yes, uh, uh, this is... Uh... Never mind. I'll go now. Oh, no, no, you can't. You needn't worry. It was all an act. What? That's how I make my living. I don't believe it. This is an act now. Really, Michael, is this the great play you're always going to write? I must say you've given me a very small part. This isn't a joke, Carol. This poor girl, starving. I'm not starving. If she's starving, take her to dinner. That's a good idea. We'll all have dinner together and talk it over. No. You can help, Carol. You're just the person. Am I? Really, Michael, men do things like this so badly. It's terribly sweet of you to ask me, but I'm afraid I have a date. Uh, do take Miss, uh... I wish I knew your name. Or is it a secret? Mary Weston. Thank you. Michael, may I introduce you to your friend, Miss Weston? 
And this is Michael Rowe. Well, have a nice dinner. It wasn't exactly a nice dinner. Not a gay one, certainly, the kind Carol meant. But I finally persuaded Mary to talk. It was an old story. How can you know what people are really like? He said such beautiful things. And he had such beautiful manners. I believed him, all the promises. And so we got married. And it, it didn't work? He didn't even try to make it work. The only thing he tried to do was make me hate him. And I did. He thought it was very funny. It made him laugh. And then when he'd spent all my savings, he just disappeared. But if you stopped loving him, then why did you care? I don't care. Not about him. I care that I was such a fool. Oh, but that's not enough to make you do what you tried to do. Everything's gone wrong ever since. I haven't any money, and I can't get a job. Well, won't your family help? I haven't any family. I haven't anything. Well, that's all, Mr. Rowe. Thank you for dinner. Well, you're not going. I made up a hard luck story, and it got me a dinner. I told it very well, don't you think? And you believed it. Will you write a story about me now? Oh, stop that. If you haven't been telling me the truth, then there's no truth in the world. You were telling me the truth, weren't you? Yes. Where do you live? Nowhere. They turned me out this morning. You've nobody and nothing? Nobody. Nothing. Goodbye. Thank you again. No, no, wait. I thought of something. Oh, you've done enough. And I thank you for it. But I still have my pride, whether you think so or not. And I'm not going to take money from you, if that's what you've thought of. From a stranger? No. Well, if that's pride, it's nothing to be proud of. If you were shipwrecked, would you refuse to be rescued until you'd been introduced to the captain of the ship? Well, you're shipwrecked now, and my sail has just come over the horizon. I'm going to save you whether you like it or not. It's too late. It's never too late. Now, listen, today is my lucky day. I told you I sold my first story. I have to pass that luck along. If I don't, it'll sour on me. I've got $2,000 in the bank. My mother left it to me. Even if I don't earn anything for a year, I could live on half of that. The question is, can you live on the other half? You mean you... Could you? Of course I could, but... Well, then it's yours. Oh, no. That gives us a year each and $1,000 besides what each of us earns, which is bound to be something. How old are you? Twenty, but I... And I'm twenty-three. We're both young enough to do anything. Now, stop saying no. I met you for a reason, and this must be it. You're going to give me half of all you have in the world? I'm going to give you the extremely small sum of one thousand dollars on certain conditions. I'm glad there are conditions. Well, I want to know how you're making out. My first condition is that we meet once every week. Every Tuesday, because this is Tuesday, and have dinner together and tell each other what sort of luck we've been having during the last week. Agreed? Oh, yes. Now, my second condition... Well, as a matter of fact, I think that's all. Now, it's your turn, Mrs. Weston. Oh, please. Weston's my maiden name. Mary Weston. So I'm either Miss Weston or Mrs... I hate the other, so I never want to say it or hear it again. Well, since I don't know it, I can't say it. And you can't hear it. Have you got a condition, Miss Mary Weston? Just one. That you let me pay you back. <laughs> All right. I'll let you pay me back. Michael! Michael! I'm over here at this table. Hello. I'm sorry I'm late. Have you been waiting long? I just got here five minutes ago. Sit down, Michael. Mm hmm have you ordered yet? Uh-huh. A soup, lamb chops, salad, and coffee. <laughs> I made it two orders, one for you. Is that all right? <laughs> oh, of course it is. You know we always eat the same things. How's the new job, Mary? All right. I, I think I'm going to get a raise soon. Wonderful. What about that story of yours? Have you written it yet? Which story? Why, Michael, how many stories can you write in a week? <laughs> Last Tuesday when we met for dinner, you said you had a marvelous idea for a story. Oh, you mean the idea you gave me. Oh, I didn't really give you the idea. You figured it out. I just suggested... Nonsense. The idea was yours, and a fine one it turned out to be, too. I sold it last Friday. Oh, Michael, I'm so happy for you. What else is new? Well, let's see. Since last Tuesday, uh, a lot's happened. What? Well, I don't know where to begin. There's so much. I had lunch with a magazine editor. I signed a contract for a series of short stories. Wonderful. But, yes. 
And then I got the ninth chapter of the novel finished. You didn't. Michael, when can I see it? Oh, it isn't typed yet. I'll type it and, and read it at the same time, just as I did the others. Will you bring it next week? Well, I... Mary, do we have to meet every week like this? Well, if you don't want to, Michael, if you want to stop... I don't mean that. I mean, well, couldn't we see each other more than once a week? Well, our agreement... Oh, forget our agreement. Couldn't we see each other on Wednesdays and Fridays? And, and must we always meet in this restaurant? Couldn't we go for walks and bus rides and couldn't we take in a play? Couldn't we, Mary? I was in love with Mary. But what was the use of talking about it? There was still that husband somewhere. She couldn't find him to divorce him. He hadn't bothered to divorce her. But one day, when the year was about up, my father came to see me. He'd heard about Mary. I don't know how, but I didn't bother to ask. As I faced him, he seemed, as always, as rocky and relentless as the New England coast he came from. Michael, what about this girl? What girl, Father? Is there more than one? I suppose you mean Mary. I believe that's her name. What do you intend to do about her? Do? Well, what am I supposed to do? You see her all the time, don't you? Yes. And no one else? No. You're in love with her? Yes, I am. Yeah. Then it would seem to me that you should marry her. I can't marry her. I married your mother. Raised a family on less money than you make right now. Well, it isn't the money. It's something else. You wouldn't understand. Oh, I'm afraid I wouldn't. Now, look here. If you think Mary and I... If... I think nothing of the kind. Not of my own son. It's what other people will think. Oh. You hadn't thought of that? Then it's time you did. If you're not concerned with your own reputation, what about hers? She's alone in the world? Yes. Mm. That puts an even greater responsibility on you, Michael. I've known that for some time. You say you can't marry her. You fail to explain why. Then I have this to say to you. Go away from her before it's too late. Before you've broken her life and dishonored your own. Is that too much to ask of my son? If you only knew how much it is. Are you afraid of the responsibilities of marriage? No. There's no peace and lasting happiness to be found in pleasure alone. There must be responsibility, struggle, self-respect. Marriage or nothing, Michael. I... I guess you're right. Marriage or... or nothing. Mary. Michael, what's the matter? My father came to see me today. He'd heard uh, about us. Not that there was anything to hear. What but... do you mean? Heard what? Well, he didn't like the way things looked. Or he thought other people wouldn't. Mary, he made me see that I'm hurting you when all I've ever wanted to do was help you. But you haven't hurt me. How could he say that? Well, it's what other people might say. I don't care what they say. You know I love you, don't you, Mary? I didn't know, Michael. You never said it before. Well, what was the use? Do... Do you love me? Since that first day. You knew, didn't you? No. And I'm glad I didn't show it too plainly. It was hard not to. Will you say again that you love me? I love you. Oh, Michael. I've told you because I'm, I'm going away. Away? Away? If I kiss you even once, I won't be able to go. But why are you, Michael? Why? I love you and honor you and respect you too much to stay. Darling, we can't go on like this. I can't anyway. Now that I know, that we both know, it's what Father said, marriage or nothing. It has to be nothing. You want to marry me? Do you, Michael? What's the use of even talking about it? Do you? What do you think I've been saying all this time? Then let's get married. Well, unfortunately, you have one husband already. No. No, I haven't. What? Mary. He's dead, Michael. Dead? Why didn't you tell I me? I didn't know it mattered to you. Well, how do you know? When did this happen? A month ago, two months, I don't know. I saw his name listed in the paper. That shipwreck off the coast of Ireland. Everyone missing. He was on the ship. Missing? So we can get married, if you mean it. Mean it? Of course I mean it. Do you? Oh, yes, Michael. Yes. 
But... But what? Well, I haven't had anything official. He might be still alive. Maybe he was saved. We'd be taking a chance. Oh, one chance in a thousand. What's that? Nothing, not a thing. You're sure you want to risk it? Of course I want to risk it. We've wasted two months already, darling. Let's not waste another minute. One chance in a thousand. Surely acceptable odds for people to take in the gamble for happiness. In Act Two, which will be heard in just a moment, we shall discover just how successful this gamble was. Our Michael, by the way, is Les Tremaine, and Florida Freebus appears as Mary. Now here is Kenneth Banghart with news of a special event. This coming Thursday, the first big automobile show in eight years will open here in New York. On Thursday morning at 11 o'clock at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel... The Ford Motor Company will welcome the public to a showing of the two new Lincolns and the new Mercury and to the world premiere of the new 49 Ford. The showing will last six days, and it's expected that tens of thousands of people will crowd the great ballroom of the Waldorf to see the new Ford, because no car in years has aroused as much interest and curiosity as the Ford 49er. For almost half a century, Americans have been watching the Ford Motor Company with interest, watching the steady progress and improvement of Ford cars. They've learned from experience that Ford leads in bringing important advancements to its field. And so now, when they hear that the new Ford will be a greater change from the present Ford than the famous Model A was from the famous Model T, Americans know that the popular-priced car is going to take another big step forward. If you're going to be in New York this week, the Ford Motor Company invites you to attend this special showing at the Waldorf starting Thursday morning. I know you'll enjoy it. But whether you can come or not, you'll soon know more about the 49 Ford for no matter where you are, in less than two weeks, you'll be able to see the Ford 49er for yourself. In just 12 more days, your Ford dealer will have on display the car of the year, the 49 Ford. The second act of Michael and Mary will be heard after a brief pause for station identification. Michael Rowe again takes up the story which he and Mary feel their son, David, must be told. You will remember that Mary's husband deserted her and later was reported dead. She and Michael had decided to be married. We were married immediately, under a shadow, I suppose. But as the days and weeks and years passed, Mary and I forgot the shadow. I stopped thinking of that first husband whose name I didn't even know. There was too much happiness, David. My books began to sell. We had a son. And he grew into a long-legged boy whom his mother and father loved very much. When you were 13, we sent you off to prep school. We missed you more than we like to admit. Well, one night after dinner, Mary looked up from the evening paper. Michael, have you seen the paper yet? All I want to, thanks. You didn't notice anything? I read it, if that's what you mean. What did I miss? I just wondered if there was anyone you knew on this page. No, I don't think so. Hey, how did I miss that? Do you know her? Mrs. Michael Rowe, wife of the well-known author. Oh, darling, darling, you look wonderful. Just think, people all over New York are saying, still, you can't deny his wife's pretty. First time I've ever been in the paper. <laughs> Shows how famous you're getting to be, Michael. Well, let's see what it says. Mrs. Michael Rowe, wife of the well-known author, helping with the Red Cross Drive. Mr. and Mrs. Rowe are the parents of a 13-year-old son, David. Oh, darling, we've got to send this to David. He'll be so proud. I'm proud. I've got the prettiest wife, the handsomest son, the most comfortable apartment in New York, and I've just had the best dinner. Oh, you needn't exaggerate, darling. Mm. 
You know how it is on Clara's day off. I sometimes think the popular Mr. Rowe and his beautiful wife should have more than one servant. I see them surrounded by lackeys. Michael, I must be economical for you. <laughs> I always have the horrible fear in my mind that suddenly everybody will stop buying your book. Yes, they probably will, but what's the use of worrying about it? Remember when we said, if we could only save $1,000, we'd feel safe. And then it was 2000 and then five. Now we've got 10000 all it away. But can we ever feel safe? I suppose I'm afraid because I know what it's like, what I'm afraid of. You don't, Michael. Darling, you'll never know again. I promise. Neither you nor David will... Oh, confound that man. If it is that man... Who? Old Ferguson. He warned me at the club today he might drop around. Mary, you disappear. He only wants to borrow a book, but if he sees you, he'll stay. He's the world's biggest bore. Right. I'll say you've gone to bed. Hmm? All right, darling. Coming. Hello, Ferguson. Oh. Mr. Michael Rowe? Yes? Oh, I won't keep you a moment, Mr. Rowe, or if I might just... Come in. Thanks. What can I do for you, Mr... Oh, you're wondering who I am and what I'm here for. It's natural. Well, I'll tell you. Where do I begin? That's the question. Sit down, won't you? Oh, thanks. Cigarette? No, no, thanks, sir. Not supposed to smoke. Heart. Still? Oh, why not? I haven't much time in this veil of tears, anyhow. Oh, it's a very nice apartment you've got here, Mr. Rowe. As I said to myself as I came in, my niece, my niece, if she is my niece, will be happy in a nice apartment like this. Your niece? Well, that's the question. That's why I'm here. As I said to myself over my solitary dinner just now, is it my niece or is it not? Why not try beginning at the beginning? Huh? <laughs> and very good, Mr. Rowe. And very witty. But where is the beginning? That's the question. Do we go back to the dear old days when a sweet little girl with long curls down her back used to call me Uncle George? Or to the moment a few hours ago when I opened my evening paper and my eyes rested on the face of Mrs. Michael Rowe, the popular author's wife? I said, good heavens, it's, it's the very image of my little niece, Mary Weston. Uh, I'm George Weston. I see. Well, then you can understand an uncle's feelings and how I have to give myself the pleasure of calling on you to make sure. I'm afraid you've made a mistake. My wife has no Uncle George, no Uncle Living. Uh, maybe so, Mr. Rowe, in which case, sir, I shall apologize for my intrusion and withdraw. But the fact that she hasn't spoken of me is, well, not surprising. I'm afraid I wasn't spoken of much in the family. The Rolling Stone, the prodigal brother of Mary's father, the bad egg. Well, but the bad egg has made good. Yeah. <laughs> that should appeal to a witty writer like yourself. The bad egg has made good. <laughs> Well, oh, well, that, well, that, oh, yes. The last week I came back to America with a fortune in my pocket, but alas, the seeds of a deadly disease in my heart. And with nothing, nothing to do but to sit down and wait for death, the great master, to claim me. I'm, I'm sorry you're not well. Oh, well, you know, you can't knock around the world the way I have, Mr. Rowe, and not pay for it. Oh, well, I have no complaint against fate uh, except one. Who do I leave my fortune to? I've lost sight of my few relations. Are they alive? Are they dead? And I open my paper tonight and I see... No, can it be my niece? Mr. Rowe. George Weston wouldn't be doing his duty as an uncle and a citizen if he hadn't come to inquire. So George Weston has come. And if he's mistaken, <laughs> well, pardon this intrusion. He can withdraw immediately. Well, uh, of course, it's very... Uh, you're quite right from your point of view, but I really don't think my wife... Would your niece recognize you? Mm, I think so, Mr. Rowe. I think she'd recognize me. But, uh, well, I'm content to leave it in her hands. Well, I'm not trying to force myself on you if she prefers to disown me. Oh, there's so... no question of that. But I still think you're making a mistake. However, that's for my wife to say. Mary? Did you want me, Michael? Will you come here a minute, darling? Of course. This is Mr. Harry. Yeah, I thought so. Hello, Mary. Harry. Well, aren't you glad to see me again? I thought you said your name was... Michael, Ma Michael. What's the matter? Yes. Oh, yes. You ask Mary what's the matter. Who are you? It's my husband, Michael. My husband. Harry Price. I'm at your service. Harry Price. Husband of the affectionate lady. Now in your arms. <laughs> Mary in the paper, the 
The fact that she had a son and a husband who was successful it was all Harry Price needed. <laughs> one chance in a thousand, we'd said. And 14 years later, that one chance had come to mock us. I remember his oily <laughs> voice, his unctuous <laughs> manner. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not a ghost. Oh, no, Mary. I didn't drown in the Irish Sea. I wasn't even on that ship. Well, it turned out to be a piece of luck, didn't it, that I was uh, a little short of funds when she sailed. What do you want? Oh, you know what I want. You know very well what I want. Oh, no, no, not, <laughs> not my wife, no thanks. I want a little financial arrangement to be made, and then Harry disappears. Mr. and Mrs. Rowe never see him again. Ah, well, the, the best of friends must part. You can go to prison for blackmail, Mr. Price, and your wife for bigamy. Oh, Michael, I brought this on you. It'll be all right, darling. Oh, of course, it may be a consolation to you that when your wife is in jail, to know that I'm in jail too, but it seems kind of silly to me. How much do you want? Now you're talking. <laughs> Trust a woman for common sense. Well, now, Mary, I thought a cool 10,000, a nice, cool, solid, comfortable 10,000. Hmm? Ah. Uh, just about the right amount. Hmm? <laughs> Well, Harry Price knows. Harry Price always knows. You can go to the devil. And your wife? And your boy? When I heard about you 14 years ago, I promised myself that if I ever met you, I'd punch your filthy face. I'm older now. Life doesn't seem so simple. But I warn you, if you don't get no, out no, of no, here... No, 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 no. No roughness, please. Remember, my weak heart. Get out! Not one penny! Ah, uh, bluff, bluff! I've met it before. I call it. Oh, you've met it before? In business. The blackmailing business. Now, look here. I've had enough of this. Let's get down to facts. Call me a blackmailer, I don't care. And your wife's a bigamist. Facts, facts, facts. Are we both going to prison or aren't we? Ask yourself who's going to mind going to prison most, me or her. And who's going to mind the truth coming out most, me or you? So, let's get down to it. My price is ten grand. And when you've spent it, then what? I'll give you my word of honor. You haven't got a word of honor. Oh, I swear on the Bible. Bible? You ever try to borrow money? They ask first what security you can give. You've no security to offer, you fool. I have prison to offer. To exchange, you mean? No deal. So outside, Mr. Price. Get out. Oh, you can't get rid of me so easy. Mary. Mary. Don't let him do this to you and your poor little son. Talk to him. I agree with Michael. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> All right. 5,000. Get out. Oh, she's not worth 5,000. Huh? Oh, you want her to go to prison, is that it? You want to be rid of her, huh? What's the matter? Got your eye on some doll? Why, you... No, no, none of that. Here, I swear me now. No! Oh. <laughs> Michael! Get up! I said get up! Harry! Has he fainted, Michael? Mary. What is it? He's dead. <laughs> wanted to kill Harry Price, but I hadn't. I hadn't even touched him. He didn't hit his head on anything either as he fell. You see, he'd told the truth about his heart. But as we stared at him there on the floor, I felt as if I'd killed him. And I said so. No, Michael. It was an accident. It could have happened to anybody. To anybody, yes. But it happened to him. Oh. To him. Michael. Who is he? What did he come here for? Why do we quarrel? The police will want to know. The police? An inquest. They'll ask questions. It will all come out, Mary. We took the risk, and now we've got to pay. Yes. I'm ready, Michael. Oh, why did this have to happen? Why did he have to come back? Michael, think of all the happiness we've had together. And it's because of what we did, the chance we took, that we've had the happiness. Because we kept our self-respect. Because we knew this might come and weren't afraid of it. Whatever happens now, we've had those years. I'm not complaining, sweet. I've had more happiness than I ever deserved. And if you forgive me, I regret nothing. Forgive? Oh, Michael. I suppose I'd better call the police. I suppose so. Yes. Operator, get me... Never mind. No, Mary. What is it? No. Let's fight for our happiness. Fight? Lie. Oh, Michael, we've already done so many things that aren't right. I don't know what's right anymore. I don't know. All I know is that I'd do anything to save you. I hate telling lies. I always have. I hate it, too. Is safety worth it at the cost of living? Safety and self-respect? Can we have them both? I don't know, Michael. Sweetheart, if, if you wish it, even if you aren't quite sure but think you wish it, 
We'll tell the truth, unashamed, and, and let happen whatever happens. All right, we... No. No, Michael, we can't. But you said... I was just thinking of us, and that isn't fair. There's someone else who can be hurt by this. David. Good Lord. Think how hurt and bewildered he'd be, understanding so little except that his mother and father aren't what he thought they were. Nothing for him would ever be quite the same again. No. I suppose we were selfish about David. Maybe he ought never to have been born. But I wanted him so. And now I feel he's something sacred. The debts must be paid by us, not by him. None of this is his fault. We've got to put him before ourselves, before each other, before the truth, before everything. Yes. Well, then we've got the plan. Now, it's, it's 9.30. The police will know, more or less, when he died. We'll say 9.35. And, and say we were confused at first, so we, we didn't call till 9.40. That gives us ten minutes, Mary. At 9.40, I call the police, and by then we've got to have a complete story ready for them. Who he is, why he came here, how he died. Ten minutes. Now, who is he? What did he say when he came? He said he was your uncle. I see. His excuse for trying to see you. Now, that's no good. He can't have come here to see you at all. Once the police begin looking things up... No, no, he's a stranger. We don't know his name or anything about him. Well, then, why is he here? A, a man at the door, begging? Begging, yes. He became threatening, and then I tried to... No, no, if he were begging, why should he come to the top apartment first? He'd have gone to the apartments below. The police would ask. That, that's no good either. Could you have gone out for dinner, and he followed you home? Uh, I don't like that either. Where'd I go? More lies to make up, you see. Oh, it's 9.34. I can't think. What's the matter with me? A writer, and I can't think of a plot. We'll find something. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. We've lots of time. Let's begin again. Oh, Lord, if you've ever helped me make up a story, help me now. Come on, Mary, it's you who will give it to me. Well, we want to be as near the truth as we can, don't we? Yes, as long as we keep you out of it. Well, then why did he come? Why, why, why? He saw your photograph. Harry did see it? Oh, Michael and I were so proud of it. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? it? Seems funny now that we ever felt so safe. But that's our cue, Michael. We said to keep to the truth. We'll say we, he saw the paper. Mm, but that's bringing you in, and I won't do that. But your name's there, too. Wait, I believe you've got it. He read about me in the paper. Looked up my address in the phone book. But is he supposed to know you? He's a fellow writer. Calls himself uh, Stacy Cameron. Brother of the pen. Pretends he admires my books. Comes here with a hard luck story. Down on his luck. You get letters like that. Yes. But would I have let him in? You let him in? Like a fool. Well, he comes in, and, and then what happens? He threatens you. No, nah, no, no. That's dangerous ground. We don't want any hint of blackmail. Michael, it's time. You have to call the police. I'm not ready yet. It's 9.40. Our story isn't finished. But your ten minutes are up. If they come here and start punching holes in an alibi that isn't strong enough to stand up... There'll but... be a few minutes before they get here. We'll be able to work out the rest of it then, Michael. Maybe. But if it is finished, will it be good enough for them to accept? Oh, Michael. Operator... Get me police headquarters. One chance in a thousand. But as the wheel of fortune turned, that chance came up. Michael and Mary are making up their story for the police. They are taking another gamble. And while we wait for fortune's wheel to turn again, here is Kenneth Banghart with an inside story. Yes, I do have an inside story for you now. The inside story of the car everybody is talking and wondering about. The 49 Ford. Let's start with the frame of the big new Ford. It will be a new drop center frame with a low, road-hugging center of gravity to give you the midship ride. It will have new hydrocoil springs in front and new extra-strong paraflex springs in the rear. It will have new Magic Action king-size brakes that stop quickly and surely. And it will have either of two new Ford engines, a 100-horsepower V8 or a 95-horsepower 6, with new Equiflow cooling and new lubrication system designed for new savings on gas and outstanding new performance. In addition, for the first time in its field, the 49 Ford will offer at extra cost a factory-installed overdrive. That means easier driving and still more savings on gas. Those are the basic parts of the Ford 49er. Now to add the things which will make it a living room on wheels. The new Ford will have seats wide enough for three big people to sit in comfort. The rear seat, a full five feet wide. 
There'll be plenty of room overhead and underfoot. There'll be new picture window visibility, more than 20 square feet of sparkling glass. There'll be plenty of baggage space in the new Ford Deep Deck Luggage Locker. And as an accessory, there'll even be a complete temperature control system to suit the temperature to your comfort. The new 49 Ford is definitely going to be a living room on wheels, enclosed in the new Ford Lifeguard body. That's the inside story of the comfort, safety, and performance you'll find in the new Ford. The outside story, the style and beauty of the new Ford, that's still a secret. People who have seen it call the Ford 49er the dream car. All I can tell you is that it was designed to be the car of the year. But it won't be long now before you'll see for yourself. In just 12 more days in your own community, your Ford dealer will have on display the one and only new car in its field, the car of the year, the 49 Ford. <laughs> curtain rises on the final act of the Ford Theater presentation of Michael and Mary. The stranger, Mary's former husband, lies dead of a heart attack. Michael and Mary have devised a story which, if the police believe it, will protect their son and their own happiness. On the phone, I told the police a man had died suddenly in my apartment. I didn't know who he was. In ten minutes, two officers and a doctor were there. The doctor performed a cursory examination and said there would be a post-mortem. Then Mary and I were questioned by a Lieutenant Colliers. All right, Mr. Rowe, what happened here? Well, he dropped suddenly, like that. No warning at all. He must have died instantly. You were a witness, Mrs. Rowe? No, I was in the bedroom. Hmm. Did you hit him, Mr. Rowe? Well, not really. I, I did try to shove him out the door, but that's all. When he fell, did he hit his head on anything? I don't think so, Lieutenant. No. no sign of physical violence. External, anyhow. You called headquarters right away? No. We... Why not? It was such a shock, Lieutenant Colliers. Uh, we were confused at first. We didn't know whether to call a doctor or... And then my husband said, no, it had to be the police. You say you don't know anything about this man. I never saw him before. You, Mrs. Rowe? No. All I know is he said he had a bad heart. But he was lying the whole time he was here, so maybe even that was a lie. Now, let's have the whole story. Start from the beginning. How did he happen to come here? Well, there, there was something about me in the evening paper. He read it, and that must have given him the idea. He came here calling himself Stacy Cameron, claimed he was a writer and that we'd met four or five years ago. And you're sure you hadn't met? Hmm? Yes, I am now. How about you, Mrs. Rowe? Could he have met you? Or... I don't forget people, Lieutenant Colliers. I never saw him before in my life. Go on, Mr. Rowe. I hadn't met him, but the name Stacy Cameron rang a faint bell. I took him at his word and asked him in. Then he began the usual hard luck story, touched me for a hundred dollars. What was the hard luck story? Well, I... Well, he, he said he'd been sick, couldn't work the way he used to. The sales fell off, couldn't even sell the things he did write. It happens to writers, that's why I believed him at first. And then he made a slip, and I began to be suspicious. What kind of a slip? Well, he, he was a little too glib, for one thing, and he used poor grammar. As a rule, writers don't do that. For example? Um, well, he used the double negative, that kind of thing. That was enough to make you suspicious? Now, people get careless, Mr. Rowe, writers or not. Yes, but uh, there were other things. He pretended to be an admirer of my books. I deliberately asked him if he read one called Disorderly Design. He said he had. Well, I never wrote a book with that title. Anything else that made you suspicious? Well... Yes, Michael. You said he claimed he wrote fiction himself. Oh, yes. And that was when I placed the name Stacy Cameron, an article writer who never wrote fiction in his life. I knew then he was an imposter. I told him to clear out. Well, then what happened? He got truculent. I pushed him toward the door, and he just collapsed. I see. Called himself Cameron. Do you think that was his real name? Well, I haven't the faintest idea, Lieutenant... But he's not the Stacy Cameron. I'll bet on that much. Taking a risk, wasn't he? You might have known Stacy Cameron very well. A risk, yes. But he probably knew what I knew, that Stacy Cameron disappeared from the literary scene some years ago. Maybe he knew Stacy Cameron himself, or had a friend who did. That way, the impersonation would have been fairly safe, wouldn't it? Possible. You say he spoke of having a weak heart? 
Yes, but it's the stock thing to say, of course. Mm -hmm. Looks as if it might be true in this case. May even be named Cameron. That's what gave him the idea. A clever man always keeps as near the truth as he can, doesn't he, Mr. Rowe? Yes, I, I suppose he does. Well, our first job is to find out who he is. No identification at all. Seems strange he'd look you up. You're not a wealthy man, are you, Mr. Rowe? No, comfortably fixed. But writers stick together. I mean, they expect other writers to understand when they... You said he wasn't a writer. No, no, I, I didn't say that. I said he wasn't Stacy Cameron. You said writers didn't use bad grammar, therefore he was not a writer. He could have been, Lieutenant. You pointed out yourself that people get careless. He certainly could make up stories, anyhow. You're very helpful, aren't you, Mrs. Rowe? I suppose you tell me when you came into the picture. My wife didn't see Can't him. Mrs. Rowe talk, please. Michael was going to say that I didn't see the man till he was dead. You stayed in your bedroom the entire time? Yes, Michael let him in. It's our maid's day off. Where is your bedroom? That door to the right. You didn't hear anything? Just voices. I wasn't paying very much attention. I was reading a letter from our son. And that's all you have to tell me? Yes, I'm afraid it is. You, Mr. Rowe? That's all, Lieutenant. I wish there were more, but there isn't. I wish so, too. Uh, if you should remember anything else, uh, that either of you had met this man before, for instance, there's uh, still the inquest. Doesn't there have to be? The thing was an accident. Yes. He a coroner's jury will have to decide how he died and why. So then, we had to go through the inquest. We took the oath and gave the evidence. I swear by Almighty God. We didn't like that, but it had to be done. Mary was wonderful. That's one thing you and I can say together, David. Whatever danger threatens us, whatever evil surrounds us, this we know. Your mother will never let us down. And so we got through it. They found out his name, or the name he was using. Not Price, luckily. And the verdict was death from natural causes. Well, David, that's our story as it ended ten years ago. Now, there's just one more thing to be said. Insofar as we've offended against our God, we feel guilty of nothing. But insofar as we have offended against you, David, we're in your hands. It's for you to say. What is there to say? What do you expect me to say? That you forgive us, David. Forgive? More than ever before, I honor my father and my mother. Oh, darling... Oh, you are a fine son. What about Linda, David? Will she want to marry into our family when you tell her all this? You don't know Linda or you wouldn't ask that. She'll be as proud of you as I am. And I thought your lives had been so happy. They have been. I never think of the bad part, only the good. Only of you and Michael. Until today. Wait a minute. Why did you tell me today? You hated telling me. You never have before. That phone call. What was it? The last chapter of a story we thought was finished. <laughs> How naive we were ever to think we could write a finish to our own story. What people have done, what they've been, lives on forever. Dad. That was Inspector Colliers on the phone. Colliers? Ten years ago, when I said Harry Price was really dead and we were safe, I remember Mary asking, will we ever be safe? And she was right. Well, what did he want? He has new evidence, he said. After all this time, how could he? Easily enough, I suppose, if the police wanted to look. There were plenty of loose ends. It'll all come out in the open now. In the papers. Everything. Now you see why we had to tell you, darling. It'll change your life, yours and Linda's. It'll... Never mind about us. What's going to happen to you? Dad, Mother, what about you? <laughs> Inspector Colliers, it's been quite a long time since we've seen you. Ten years about, Mr. O. It uh, turns out the old saw is true, doesn't it? Truth is stranger than fiction. We should know, Michael. That's right. <clears throat> well, I'll uh, start at the beginning, if that's all right with you. That is, I'll start with the part you don't know about. Just start. For some time now, we've been after a criminal gang here in New York. Counterfeiters. I expect you've seen something about it in the papers. 
the Taylor gang. No, no, I, I missed that. Well, we finally rounded them up. There was a woman among them. Calls herself Sally Winters. She claimed she was married at 17, deserted by her husband. No family, no money. She drifted into bad company. Now, that's a story you hear often enough, and too often it's true. Well, I was assigned the job of checking on Sally Winters' story. And who do you think the man was that ruined her life? The man who dropped dead in your apartment ten years ago. We can't pretend we didn't know you were going to say that, Inspector. I guess I tipped you on the phone, didn't I? Well, since I already knew something about that gentleman's character, the judge let Sally Winters off with six months. The poor thing. And that was the end of the Taylor case. The end? You mean that's all you had to tell us? No more than that? There's a little more, Mr. Rowe. The end of the Taylor case, but not the end of my investigation. Oh. oh. What did you do? What did you find? I don't like leaving a story unfinished any more than you do, Mr. Rowe. I'd met that man once in your apartment, and now I'd met him again. I said to myself, I'll bet you've left your mark in other places, my friend. I think I'll take a look. So I had a look. Yes. His real name was Harry Price. Sally Winters wasn't the only girl he married and deserted. You never know about people, do you? You never know. There was another girl by the name of Weston. Mary Weston. And you're looking for Mary Weston? Is that right, Inspector? Why should I look for her, Mrs. Rowe? I know where to find her if I want to. But I don't want to. The fault wasn't hers, was it? Inspector, what are you saying? Just that Mary Weston wasn't his legal wife, anyhow, for all she thought she was. She wasn't? Sally Winters was his first wife, his legal wife. Mary Weston was free to take another husband. I only hope she knew it. I hope so, too. Well, I thought you'd both be interested. Once Harry Price crossed your path, by accident, of course, but he caused you some trouble. And I wanted to say he'll never cause you any more. He won't, Inspector? The books on Harry Price are closed. I'm closing them myself. You see, Mr. Rowe, I'm not a writer like you, but I deal in stories, too, so to speak, and I like them rounded off as much as you do. You understand? Yes, Inspector. We understand. Thank you, Inspector. Well, I won't take any more of your time. Good luck to you both, and to that son of yours. Thanks to you, Inspector, we've had our share of luck. More than our share. Well, it's time, isn't it? You had your share of bad luck, too. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye, Inspector. Colliers. Michael. Oh, I can't believe it. A real ending this time, Mary. He knew. Of course he knew. But he decided there were extenuating circumstances. Extenuating circumstances. That poor girl. Sally Winters. If it hadn't been for you, I would have been Sally Winters. But we're safe now, Michael. At last, and David's safe. Michael, we needn't have told David at all. I've been thinking of that. We waited ten years to tell him, but we didn't have the sense to wait one more hour. But I'm glad he knows. We're all closer now than we ever were before. I'm glad, too. And just think, Michael. I was never married to Harry at all. I've always been married to you. With the applause of the audience here in NBC Studio 6A, the curtain of the Ford Theater has slowly descended upon the final act of A.A. A. Milne's love story of Michael and Mary, played, I think, with great warmth and sincerity by Les Tremaine and Florida Freebus. Mr. Tremaine will be remembered by the Ford Theater audience for his characterization of George Simon in Counselor at Law, and Miss Freebus for her fine performance in Dodie Smith's Autumn Crocus. You know, I envy Eddie Dowling his duties here next Sunday afternoon. On that day, the Ford Theater will present one of the most hilarious comedies ever produced on Broadway, the amazing and side-splitting My Sister Eileen. Many of you must have enjoyed it also in its movie version. It's the incredible tale of two girls from Columbus who arrive in New York to gain a foothold and end up by creating a landslide of merriment. The following week, 
Your guest spokesman will be Louis Calhoun, currently starring in the Broadway revival of The Play's The Thing. On the Ford Theatre, however, the play will be the warm and charming comedy, The Late Christopher Bean. I remember it as the story of what happens when a gallery full of great paintings turns up in the attic of a New England physician. For the season's final presentation on the Ford Theatre, Howard Lindsay will return to preside over a dramatization of Sinclair Lewis's great novel of science and the men and women who live and die for it, Aerosmith. You can be sure I'll be listening. Thank you, Alfred Drake. Michael and Mary was adapted by Nancy Moore from the original stage play by A.A. A. Milne and edited by Howard Teichman. The musical score was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray, and the entire production was under the direction of George Zachary. Other players heard in today's play were Alice Goodkin as Carol, Charles Penman as Inspector Colliers, Cameron Prudhomme as Father, and Frank Thomas as David. Alfred Drake, star of the Broadway hit Joy to the World, appeared today as spokesman for the Ford Theater during the absence of Howard Lindsay in Detroit where his new play, Life with Mother, is being presented shortly. Next week, Howard Lindsay's guest will be the famous actor-producer Eddie Dowling, and our play will be My Sister Eileen. The Ford Theater is presented by the Ford Motor Company, makers of Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln cars, and Ford trucks, farm tractors, and motor coaches. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. WHEN WE WERE VERY YOUNG by A. A. Milne Section 1. Dedication and Preface Dedication To Christopher Robin Milne, or, as he prefers to call himself, Billy Moon, this book, which owes so much to him, is now humbly offered. Preface Just before we begin, at one time, but I have changed my mind now. I thought I was going to write a little note at the top of each of these poems, in the manner of Mr. William Wordsworth, who liked to tell his readers where he was staying and which of his friends he was walking with, and what he was thinking about, when the idea of writing his poem came to him. You will find some lines about a swan here, if you get as far as that, and I should have explained to you in the note that Christopher Robin— who feeds this swan in the mornings has given him the name of Pooh. This is a very fine name for a swan, because if you call him and he doesn't come, which is a thing swans are good at, then you can pretend that you were just saying Pooh, to show how little you wanted him. Well, I should have told you that there are six cows who come down to Pooh's lake every afternoon to drink, and of course they say Moo as they come. So I thought to myself one fine day, walking with my friend Christopher Robin, Moo rhymes with Pooh. Surely there is a bit of poetry to be got out of that. Well, then, I began to think about the swan on his lake, and at first I thought how lucky it was that his name was Pooh, and then I didn't think about that any more, and the poem came quite differently from what I intended, and all I can say for it now is that— if it hadn't been for Christopher Robin, I shouldn't have written it, which, indeed, is all I can say for any of the others. So this is why these verses go about together, because they are all friends of Christopher Robin, and if I left out one because it was not quite like the one before, then I should have to leave out the one before because it was not quite like the next, which would be disappointing for them." Then there is another thing. You may wonder sometimes who is supposed to be saying the verses. Is it the author, that strange but uninteresting person? Or is it Christopher Robin, or some other boy or girl, or nurse, or who? If I had followed Mr. Wordsworth's plan, I could have explained this each time, but as it is, you will have to decide for yourselves. 
If you are not quite sure, then it is probably who. I don't know if you have ever met who, but he is one of those curious children who look four on Monday, and eight on Tuesday, and are really twenty-eight on Saturday, and you never know whether it is the day when he can pronounce his R's. He had a great deal to do with these verses. In fact, you might almost say that this book is entirely the unaided work of Christopher Robin, who, and Mr. Shepherd, who drew the pictures. They have said thank you politely to each other several times, and now they say it to you for taking them into your house. Thank you so much for asking us. We've come. Signed, A. A. Milne. End of Dedication and Preface When We Were Very Young by A. A. Milne This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. When We Were Very Young by A. A. Milne Section 2 Corner of the Street Down by the corner of the street, where the three roads meet, and the feet of the people as they pass go tweet, 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 who comes tripping round the corner of the street? One pair of shoes which are nurses, one pair of slippers which are Percy's, tweet, tweet, tweet. Buckingham Palace they're changing guard at Buckingham Palace. Christopher Robin went down with Alice. Alice is marrying one of the guard. A soldier's life is terrible hard, says Alice. They're changing guard at Buckingham Palace. Christopher Robin went down with Alice. We saw a guard in a sentry box. One of the sergeants looks after their socks, says Alice. They're changing guard at Buckingham Palace. Christopher Robin went down with Alice. We looked for the king, but he never came. Well, God take care of him, all the same, says Alice. They're changing guard at Buckingham Palace. Christopher Robin went down with Alice. They've great big parties inside the grounds. I wouldn't be king for a hundred pounds, says Alice. They're changing guard at Buckingham Palace. Christopher Robin went down with Alice. A face looked out, but it wasn't the king's. He's much too busy assigning things, says Alice. They're changing guard at Buckingham Palace. Christopher Robin went down with Alice. Do you think the king knows all about me? Sure to, dear, but it's time for tea, says Alice. Happiness John had great, big, waterproof boots on. John had a great, big, waterproof hat. John had a great, big, waterproof Macintosh. And that, said John, is that. THE CHRISTENING What shall I call my dear little dormouse? His eyes are small, but his tail is enormous. I sometimes call him Terrible John, cause his tail goes on, and on, and on, and I sometimes call him Terrible Jack, cause his tail goes on to the end of his back, and I sometimes call him Terrible James, cause he says he likes me calling him names, but I think I shall call him Jim, cause I am so fond of him. Puppy and I. I met a man as I went walking. We got talking, man and I. Where are you going to, man? I said. I said to the man as he went by. Down to the village to get some bread. Will you come with me? No, not I. I met a horse as I went walking. We got talking, horse and I. "'Where are you going to, horse, to-day?' I said to the horse as he went by. "'Down to the village to get some hay. Will you come with me?' "'No, not I.' 
I met a woman as I went walking. We got talking, woman and I. "'Where are you going to, woman, so early?' I said to the woman as she went by. "'Down to the village to get some barley. Will you come with me?' "'No, not I.' I met some rabbits as I went walking. We got talking, rabbits and I. "'Where are you going in your brown fur coats?' I said to the rabbits as they went by. "'Down to the village to get us some oats. Will you come with us?' "'No, not I.' I met a puppy as I went walking. We got talking, puppy and I. "'Where are you going this nice fine day?' I said to the puppy as he went by. "'Up to the hills to roll and play. I'll come with you, puppy,' said I. End of section This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. When We Were Very Young by A. A. Milne Section 3 Twinkle Toes When the sun shines through the leaves of the apple tree, when the sun makes shadows of the leaves of the apple tree, then I pass on the grass from one leaf to another, from one leaf to its brother. Tiptoe, tiptoe, here I go. The Four Friends Ernest was an elephant, a great big fellow. Leonard was a lion with a six-foot tail. George was a goat, and his beard was yellow and James was a very small snail. Leonard had a stall and a great big strong one. Ernest had a manger, and its walls were thick. George found a pen, but I think it was the wrong one. And James sat down on a brick. Ernest started trumpeting and cracked his manger. Leonard started roaring and shivered his stall. James gave the huffle of a snail in danger, and nobody heard him at all. Ernest started trumpeting and raised such a rumpus. Leonard started roaring and trying to kick. James went on a journey with the goat's new compass, and he reached the end of his brick. Ernest was an elephant and very well intentioned. Leonard was a lion with a brave new tail. George was a goat, as I think I have mentioned. But James was only a snail. Lines and Squares Whenever I walk in a London street, I'm ever so careful to watch my feet, and I keep in the squares, and the masses of bears who wait at the corners all ready to eat the sillies who tread on the lines of the street go back to their lairs. And I say to them, Bears, just look how I'm walking in all of the squares. And the little bears growl to each other, He's mine, as soon as he's silly and steps on a line. And some of the bigger bears try to pretend that they came round the corner to look for a friend. And they try to pretend that nobody cares whether you walk on the lines or squares, but only the sillies believe their talk. It's ever so portent how you walk, and it's ever so jolly to call out, Bears, just watch me walking in all the squares. Brownie In a corner of the bedroom is a great big curtain. Someone lives behind it, but I don't know who. I think it is a brownie, but I'm not quite certain. Nanny isn't certain, too. I looked behind the curtain, but he went so quickly. Brownies never wait to say, How do you do? They wriggle off at once because they're all so tickly. Nanny says they're tickly, too. Independence I never did, I never did, I never did like. Now take care, dear. 
I never did, I never did, I never did, want hold my hand. I never did, I never did, I never did think much of not up there, dear. It's no good saying it. They don't understand. End of section. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. When We Were Very Young by A. A. Milne. Section 4 Nursery Chairs. One of the chairs is South America. One of the chairs is a ship at sea. One is a cage for a great big lion, and one is a chair for me. The first chair. When I go up the Amazon, I stop at night and fire a gun to call my faithful band. And Indians in twos and threes come silently between the trees and wait for me to land. And if I do not want to play with any Indians to-day, I simply wave my hand, and then they turn and go away. They always understand. The Second Chair I'm a great big lion in my cage, and I often frighten Nanny with a roar. Then I hold her very tight, and tell her not to be so frightened, and she doesn't be so frightened any more. THE THIRD CHAIR When I am in my ship, I see the other ships go sailing by. A sailor leans and calls to me, as his ship goes sailing by. Across the sea he leans to me, above the winds I hear him cry, Is this the way to round the world? He calls as he goes by. THE FOURTH CHAIR Whenever I sit in a high chair, for breakfast or dinner or tea, I try to pretend that it's my chair, and that I am a baby of three. Shall I go off to South America? Shall I put out in my ship to sea? Or get in my cage and be lions and tigers? Or shall I be only me? Market Square I had a penny, a bright new penny. I took my penny to the market square. I wanted a rabbit, a little brown rabbit, and I looked for a rabbit most everywhere. For I went to the stall where they sold sweet lavender. Only a penny for a bunch of lavender. Have you got a rabbit, cause I don't want lavender? But they hadn't got a rabbit, not anywhere there. I had a penny. And I had another penny. I took my pennies to the market square. I did want a rabbit, a little baby rabbit, and I looked for rabbits most everywhere. And I went to the stall where they sold fresh mackerel. Now then, tuppence for a fresh-caught mackerel. Have you got a rabbit? Cause I don't like mackerel. But they hadn't got a rabbit, not anywhere there. I found a sixpence. A little white sixpence. I took it in my hand to the market square. I was buying my rabbit. I do like rabbits. And I looked for my rabbit most everywhere. So I went to the stall where they sold fine saucepans. Walk up, walk up. Sixpence for a saucepan. Could I have a rabbit? Cause we've got two saucepans. But they hadn't got a rabbit. Not anywhere there. I had nothing. No, I hadn't got nothing, so I didn't go down to the market square. But I walked on the common, the old gold common, and I saw little rabbits most everywhere. So I'm sorry for the people who sell fine saucepans. I'm sorry for the people who sell fresh mackerel. I'm sorry for the people who sell sweet lavender, cause they haven't got a rabbit. Not anywhere there. Daffodown Dilly She wore her yellow sunbonnet, she wore her greenest gown, 
she turned to the south wind and curtsied up and down she turned to the sunlight and shook her yellow head and whispered to her neighbor winter is dead water lilies where the water lilies go to and fro rocking in the ripples of the water lazy on a leaf lies the late king's daughter and the faint winds shake her who will come and take her i will i will keep still keep still sleeping on a leaf lies the late king's daughter then the wind comes skipping to the lilies on the water and the kind winds wake her now who will take her with a laugh she is slipping through the lilies on the water wait wait too late too late only the water lilies go to and fro dipping dipping to the ripples of the water disobedience james james morrison morrison weatherby george dupree took great care of his mother though he was only three james james said to his mother mother he said said he you must never go down to the end of the town if you don't go down with me james james morrison's mother put on a golden gown james james morrison's mother drove to the end of the town james james morrison's mother said to herself said she i can get right down to the end of the town and be back in time for tea king john put up a notice lost or stolen or strayed james james morrison's mother seems to have been mislaid last seen wandering vaguely quite of her own accord she tried to get down to the end of the town forty shillings reward james james morrison morrison commonly known as jim told his other relations not to go blaming him james james said to his mother mother he said said he you must never go down to the end of the town without consulting me james james morrison's mother hasn't been heard of since king john said he was sorry and so did the queen and prince king john somebody told me said to a man he knew if people go down to the end of the town well what can anyone do now then very softly j j m m w g to p took great care of his mother though he was only three j j said to his mother mother he said said he you must never go down to the end of the town if you don't go down with me end of section this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording is by mark smith of simpsonville south carolina when we were very young by a a milne section 5 spring morning where am i going i don't quite know down to the stream where the king cups grow up on the hill where the pine trees blow anywhere anywhere i don't know where am i going the clouds sail by little ones baby ones over the sky where am i going the shadows pass little ones baby ones over the grass if you were a cloud and sailed up there you'd sail on water as blue as air and you'd see me here in the fields and say doesn't the sky look green today where am i going the high rooks call it's awful fun to be born at all where am i going the ring doves coo we do have beautiful things to do if you were a bird and lived on high you'd lean on the wind when the wind came by you'd say to the wind when it took you away that's where i wanted to go today where am i going i don't quite know what does it matter where people go 
down to the wood where the bluebells grow anywhere anywhere i don't know the island if i had a ship i'd sail my ship i'd sail my ship through eastern seas down to a beach where the slow waves thunder the green curls over and the white falls under boom 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 on the sun-bright sand then i'd leave my ship and i'd land and climb the steep white sand and climb to the trees the six dark trees the coconut trees on the cliff's green crown hands and knees to the coconut trees face to the cliff as the stones patter down up 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 staggering stumbling round the corner where the rock is crumbling round this shoulder <clears throat> over this boulder up to the top where the six trees stand and there would i rest and lie my chin in my hands and gaze at the dazzle of sand below and the green waves curling slow and the grey-blue distant haze where the sea goes up to the sky and i'd say to myself as i look so lazily down at the sea there's nobody else in the world and the world was made for me the three foxes once upon a time there were three little foxes who didn't wear stockings and they didn't wear socks but they all had handkerchiefs to blow their noses and they kept their handkerchiefs in cardboard boxes they lived in the forest in three little houses and they didn't wear coats and they didn't wear trousers they ran through the woods on their little bare tootsies and they played touch last with a family of mouses they didn't go shopping in the high street shopses but caught what they wanted in the woods and copses they all went fishing and they caught three wormses they went out hunting and they caught three wapses they went to a fair and they all won prizes three plum puddingses and three mince pieses they rode on elephants and swang on swingses and hit three coconuts at coconut shizes that's all that i know of the three little foxes who kept their handkerchiefs in cardboard boxes they lived in the forest in three little houses but they didn't wear coats and they didn't wear trousers and they didn't wear stockings and they didn't wear socks politeness if people ask me i always tell them quite well thank you i'm very glad to say if people ask me i always answer quite well thank you how are you today i always answer i always tell them if they ask me politely but sometimes i wish that they wouldn't jonathan joe jonathan joe has a mouth like an o and a wheelbarrow full of surprises if you ask for a bat or for something like that he has got it whatever the size is if you're wanting a ball it's no trouble at all why the more that you ask for the merrier like a hoop and a top and a watch that won't stop and some sweets and an aberdeen terrier jonathan joe has a mouth like an o but this is what makes him so funny if you give him a smile only once in a while then he never expects any money end of section this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording is by mark smith of simpsonville south carolina when we were very young by a a milne section six at the zoo there are lions and roaring tigers and enormous camels and things there are buffalo buffalo bisons and a great big bear with wings 
There's a sort of a tiny potamus and a tiny nusserus, too, but I gave buns to the elephant when I went down to the zoo. There are badgers and bidgers and bodgers at a superintendent's house. There are masses of goats and a polar and different kind of mouse. And I think there's a sort of a something which is called wallaboo, but I gave buns to the elephant when I went down to the zoo. If you try to talk to the bison, he never quite understands. You can't shake hands with a mingo. He doesn't like shaking hand. And lions and roaring tigers hate saying, how do you do? But I give buns to the elephant when I go down to the zoo. Rice Pudding What is the matter with Mary Jane? She's crying with all her might and main, and she won't eat her dinner, rice pudding again. What is the matter with Mary Jane? What is the matter with Mary Jane? I've promised her dolls and a daisy chain, and a book about animals, all in vain. What is the matter with Mary Jane? What is the matter with Mary Jane? She's perfectly well, and she hasn't a pain. But look at her now, she's beginning again. What is the matter with Mary Jane? What is the matter with Mary Jane? I've promised her sweets and a ride in the train, and I've begged her to stop for a bit and explain. What is the matter with Mary Jane? What is the matter with Mary Jane? She's perfectly well, and she hasn't a pain, and it's lovely rice pudding for dinner again. What is the matter with Mary Jane? Missing Has anybody seen my mouse? I opened his box for half a minute, just to make sure he was really in it, and while I was looking, he jumped outside. I tried to catch him. I tried. I tried. I think he's somewhere about the house. Has anyone seen my mouse? Uncle John, have you seen my mouse? Just a small sort of mouse, a dear little brown one. He came from the country. He wasn't a town one. So he'll feel all lonely in a London street. Why, what could he possibly find to eat? He must be somewhere. I'll ask Aunt Rose. Have you seen a mouse with a waffly nose? Oh, somewhere about. Uh, he's just got out. Hasn't anybody seen my mouse? The King's Breakfast The King asked the Queen and the Queen asked the dairymaid, Could we have some butter for the royal slice of bread? The Queen asked the dairymaid, the dairymaid said, Certainly, I'll go and tell the cow now before she goes to bed. The dairymaid, she curtsied, and went and told the Alderney, Don't forget the butter for the royal slice of bread. The Alderney said sleepily, You'd better tell His Majesty that many people nowadays like marmalade instead. The dairymaid said, Fancy! and went to Her Majesty. She curtsied to the Queen, and she turned a little red. "'Excuse me, Your Majesty, for taking off the liberty, but marmalade is tasty if it's very thickly spread.' The Queen said, "'Oh!' and went to His Majesty. "'Talking of the butter for the royal slice of bread, many people think that marmalade is nicer.' Would you like to try a little marmalade instead? The king said, Bother! And then he said, Oh, dearie me! The king sobbed, Oh, dearie me! And went back to bed. Nobody, he whimpered, could call me a fussy man. I only want a little bit of butter for my bread. The queen said, There, there! And went to the dairymaid. The dairymaid said, there, there, and went to the shed. The cow said, There, there, I didn't really mean it. 
here's milk for his porringer and butter for his bread the queen took the butter and brought it to his majesty the king said butter eh and bounced out of bed nobody he said as he kissed her tenderly nobody he said as he slid down the banisters nobody my darling could call me a fussy man but i do like a little bit of butter to my bread End of section. Section seven of When We Were Very Young. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. When We Were Very Young by A. A. Milne. Section seven. Hoppity. Christopher Robin goes hoppity hoppity, hoppity hoppity hop. Whenever I tell him politely to stop it, he says he can't possibly stop. If he stopped hopping, he couldn't go anywhere. Poor little Christopher couldn't go anywhere. That's why he always goes hoppity 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 hop. At home. I want a soldier, a soldier in a busby. I want a soldier to come and play with me. I'd give him cream cakes, big ones, sugar ones. I'd give him cream cakes and cream for his tea. I want a soldier, a tall one, a red one. I want a soldier who plays on the drum. Daddy's going to get one. He's written to the shopman. Daddy's going to get one as soon as he can come. THE WRONG HOUSE I went into a house, and it wasn't a house. It has big steps and a great big hall. But it hasn't got a garden, a garden, a garden. It isn't like a house at all. I went into a house, and it wasn't a house. It has a big garden and a great high wall. But it hasn't got a may tree, a may tree, a may tree. It isn't like a house at all. I went into a house, and it wasn't a house. Slow white petals from the may tree fall. But it hasn't got a blackbird, a blackbird, a blackbird. It isn't like a house at all. I went into a house, and I thought it was a house. I could hear from the may tree the blackbird call. But nobody listened to it. Nobody liked it. Nobody wanted it at all. Summer Afternoon Six brown cows walked down to drink. All the little fishes blew bubbles at the mayfly. Splash goes the first as he comes to the brink. Swish go the tails of the five who follow. Twelve brown cows bend drinking bear. All the little fishes went waggle-tail, waggle-tail, six from the water and six from the air. Up and down the river darts a blue-black swallow. THE DORMOUSE AND THE DOCTOR There once was a dormouse who lived in a bed of delphiniums blue and geraniums red. And all the day long he'd a wonderful view of geraniums red and delphiniums blue. A doctor came hurrying round, and he said, Tut, tut, I am sorry to find you in bed. Just say, ninety-nine, while I look at your chest. And don't you find that chrysanthemums answer the best? The dormouse looked round at the view and replied, when he'd said ninety-nine, that he tried and he tried and much the most answering things that he knew were geraniums red and delphiniums blue the doctor stood frowning and shaking his head and he took up his shiny silk hat as he said what the patient requires is a change and he went to see some chrysanthemum people in kent the dormouse lay there and he gazed at the view of geraniums red and delphiniums blue 
and he knew there was nothing he wanted instead of delphinium's blue and geranium's red the doctor came back and to show what he meant he had brought some chrysanthemum cuttings from kent now these he remarked give a much better view than geranium's red and delphinium's blue they took out their spades and they dug up the bed of delphinium's blue and geranium's red and they planted chrysanthemums yellow and white and now said the doctor we'll soon have you right the dormouse looked out and he said with a sigh i suppose all these people know better than i it was silly perhaps but i did like the view of geranium's red and delphinium's blue the doctor came round and examined his chest and ordered him nourishment tonics and rest how very effective he said as he shook the thermometer all these chrysanthemums look the dormouse turned over to shut out the sight of endless chrysanthemums yellow and white how lovely he thought to be back in a bed of delphinium's blue and geranium's red the doctor said tut it's another attack and ordered him milk and massage of the back and freedom from worry and drives in a car and murmured how sweet your chrysanthemums are the dormouse lay there with his paws to his eyes and imagined himself such a pleasant surprise i'll pretend the chrysanthemums turned to a bed of delphinium's blue and geranium's red the doctor next morning was rubbing his hands and saying there's nobody quite understands these cases as i do the cure has begun how fresh the chrysanthemums look in the sun the dormouse lay happy his eyes were so tight he could see no chrysanthemums yellow or white and all that he felt at the back of his head were delphinium's blue and geranium's red and that is the reason aunt emily said if a dormouse gets in a chrysanthemum bed you will find so aunt emily says that he lies fast asleep on his front with his paws to his eyes end of section section eight of when we were very young this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording is by mark smith of simpsonville south carolina when we were very young by a a milne section eight shoes and stockings there's a cavern in the mountain where the old men meet hammer 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 they make gold slippers for my lady's feet hammer 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 my lady is marrying her own true knight white her gown and her veil is white but she must have slippers on her dainty feet hammer 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 there's a cottage by the river where the old wives meet chatter 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 they weave gold stockings for my lady's feet chatter 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 my lady is going to her own true man youth to youth since the world began but she must have stockings on her dainty feet chatter 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 sand between the toes i went down to the shouting sea taking christopher down with me for nurse had given us sixpence each and down we went to the beach we had sand in the eyes and the ears and the nose and sand in the hair and sand between the toes whenever a good nor'wester blows christopher is certain of sand between the toes the sea was galloping gray and white christopher clutched his sixpence tight we clambered over the humping sand 
and Christopher held my hand. We had sand in the eyes, and the ears, and the nose, and sand in the hair, and sand between the toes. Whenever a good nor'wester blows, Christopher is certain of sand between the toes. There was a roaring in the sky. The seagulls cried as they blew by. We tried to talk, but had to shout. Nobody else was out. When we got home, we had sand in the air, in the eyes and the ears, and everywhere. Whenever a good nor'wester blows, Christopher is found with sand between the toes. Knights and Ladies There is in my old picture-book a page at which I like to look, where knights and squires come riding down the cobbles of some steep old town, and ladies from beneath the eaves flutter their bravest handkerchiefs, or, smiling proudly, toss down gauges. Ah, oh, but that was in the Middle Ages. It wouldn't happen now, but still— Whenever I look up the hill, where, dark against the green and blue, the firs come marching two by two, I wonder if perhaps I might see suddenly a shining knight winding his way from blue to green, exactly as it would have been these many, many years ago. Perhaps I might. You never know. Little Bo Peep and Little Boy Blue What have you done with your sheep, Little Bo Peep? What have you done with your sheep, Bo Peep? Little Boy Blue, what fun! I've lost them, every one. Oh, what a thing to have done, Little Bo Peep! What have you done with your sheep, Little Boy Blue? What have you done with your sheep, Boy Blue? Little Bo Peep, my sheep, went off when I was asleep. I'm sorry about your sheep, little boy blue. What are you going to do, little Bo Peep? What are you going to do, Bo Peep? Little boy blue, you'll see, they'll all come home to tea. They wouldn't do that for me, little Bo Peep. What are you going to do, little boy blue? What are you going to do, boy blue? Little Bo Peep, I'll blow my horn for an hour or so. Isn't that rather slow, Little Boy Blue? Whom are you going to marry, Little Bo Peep? Whom are you going to marry, Bo Peep? Little Boy Blue, Boy Blue, I'd like to marry you. I think I should like it too, Little Bo Peep. Where are we going to live, Little Boy Blue? Where are we going to live, Boy Blue? Little Bo Peep, Bo Peep, up in the hills with the sheep. And you'll love your little Bo Peep, little boy blue? I'll love you for ever and ever, little Bo Peep. I'll love you for ever and ever, Bo Peep. Little boy blue, my dear, keep near, keep very near. I shall always be here, little Bo Peep. The Mirror between the woods the afternoon is fallen in a golden swoon. The sun looks down from quiet skies to where a quiet water lies, and silent trees stoop down to trees, and there I saw a white swan make another white swan in the lake, and breast to breast, both motionless, they waited for the wind's caress, and all the water was at ease. End of section. Section 9 of When We Were Very Young. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. When We Were Very Young by A. A. Milne. Section 9 Halfway Down Halfway down the stairs is a stair where I sit. There isn't any other stair quite like it. I'm not at the bottom. I'm not at the top. 
So this is the stair where I always stop. Halfway up the stairs isn't up and isn't down. It isn't in the nursery. It isn't in the town. And all sorts of funny thoughts run round my head. It isn't really anywhere. It's somewhere else instead. THE INVADERS In careless patches through the wood, the clumps of yellow primrose stood, and sheets of white anemones, like driven snows against the trees, had covered up the violet, and left the bluebell bluer yet. Along the narrow carpet ride, with primroses on either side, between their shadows and the sun, the cows came slowly, one by one, breathing the early morning air and leaving it still sweeter there, and, one by one, intent upon their purposes, they followed on in ordered silence and were gone. But all the little wood was still, as if it waited so, until some blackbird on an outpost yew, watching the slow procession through, lifted his yellow beak at last, to whistle that the line had passed. Then all the wood began to sing its morning anthem to the spring. Before Tea Emmeline has not been seen for more than a week. She slipped between the two tall trees at the end of the green. We all went after her. Emmeline! Emmeline, I didn't mean, ah, uh, I only said that your hands weren't clean. We went to the trees at the end of the green, but Emmeline was not to be seen. Emmeline came slipping between the two tall trees at the end of the green. We all ran up to her. Emmeline, where have you been? Where have you been? Why, it's more than a week. And Emmeline said, Sillies, I went and saw the queen. She says my hands are perfectly clean. Teddy Bear A bear, however hard he tries, grows tubby without exercise. Our teddy bear is short and fat, which is not to be wondered at. He gets what exercise he can by falling off the ottoman and generally seems to lack the energy to clamber back. Now, tubbiness is just the thing which gets a fellow wondering, and Teddy worried lots about the fact that he was rather stout. He thought, if only I were thin, but how does anyone begin? He thought, it really isn't fair to grudge me exercise and air. For many weeks he pressed in vain his nose against the window-pane, and envied those who walked about, reducing their unwanted stout. None of the people he could see is quite, he said, as fat as me. Then, with a still more moving sigh, I mean, he said, as fat as I. Now, Teddy, as was only right, slept in the ottoman at night, and with him crowded in as well more animals than I can tell. Not only these, but books and things, such as a kind relation brings, old tales of once upon a time, and history retold in rhyme. One night it happened that he took a peep at an old picture-book, wherein he came across, by chance, the picture of a king of France, a stoutish man, and down below these words, King Louis so-and-so, nicknamed the Handsome. There he sat, and think of it, the man was fat. Our bear rejoiced like anything to read about this famous king, nicknamed the Handsome. There he sat, and certainly the man was fat. Nicknamed the handsome, not a doubt. The man was definitely stout. Why, then, a bear, for all his tub, 
might yet be named the handsome cub might yet be named or did he mean that years ago he might have been uh, for now he felt a slight misgiving is louis so-and-so still living fashions in beauty have a way of altering from day to day is handsome louis with us yet unfortunately i forget next morning nose to window-pane the doubt occurred to him again one question hammered in his head is he alive or is he dead thus nose to pain he pondered but the lattice window loosely shut swung open with one startled oh our teddy disappeared below there happened to be passing by a plump man with a twinkling eye who seeing teddy in the street raised him politely to his feet and murmured kindly in his ear soft words of comfort and of cheer well well allow me not at all tut tut a very nasty fall our teddy answered not a word it's doubtful if he even heard our bear could only look and look the stout man in the picture book that handsome king could this be he this man of adiposity impossible he thought but still no harm in asking yes i will are you he said by any chance his majesty the king of france the other answered i am that bowed stiffly and removed his hat then said excuse me with an air but is it mr edward bear and teddy bending very low replied politely even so they stood beneath the window there the king and mr edward bear and handsome if a trifle fat talk carelessly of this and that then said his majesty well well i must get on and rang the bell your bear i think he smiled good day and turned and went upon his way a bear however hard he tries grows tubby without exercise our teddy bear is short and fat which is not to be wondered at but do you think it worries him to know that he is far from slim no just the other way about he's proud of being short and stout bad sir brian botany sir brian had a battle-axe with great big knobs on he went among the villagers and blipped them on the head on wednesday and on saturday but mostly on the latter day he called at all the cottages and this is what he said i am sir brian tingling i am sir brian rat tat i am sir brian as bold as a lion take that and that and that sir brian had a pair of boots with great big spurs on a fighting pair of which he was particularly fond on tuesday and on friday just to make the streets look tidy he'd collect the passing villagers and kick them in the pond i am sir brian persplash i am sir brian spurlosh i am sir brian as bold as a lion as any one else for a wash sir brian woke one morning and he couldn't find his battle-axe he walked into the village in his second pair of boots he had gone a hundred paces when the street was full of faces and the villagers were round him with ironical salutes you are sir brian indeed you are sir brian dear dear you are sir brian as bold as a lion delighted to meet you here sir brian went a journey and he found a lot of duckweed. They pulled him out and dried him, and they blipped him on the head. They took him by the breeches, and they hurled him into ditches, and they pushed him under waterfalls, and this is what they said. You are Sir Brian. Don't laugh. You are Sir Brian. Don't cry. You are Sir Brian, as bold as a lion. Sir Brian the lion, good-bye. 
Sir Brian struggled home again, and chopped up his battle-axe. Sir Brian took his fighting boots and threw them in the fire. He is quite a different person now, he hasn't got his spurs on, and he goes about the village as B. Botany, Esquire. I am Sir Brian? Oh, no! I am Sir Brian? Who's he? I haven't got any title. I'm Botany. Plain Mr. Botany, B. End of section. Section 10 of When We Were Very Young. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. When We Were Very Young by A. A. Milne Section 10 In the Fashion a lion has a tail, and a very fine tail, and so has an elephant, and so has a whale, and so has a crocodile, and so has a quail. They've all got tails but me. If I had sixpence, I would buy one. I'd say to the shopman, let me try one. I'd say to the elephant, this is my one. They'd all come round to see. Then I'd say to the lion, Why, you've got a tail, and so is the elephant, and so has the whale, and look, there's a crocodile, he's got a tail. You've all got tails like me. The Alchemist There lives an old man at the top of the street, and the end of his beard reaches down to his feet, and he's just the one person I'm longing to meet. I think that he sounds so exciting. For he talks all the day to his tortoise-shell cat, and he asks about this, and explains about that, and at night he puts on a big wide-awake hat, and sits in the writing-room writing. He's worked all his life, and he's terribly old, at a wonderful spell which says, Lo and behold! Your nursery fender is gold, and it's gold, or the tongs or the rod for the curtain. But somehow he hasn't got hold of it quite, or the liquid you pour on it first isn't right. So that's why he works at it night after night, till he knows he can do it for certain. Growing Up I've got shoes with grown-up laces. I've got knickers and a pair of braces. I'm all ready to run some races. Who's coming out with me? I've got a nice new pair of braces. I've got shoes with new brown laces. I know wonderful padly places. Who's coming out with me? Every morning my new grace is, Thank you, God, for my nice braces. I can tie my new brown laces. Who's coming out with me? If I were king, I often wish I were a king, and then I could do anything. If only I were king of Spain, I'd take my hat off in the rain. If only I were king of France, I wouldn't brush my hair for ants. I think if I were king of Greece, I'd push things off the mantelpiece. If I were king of Norway, I'd ask an elephant to stay. If I were king of Babylon, I'd leave my button gloves undone. If I were king of Timbuktu, I'd think of lovely things to do. If I were king of anything, I'd tell the soldiers, I'm the king! Vespers Little boy kneels at the foot of the bed, Droops on the little hand's little gold head. Hush, hush, whisper who dares. Christopher Robin is saying his prayers. God bless Mummy. I know that's right. Wasn't it fun in the bath tonight? The cold so cold and the hot so hot. Oh, God bless Daddy. I quite forgot. 
If I open my fingers a little bit more, I can see Nanny's dressing gown on the door. It's a beautiful blue, but it hasn't a hood. Oh, God bless Nanny and make her good. Mine has a hood, and I lie in bed and pull the hood right over my head, and I shut my eyes and I curl up small, and nobody knows that I'm there at all. Oh, thank you, God, for a lovely day. And what was the other I had to say? I said, bless Daddy, so what can it be? Oh, now I remember it. God bless me. Little boy kneels at the foot of the bed, droops on the little hand's little gold head. Hush, hush, whisper who dares. Christopher Robin is saying his prayers. End of section and end of book. Thank you for listening. This is the NBC University Theater, bringing you a full-hour dramatization of Jane Austen's distinguished novel, Pride and Prejudice, starring Angela Lansbury as Elizabeth Bennet. Pride and Prejudice was a first novel written by Miss Austen at the age of 21. Today, it's the best known of her works. A delightful romance and a comedy of manners based on provincial family life in England of the late 1700s. The book has been adapted a number of times for stage, screen, and radio, and its popularity in all forms seems to grow with the decades. Today on University Theater, we bring you a new version for radio and an exciting cast headed by Miss Angela Lansbury. Here, then, is Pride and Prejudice. It is about the year 1800. On the continent, Napoleon and his endless wars are creating havoc and confusion. In England, near Hertfordshire, a certain Mrs. Bennet is also creating havoc and confusion. On a smaller scale, perhaps, but nonetheless definitely. Mr. Bennet, as Mrs. Bennet is beginning to suspect, has sought refuge in his library. Oh, there you are, you naughty man. Oh, dear, dear, she's finally at last. What is it, my dear? My dear Mr. Bennet, have you heard that the house at Netherfield Park has been let at last? No, Mrs. Bennet, I have not. Lydia says that Netherfield has been taken by two unmarried young men of large fortunes down from London. A Mr. Bingley and a Mr. Darcy. How lovely. Bingley and Darcy, lovely. How so, my dear? Oh, Mr. Bennet, how can you be so tiresome? Surely you must know that I'm thinking of the young gentleman marrying at least one of our girls. Oh, you mean that is why they've come to settle at Netherfield? If we are clever enough, they may fall in love with Jane or Elizabeth. Lydia being a trifle too young, I fear. So now you must go over at once and bite them in tea, so that we can uh, get acquainted in time for the Meryton Ball. Oh, this is most unreasonable. I've never been introduced. Then you must introduce yourself. There's really nothing to it. Then let me suggest that you go. I will send along a note by your hand, assuring the gentlemen of my hearty consent to their dancing with and marrying whichever they choose of the girls. Though I must throw in a good word for Elizabeth, for she's more quickness than her sisters. You always favour Elizabeth. And you know that she's not half as handsome as Jane, nor half as good-humoured as Lydia. Oh, nonsense. They have none of them much to recommend them. They are at best three silly girls without husbands. Oh, Mr. Bennet, you have no compassion for my nerves. Oh, come now, quite the contrary, my dear. Your nerves are my old friend. 
I've heard you mention them with consideration these 20 years at least. Ah, you don't know how I suffer. If only you would invite the young gentleman to tea, it would make me so happy. Then our girls could be properly introduced to Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy and could accept them for partners at the Meriton Ball. Oh, Mr. Bennett, what would you say to Elizabeth for Mr. Darcy and Jane for Mr. Bingley? Mama! Oh, there's Jane now. Mama! Have you heard about the news about the Netherfield Hall? Well, not only has your mama heard, Jane, but she's made certain arrangements. Jane, what would you think of attending the Meriton Ball with Mr. Bingley? Oh, I, I doubt very much that the gentleman would include me in his plans without first having met me. Jane, you underestimate your mama. Bingley, a week ago I hardly dreamed that the ball would be graced by your presence. I owe a great deal to your mother, Miss Jane. What a dear, kind, neighborly woman she is. Oh, how nice of you to say so, Mr. Bingley. Not at all. I will stand forever in her debt. Uh, had it not been for your mother's genuine neighborly concern and affection, we might never have been uh, properly introduced. Oh, Mr. Bingley. Never have I met more pleasant people in such amiable surroundings. Why, only this morning I said to my friend Darcy... Darcy, I could spend the rest of my life here. And what did Mr. Darcy say? He said, um, hmm. Oh. <laughs> then he went on with his breakfast. Oh. Most unusual man, Darcy. A highly volatile mixture of high ideals and a fearful temper. Really, Mr. Bingley? Most emphatically, Miss Bennett. Uh, Darcy is the best friend and the most unpredictable man I have ever met. Oh. And uh, now, Miss Jane... May I have the pleasure of this dance? But, Mr. Bingley, the dance has ended. I am requesting the dance that's about to begin. Two in a row, Mr. Bingley. What will people say? <laughs> they will say that Charles Bingley is the most fortunate man in the room. Oh, oh but who will sit with Mama? Oh, my, my dear friend, Mr. Darcy. Even now, he's joined her and your sister Elizabeth near the punch bowl. Mr. Darcy, why are you not dancing? Perhaps Mr. Darcy does not enjoy dancing, Mama. It is my observation, Mrs. Bennet, that much depends upon having the right partner. But of course, Mr. Darcy, everything in the world depends on having the right partner. <laughs> um, quite. Uh, do you like the country better than the city, Mr. Darcy? Uh, I find... I find the city and the country are pretty much the same. They each have their disadvantages, but I dare say I am able to keep myself amused. Well, you should be well amused this evening, Mr. Darcy. You'll notice that the room is filled with accomplished young ladies. Wherever you go in England, you'll always find accomplished young ladies. I'm afraid that I cannot agree with that statement, Mrs. Bennet. Of all the young women I have met, I cannot say that more than half a dozen of them are really accomplished. You must have very high standards, Mr. Darcy. Just what do you require in a woman? The ideal woman, in addition to attractiveness, grace and charm, should have, I would say, a fluent knowledge of languages both modern and ancient. Oh, dear me. Go on, Mr. Darcy. You I, interest me. I should hope that a young lady of accomplishment would have a knowledge of music and drawing. An impressive set of qualifications, Mr. Darcy. But any bright pupil would be quite capable of meeting them. I am not yet finished. Oh, pray continue. I would also desire that she possess a certain something in her air and her manner of walking, the tone of her voice, the manner of speaking, and her smile. How incredible! May heaven save us from such an accomplished creature. She could hardly be human. I flatter myself that I know at least as many women as you do, Mr. Darcy, and I have never seen such taste and application and elegance as you have described. I am no longer surprised at your knowing only six accomplished women. I rather wonder at you knowing any. If you will excuse me. I see that Mr. Bingley has disengaged himself, and I would like to have a word with him. Oh, well, anyway, Jane danced twice in a row with Mr. Bingley. She's gone out on the balcony now, Mama. I'd like to discover whether Mr. Bingley is as ill-mannered as Mr. Darcy. Jane, are you there, Jane? Oh, Elizabeth, are you alone? Quite. My partner left me suddenly. Oh, Mr. Bingley went to bring me some sherry, and we agreed to meet on the balcony. Mr. Bingley seems most genuinely fond of you, Jane. Yes, I know. Do you care for him? 
How can I be sure of what I feel for a man whom I've known such a short while? Oh, but truly, Elizabeth, Mr. Bingley is sensible, good-humored, and lively, and I never saw such happy manners and such perfect I really don't good know breeding. I have a fine time. Isn't that Mr. Bingley on the terrace below? Why, so it is. What? I do believe that's Mr. Darcy with him. And upon my word, I detest these stupid affairs. Oh, now, come, Darcy. I must have you dance. Hate to see you standing out here in such a stupid manner. Now, there isn't a woman in the room that wouldn't be punishment for me to stand up with. Oh, Darcy. that insufferable creature. I would not be as fastidious as you are for a kingdom. Now, you are dancing with the only handsome girl in the room. Oh? How about her sister, Elizabeth? You seem to find each other most stimulating at tea the other day. I suffered Miss Elizabeth company at tea because I was her father's guest. But I find her manner most disconcerting. Oh. She has a sharp tongue and a mind prejudiced against men. Dear me, I would say that uh, Miss Elizabeth had uh, quite captured your imagination, Darcy. This uh, couldn't be love, could it? Uh, hardly. I still pride myself on my own good taste. <laughs> Darcy, you are hopeless. Come along now. I promised a glass of sherry to Miss Jane. Very well. But heaven protect us from her insufferable mother. Uh, Mrs. Bennet has all the natural charms and attractions of a leech. <laughs> oh, what a horrible man. I fear that Mr. Darcy forgot himself. To the contrary, my dear sister. Mr. Darcy was more himself than ever. Oh, but how could he? It doesn't matter, Jane. Now, not a word of this to Mama. Not only would it spoil her evening, it would cast a pall over her breakfast for the next week. Oh, Mr. Bennet, I wish you'd been there to share my happiness. Elizabeth put that horrid Mr. Darcy in his place. And Jane was so admired. Mr. Bingley and Jane danced the first and the third and the fifth. And then came the boulanger. Nothing, Mr. Bennett? Oh, enough. If Mr. Bingley... No, how wonderful it would be to have Jane married and settled at Netherfield. Oh, the most commendable dream, my dear. Meanwhile, let us be a little more realistic and hope that you've ordered a good dinner for today. How can you think of dinner at a time like this? Because I've just had a letter informing me that we may expect a young gentleman for dinner. That is to say, he will dine with us. Why, who do you mean, Mr. Bennett? I mean my cousin, the Reverend Mr. Collins of Hansford who, after I'm gone from this earth, will inherit this house and estate. You mean you invited that odious young man? Oh, he invited himself. But why is he coming? Well, his patroness, uh, one Lady Catherine, has suggested that he find someone to share his rectory. Uh, Mr. Collins is coming here in search of a wife. You mean... Why, the dear man! And if it should happen that Mr. Collins would marry one of our girls, it would mean that we would not lose the estate. Exactly. Oh, the dear, dear man! Elizabeth looked most attractive last night. Oh, surely you'd not send Elizabeth off to a rectory. And why not? I would be quite satisfied to see Elizabeth married and established at Huntsford. Well, I think you'd better consider Elizabeth's feelings in that matter. She may not wish to marry. Mr. Bennett, it's every girl's duty to marry. And if Elizabeth cannot see it, I shall make her see it. Well, let us hope so. Mr. Collins can be Elizabeth's partner at Charlotte Lucas's ball at week's end. And if Charlotte Lucas even so much as looks at Mr. Collins, I'll scratch her eyes out. Truly, Charlotte, you ought to be congratulated on a most successful affair. Why, thank you, Elizabeth. And may I say the same to you? I saw you dancing with Mr. Collins, and I must say he was most attentive. He's got his eye on you. Oh, come, Charlotte, don't talk nonsense. Elizabeth, I know the symptoms. And I'll wager that it won't be long before Mr. Collins will be asking for your hand. Now, you're being ridiculous. I hardly know Mr. Collins. Why, he's like a stranger to me. And to me, but so much the better. I'd marry him if he'd ask me. Charlotte. Well, I say that happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance. And I'm willing to take the chance. Well, you can't deny that... Mr. Collins certainly is more agreeable than Mr. Darcy. Oh, Charlotte, I beg of you. Mr. Darcy is so disagreeable. Well, despite my sympathy for Elizabeth, I must say that Mr. Darcy's pride does not offend me. How so, Charlotte? Because there's an excuse for it. So very fine a young man should think highly of himself. If I may say so, he has a right to be proud. Well, what you say is true, Charlotte. I could forgive Mr. Darcy's pride easily. If he had not mortified mine. La, enough of Mr. Darcy. 
Look who's about to join us. Mr. Collins. Ah, good evening, ladies. Ah, dear Mr. Collins. I hope you'll forgive me, but did I not hear you mention the name of Mr. Darcy? Why, yes, do you know him? Mr. Darcy is the nephew of Mr. Collins' patroness, Lady Catherine. Quite. And as I approached and heard you mention Mr. Darcy's name, I was struck by a most bizarre circumstance. Indeed, Mr. Collins. What was it, if I may ask? Well, as it happens, while you were talking of Mr. Darcy, I happened to look across the ballroom. And there I saw your sister Lydia dancing across the floor in the arms of a gentleman who is said to be Mr. Darcy's arch enemy. Really? You don't say. Mr. Collins, do you refer to the officer of the regiment, Mr. George Wickham? Well, uh, it wasn't my intention to identify the gentleman by name, but uh, yes, it was Mr. Wickham. What a most unusual coincidence. Why? Do you know Mr. Wickham? No, I've not had the pleasure as yet, for Mr. Wickham has but recently arrived in Hertfordshire. But as it happens, my sister Lydia has been introduced, and she has arranged for me to have the next dance with Mr. Wickham. Mr. Wickham, I hope you will not find me too bold if I ask you a a most intimate question. Not at all. I admire your candor. Fire away. Do I understand that a certain situation exists between you and Mr. Darcy? Mm, An awkward situation, to say the least. Why do you ask? Because I'm interested in your opinion of him. Believe me, Miss Bennet, when I say that if it were not for Mr. Darcy, I would be a wealthy man today. But I, I stand before you a victim of his awful pride. I am well acquainted with his pride. Pray continue. When my late father passed on, the senior Mr. Darcy undertook to provide for my welfare... As a consequence, young Darcy and I were raised as brothers in the same house. And that annoyed young Darcy's pride. But as long as his father lived, he could do nothing. However, after his father died, Darcy revenged his pride by refusing to carry out the provisions of his father's last will and testament. Do I understand, Mr. Wickham, that Darcy refused you that which was rightfully yours? Unfortunately for me, yes. I had been raised for the church, and under the terms of the will, I was to receive a rich parish. But it was never given to me. I did not suspect that he would descend to such malicious revenge, such injustice, such inhumanity as this. And it makes me even more astonished at his intimacy with Mr. Bingley, who is good humour itself. How Mr. Bingley can tolerate Mr. Darcy? I would say that it is most likely that Mr. Darcy completely dominates Mr. Bingley. They are giving a ball next fortnight at their new house in Netherfield. I do hope, Mr. Wickham, that you will be present. Uh, To the present time, I have not been invited. But even if I were, I I would doubt my acceptance. But you will surely be there? Well, I am committed to attend with a certain Mr. Collins. (laughs) Oh, no, not Mr. Collins. Not for you, dear lady. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. I say, Miss Elizabeth, are you enjoying yourself? Oh, very much, Mr. Collins. Lady Catherine has said to me many times, Mr. Collins, make sure that your partner enjoys herself. She's a very wise woman. I have no doubt. Quite. One, two, three, four. One, two. Dear me, look there. Is that Lady Catherine's nephew standing all alone in the corner? Are you referring to Mr. Darcy? But of course. It is Mr. Darcy and no partner. What would Lady Catherine say? Come along, Miss Elizabeth. We will remedy that immediately. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Collins. What is your intent? Why, Mr. Collins, not even for Lady Catherine would I consent to dance. Mr. Collins, Collins is quite loyal to Lady Catherine, Mr. Darcy. Quite. Netherfield is a very interesting house. Do you not think so, Mr. Darcy? Uh, Yes, very. It's a nice dance. Is it not, Mr. Darcy? I find it so. (laughs) Truly, I don't think there are two people who have less to say to each other. Oh, I don't know about that. Would you like to talk about books? I don't think so, for I fear that we would not have the same tastes. Why don't we try something that interests us both? Uh, Very well. Suppose you will start. Let us talk of pride. Can you define it, Mr. Darcy? Yes. Pride is strength and character. 
By example, there is pride of family, pride of home, and pride of self. I would make a virtue of pride. I fear that you have made it your fault. Oh, I did not know that you were a studier of character. You must find it very dull in the country. Oh, no, not at all. All sorts of people come through. For example, you and Mr. Bingley. You are given to melancholy, while he is pleasant, cheerful, and considerate. Well put, Miss Bennett. But the trouble with Bingley is that he fancies himself in love. Well, I trust you had a delightful dance, Mr. Darcy. Quite, and most instructive. Oh, yes. We discussed vanity, pride, and we almost discussed love. Do you believe in love, Mr. Darcy? Yes, I do. But fancying oneself in love is something else again. Well spoken, sir. But how is one to know true love from false? The only manner in which two people can determine the degree of their mutual affection is through the exchange of confidences, a procedure hardly suited to a ballroom. I'm inclined to agree with you, Mr. Darcy. I must say that I've always fancied the ideal situation for confessions of affection to be a garden. Oh, Miss Elizabeth! Oh, dear, she must be somewhere in this garden. Oh, Miss Elizabeth! Where are you? I'm over here behind the box hedge. Just follow the path. Good morning, Mr. Collins. Good morning, Miss Elizabeth. I regret the intrusion upon the privacy of your garden in this fashion, but I trust you will forgive me when I explain my purpose in coming here. Indeed, Mr. Collins. You seem quite distressed. Is there something wrong? Oh, no, no, no. To the contrary, I'm beside myself with joy. Your mother has given me her permission. Miss Elizabeth, since almost the first moment I entered your father's house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. Mr. Collins. You have only to say that you'll be mine. Then all that will remain will be for me to assure you in the most animated language of the violence of my affection. And, And then we can be married. Oh, you are too hasty, sir. Please accept my thanks for the compliment you are paying me. But I cannot do otherwise than decline. Oh, how modest you are. But I've heard how you ladies decline when secretly you mean to accept. (laughs) Upon my word, sir, I assure you I decline. You could not make me happy, and I am convinced that I am the last woman in the world who would make you so. I cannot believe that, Miss Elizabeth. In the first place, it would be to your advantage to marry me. For someday I will inherit this very house. And because you cannot have a very large dowry, it is very unlikely that another offer of marriage will ever be made to you. Mr. Collins, I appreciate your consideration for my poor position in the world, but I cannot marry you. Now will you please leave? Come here, Elizabeth Child. I understand that Mr. Collins has made an offer of marriage. You've refused. Is that true? Yes, Father. Oh, you ungrateful girl. Now, Elizabeth, we must come to the point. Your mother insists upon your accepting. Is that not so, Mrs. Bennet? Yes, or I will never see her again. Well, an unhappy alternative before you, Elizabeth. From this day on, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Or your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I never see you again if you do. Jane, how wonderful a father. I can just see the look on Mother's face. Oh, not so loud, Lydia. Elizabeth said that Mother was furious. I wonder how she'll ever explain to Mr. Collins. <laughs> I'm sure I don't know. But it was enough to send him running directly over to Charlotte Lucas. Oh. <laughs> Poor girl. Charlotte deserves something better than that. Well, at least it saved the day for Elizabeth. You're the fortunate one, Jane. Oh. That handsome Mr. Bingley. Come in. Oh, Elizabeth. We were just talking about you. Yes, do come in and tell us more about Mr. Collins. There will be time for that another day. Why, Elizabeth, what is the matter? Did Mr. Collins upset you? No, no, it isn't that. Then what is it, for heaven's sake? You're you're white and, and trembling. I'm sorry. It wasn't my intention to cause distress, but we have received a note from Netherfield Park. Is it from Mr. Bingley? No. Mr. Darcy, then... 
What is this all about, Elizabeth? Well, it is. It concerns them both, and would that I did not need to tell you. Is it bad news, then? Well, Elizabeth, you must tell us. I really find difficulty in making up my mind whether it is good or bad. Mr. Darcy has just left for London. Is that all? I say good riddance. Is Mr. Bingley going to stay on alone in the house? I'm afraid not, Jane. They have closed up the house. How very unusual. Where will Mr. Bingley stay? Mr. Bingley is gone too, Jane. According to the note, Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy have left Netherfield for good. Oh, no. Lydia, catch her before she falls. Oh, give me the smelling salts, Lydia. They're on the chest. Charles. Charles. Here you are. Now try to breathe deeply, Jane. That's better. You'll be all right. Now try it again. Charles, how could you leave me? It is not Mr. Bingley who has done this, sister. I fear that he is under the influence of another. Perhaps he never loved me. Dear Jane. Dear Charles, I must do my best to forget him. But he will live in my memory as the most amiable man of my acquaintance. I have nothing to reproach him with. Oh, Jane... Would that I could speak as kindly of the man whose terrible pride has caused your unhappiness. I take consolation in the knowledge that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you Angela Lansbury in a radio version of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. This play is the third in a new series devoted to the classic novels of Anglo-American literature. If you're interested in supplementing your enjoyment of these productions with home study under college supervision, be sure to listen to the announcement at the close of this program. And now, our intermission commentator, the popular and prolific novelist I.A.R. Wiley. Speaking from New York, here is I.A.R. Wiley. Two well-known British authors, Sheila K. Smith and G.B. Stern, once collaborated on a highly entertaining book called Speaking of Jane Austen, in which they described themselves as Janeites, or in other words, Jane Austen fans. The world is full of them. Every day, new members add themselves to the fraternity. For the amazing thing is that whereas other writers of her period grow dustier and more dated with the passing of time, Jane's stories seem to take on a richer sheen to become more sparkling, more vital, and more utterly delightful. I think one reason is that without knowing it, she was a born and most brilliant storyteller. Somerset Maughan said in a recent interview, I am quoting roughly from memory, that he turned the pages of her novels in breathless excitement even though he knew that what was going to happen didn't amount to a storm in a teacup. To this day, though I have read Pride and Prejudice a dozen times, I still have heart flutterings over the vicissitudes of Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy's stately, if somewhat peppery, love affair. I still chuckle, surprised, delighted chuckles, at Jane's sly digs at the pomposities, snobberies, and follies of her time and class. She accepted them as part of her own background, but she stood back a little from them, and her eyes twinkled demurely, and she laughed mischievously to herself. She makes us laugh with her, sometimes explosively, in sheer surprise at the keenness of her thrusts, but they are never angry or malicious thrusts. Another reason for Jane's enduring greatness is that she never attempted anything that was too big for her. She lived in the Napoleonic era when her country was once more fighting tyranny for its freedom, but she makes only the most indirect reference to the war or to the social problems and evils of her time. She was not, however, a modern escapist. She simply confined herself to a world she knew, which was a very real one. The life of middle-class and upper-class England, for all its limitations, had grace and dignity and charm and even strength. She painted its portrait. She called herself a miniaturist. She was more like an etcher, whose acid drew in sharp, deep, clean lines. Her people are real people, and in spite of change in manners and customs and costumes, they are still real. 
Now you are meeting some of them. The proud Mr. Darcy, the gay, vivacious Elizabeth Bennet, no drooping Victorian willow she, the pompous Mr. Collins, the absurd Mrs. Bennet, the much-enduring Mr. Bennet. If this brief encounter doesn't lure you on to discover the whole story with its mischievous wit and restrained but real romance, and if you are not by then a full-fledged Janeite, well, the loss is all yours. Thank you, Miss Wiley. Our radio version of Pride and Prejudice, starring Miss Angela Lansbury as Elizabeth Bennett, will continue from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. So you have. Is there no good news from Jane in London? None. The poor girl writes that she sits waiting still in Aunt Gardner's parlour, hoping in vain that Mr. Bingley will call on her. It is very sad indeed. My only comfort is that Jane will die of a broken heart. Oh. And then Mr. Bingley will be sorry for what he's done. It's a cheering thought, I must say. What about Elizabeth? What does she write? Only a note. She's still with Charlotte and Mr. Collins in Hunsford. Truly, I... I cannot bring myself to understand how Elizabeth was able to accept Charlotte's invitation after what happened between Elizabeth and Mr. Collins. Oh, nonsense. Elizabeth needed a change of scenery, and she was probably thankful for Charlotte's offer. Now, what does Elizabeth write? She says in her letter that she and Charlotte and Mr. Collins are spending this evening with his patroness, Lady Catherine. It seems that her nephew, that horrid Mr. Darcy, is visiting at Hunsford, and Lady Catherine has arranged a dinner... Think of it, Mr. Bennett. Our Elizabeth dining with Lady Catherine de Bourgh. I must congratulate you, Miss Bennett. I have tried for months to get my nephew, Mr. Darcy, to visit us here. But I was never successful until I mentioned, quite by accident, that you were visiting the Collins. My dear aunt, I have always visited you at regular intervals. Whatever brought you both here, it is good fortune for all of us. Indeed, Mr. Collins. Uh, Miss Bennet, your father's estate is entailed on Mr. Collins, I think. Uh, hardly something we think of now, Lady Catherine. It is something I choose to think of, Charlotte. Uh, Miss Bennet, do you play and sing? A little. Some time or other, we shall be happy to hear you. Do you draw? No, not at all. That is very strange. Has your governess left you? We never had any governess. How was that possible? Five daughters brought up at home without a governess? You must have been neglected. Are any of your younger sisters out, Miss Bennet? Yes, ma'am. All. All? All five out at once? Very odd. The younger one's out before the elder are married. The youngest is not yet 16, Lady Catherine. I think it would be very part upon the younger sisters that they should not have their share of society and amusement because the elder may not have the means or inclination to marry early. Upon my word, you give your opinion very decidedly for so young a person. I'm sure my daughter would never put herself forward in such a manner. Oh, no, Mama. It gives me pleasure to look forward to the happy future of my daughter and of my favorite nephew, Mr. Darcy. Uh, Lady Catherine, I... From their infancy, they have been intended for each other, while in their cradles we planned the union. <laughs> uh, well, let us repair to the drawing room. I think it would be pleasant if Anne played for us for a while. Yes, Mama. Good evening, Mr. Darcy. Oh. oh, Miss Elizabeth, what an unexpected pleasure finding you out here. Really, Mr. Darcy? How so? I understood that you were very fond of piano music. And I understood that you were very fond of the pianist. Miss Anne is my cousin. I am fond of all my cousins. 
We are a very loyal family, Miss Bennett. How touching. Then why are you not inside in demonstration of your loyalty? <laughs> I fear that I am not the social type. Hardly, from what I observed of your behaviour at the Meryton Ball. With your outlook, dear lady, you should live in London. Have you ever been there? Oh, yes. I have visited London many times. My sister Jane is in the city now. Have you never happened to see her? I'm afraid I haven't. Nor had Mr. Bingley seen Jane either, I dare say. I do not believe Mr. Bingley has seen Jane since he decided to take leave of Netherfield. Say what you mean, sir, since you persuaded him to leave Netherfield. I beg your pardon. Do not be devious. Mr. Darcy, you cannot hope to deny that you kept Mr. Bingley from Jane. I have no wish to deny anything. I did everything in my power to separate my friend from your sister. How could you? Because Bingley was overpowered with love. Acting in what I believe to be Bingley's best interests, I persuaded him to go to London. And what of my sister Jane, whose heart is broken? Let it be mended. Tell her that Bingley was quite madly in love with her and would have asked her hand in marriage had I not interfered. It is too late for such remedies. Jane suffers now because she believes that she loved Bingley and he loves her not. I must keep silent forever and pray that Bingley will not be allowed to return, free from your interference. Believe me, Miss Bennet, I know the sorrows of separation. I have been kinder towards my friend than I have been to myself. For now I know what Bingley suffered when he was overcome with love. Miss Elizabeth, in vain I have struggled, but my feelings will not be repressed. Mr. Darcy, I pray you consider the import of your sentiments. I am most painfully aware. For weeks and months I have wrestled with myself against all my better judgment and reason, but it will not do. I am quite overcome. Mr. Darcy, what are you trying to say? My dear Miss Elizabeth, you must allow me to tell you how... Ardently, I admire and love you. My astonishment is beyond expression, sir. I had rather imagined that it would come as a complete surprise, but I trust that the distress caused by my declaration of affection will be outweighed by the pleasant prospects of a life together. Oh, you insufferable man. I beg your pardon. Listen to you. How can you always be so sure of Darcy, so superior... So convinced in the pride of yourself that you cannot see Darcy except as a prize for which any girl should be properly thankful. Miss Elizabeth, I did not say that. There was no need. Your manner was enough, sir. It is customary, I believe, at such times as these for the young lady to express certain sentiments of gratitude for the honor offered. But I cannot. I have never desired your good opinion, and you certainly have bestowed it most unwillingly. And this is all the reply which I am to have the honor of expecting? You impossible man. You choose to tell me that you like me, but protest that your affections are against your better feelings, and yet you wonder why you were rejected. But even so, had you not prejudiced my own feelings against you, I could not be tempted to accept the man who has behaved in such a manner towards my sister Jane and towards young Mr. Wickham. Wickham got exactly what he deserved. He claims to the contrary, that he did not get that which your father assigned to him in the will. Wickham did not carry out the requirements stated in that will. Mr. Wickham does not explain it that way. I cannot concern myself with Mr. Wickham's explanations. Miss Bennet, in, in every instance, I have been completely honest with you. But because I did not choose lies and flattery and spoke honestly, you became furious. Mr. Darcy... Let us understand each other. I did not refuse you because of your manner of speaking. From the very first time we met, you have impressed me with your arrogance, your conceit and your selfish disdain of the feelings of others. You could not have made me an offer of your hand in any possible way that would have tempted me to accept it. I had not known you an evening before I felt that you were the last man in the world whom I could be prevailed upon to marry. You have said quite enough. You have made yourself perfectly clear... Forgive me for having taken up so much of your time. I shall return first thing in the morning to London, where I shall stay out the season. Forgive me if my presence has interfered with your visit with your aunt and her plans for your marriage to Miss Anne. My intention is to leave in the morning for Hertfordshire. <laughs> Truly, Elizabeth, I do not understand you. Home for only three weeks, and now you're packing to be off again. Hand me my bandbox like a good sister, will you? Here you are. Thank you. Well, they say that travel provides new interests, and if Uncle and Aunt Gardner are kind enough to invite me to travel with them through Derbyshire, I shall be most happy to go along. 
But it will be so dull here without you. Well, then why, why don't you persuade Papa to let you go with Lydia to Brighton when she visits Colonel Foster and his lady? Mm, that would please Lydia, I dare say. But I have no desire to be left sitting with Mrs. Forster for hours on end <laughs> while Lydia devotes all her time to Wickham. Dear Lydia, mm, I hope she doesn't become too fond of Mr. Wickham. Why do you say that? Do you know something about him? Well, not exactly. It's, it's just that I have a feeling that we should know something more about him. Oh, but enough of worry. If you'll be so good as to help me with this portmanteau, I can finish my packing. Truly, Elizabeth, the way you've taken to running about in such a restless fashion, a person would almost think that you were in love. Driver! A driver! Oh, will you stop here a moment, please? Surely this is not your estate, Uncle. No, my dear. But uh, would you not like to see the inside of this place of which you have heard so much? And have I heard so much of this? This, my dear, is Pemberley. Pemberley? But that is where... It is the family home of Mr. Darcy. A driver! We'll go inside. Oh, uh, oh, but truly, I've become tired of great houses. We've seen so many. I have no pleasure in I seeing... I inquired a... last evening at the Lampton Inn... And I was assured that the owner of Pemberley is away, and the house is open to visitors. And now, if you would like to step this way, please, I'll show you the old master's bedroom. Oh, by all means. Come along, ladies. I told you it was a most admirable house, Elizabeth. Wouldn't you like to be the mistress here? It would depend on the master. Now, this room here belonged to Mr. Darcy's father. And a fine, generous man he was. It is much to your credit to speak so well of your master. Oh, thank you, ma'am. But I say no more than the truth. And as for his son, the young Mr. Darcy, what a sweet-natured man he is. You'll forgive me for saying so... But it was my understanding that uh, young Mr. Darcy was very, very proud, shall we say? <laughs> there are those who say so. But I think they do not know his true character. I have known him since he was four years old, and I have never had a cross word from him in my life. Well spoken, madam. You are a most admirable servant. Thank you, sir. And now, if you'll follow me through this door, we will come to the private terrace. Ah, now, that is something that interests me. Come along, Elizabeth. Coming on. Oh, Mrs. Bennet will die of envy when she hears of this visit. Miss Elizabeth. What? Mr. Darcy? Yes. But I, I did not expect to find you here. At the inn, they said that you were in London. And so I was, but I came back a day early. I did not mean to come upon you in this unmannerly fashion. I fear Mrs. Reynolds would have been quite embarrassed if she had known you were listening. Mrs. Reynolds is a dear soul. Yes, she speaks quite well of you. Oh, you sound surprised. Is there any reason why I should not be spoken of well? By your own servants? Not at all. I assume you pay them wages. Miss Elizabeth, I pray you, do not let us go on in this fashion. There are many things which I must say to you. May I call on you tomorrow at the Lambton Inn? I truly don't think you should, Mr. Darcy. But I will be at the inn at tea time. And that night at Lady Catherine's, I could not answer your accusations because I was not then master enough of myself to know what could or ought to be revealed. Do you understand? Pray continue, sir. In connection with Mr. Wickham, I can only explain by telling the truth, which I have preferred to conceal. Concealment of the truth is hardly a mark of honesty. Oh, please hear me out. My father's will stated that Wickham would receive a comfortable living if he joined the clergy. However, Mr. Wickham had no desire to enter the church. So we agreed that instead of the clergyman's living, I would give him 3,000 pounds which I paid into his hand. 
And in turn, he released me from the provisions of my father's will. Well, that seems like a most reasonable contract. Yet it does not explain Mr. Wickham's bitterness. There must have been something more. Indeed, there is. Wickham attempted a secret marriage with my sister. A girl of 15. Oh. Unfortunately, I found out in time. Had he succeeded, he would have come into her fortune of 30,000 pounds. Now, perhaps you can understand Mr. Wickham's bitterness. Mr. Darcy, you will understand it if I tell you that your statements are confusing to my heart and to my mind. I fear that I have been most unjust. Then you do believe me, Miss Elizabeth? I would like very much to believe you, Mr. Darcy. You're coming here today. Your sincerity of manner when you related these obviously painful stories would not allow me to come to any other conclusion. You are most kind. You will excuse me, sir, but there is someone at the door. A letter for Miss Bennett. It's marked urgent, miss. Thank you very much. It's a note for my father. Would you excuse me if I read it now? Oh, please do, dear lady. I am writing to inform you that a tragedy has befallen our family. And none of us were more surprised than you will be when I tell you that Lydia has run off with Mr. Wickham. Oh, oh no. Insofar as we know, they are in an unmarried state and they are journeying in the direction of London... I would appreciate your returning at once for all this confusion here, and I must leave for London immediately. Oh, dear. Is that you come home, Elizabeth? Yes, Mama. Oh, Elizabeth, you cannot know what I've been through. Oh, dear Mama, you must be calm and patient. All we can do is hope and pray for good news tomorrow. That's what Jane said yesterday. To think that I should be burdened with undutiful children. Mama, you must gain control of your emotions. Good news may come in the next post. I saw what came in the last post. A letter from that awful Mr. Collins. Read it for yourself, Elizabeth. I feel called upon to condole with you on the grievous affliction you are now suffering under. The death of your daughter would have been a blessing in comparison. And I am joined in this thought, not only by Mrs. Collins, but by Lady Catherine and her daughter, to whom I have related the affair. It is most unfortunate, for, as Lady Catherine condescendingly said, who will connect themselves with such a family? Why, that appalling man. Mr. Collins speaks the truth. Who will ever marry you, Elizabeth? Or Jane, now that Lydia has disgraced our family? Please, Mama. I'm sure that I would not want to marry a man whose pride was so weak that it could not withstand the consequences of Lydia's caprice. Meanwhile, we must be brave and wait for the news from Papa in London. London, August 10. I am sorry to report that the events here are for no encouragement. Lydia and Wickham seem to have vanished into thin air. If I do not find them within the week, I shall return home reconciled to the thought that I have done my best and failed. Oh, dear. If Mr. Bennett ever finds Wickham, I'm sure they will fight a duel. Mr. Bennett will be killed, and then that awful Mr. Collins will come and turn us out of our very house. My dearest wife and family, put your worries at an end. The dear and Wickham have been found. They will be married this very day, and God willing, they should arrive home shortly after this letter reaches your hand. I'm home. Lydia, my baby. And Mr. Wickham, too. How do you do, Mother? Oh. And dear Jane. And dear Elizabeth. Come close and look at me. Well, how do you like your married sister? Married? 
Oh, congratulations, Lydia. I, I'm sure that you and Mr. Wickham will prove worthy of each other. Oh, truly, you look very happy, Lydia. It's so good to be home with my own little family. And now that I'm married, I'm going to try ever so hard to find you both husbands. Well, that, that's very kind of you, Lydia, but I prefer my own methods. La, have it your own way. But as much as I would like to stay and chaperone you and Jane, I cannot. For Wickham and I are going away. What? My little girl going away again? Yes. Wickham must be off to join a new regiment in the north. Oh, dear. How sad. To the country, Mama. How wonderful. We thought Wickham would hardly ever be able to get another post at all, what with all the gambling debts that had to be paid before we could leave London. Is this so, Mr. Wickham? As it happens, yes. I never dreamed in all my life there could be so many debts. But fortunately, we were rescued. Hmm. Poor Papa. I do hope you appreciated all that he did for you, Lydia. Oh, but it wasn't Papa who rescued us. It was Mr. Darcy. What did you say? Didn't Papa write you? Every cent of Mr. Wickham's debts were paid off by Mr. Darcy. Oh, Elizabeth. This whole house has become as melancholy as the music you're playing. Sometimes I wish Lydia were back among us. Oh, Papa... I rather imagine you do, Miss Lydia. No, no, not really. Or am I too sympathetic to Jane? She is most unhappy, Father. Jane's been crossed in love, but I congratulate her. Next to being married, a girl should like to be crossed in love a little now and then. Something to think of. Gives a sort of distinction among her companions. I hope your turn will come soon. If it has not come already. Ah, at any rate, it's very gloomy here. Lizzie! Lizzie, are you there? I'm right here, Mother. Oh, well, thank goodness for that. We have a very distinguished guest. Oh, no, not another one. It's Lady Catherine de Burr. Lady Catherine? Here? Of course, here, in the garden. But but why should she be calling on us? She wants to see you, Elizabeth. I can't understand why, but she's insisted on seeing you alone in the garden. Well, hurry now. Don't keep Lady Catherine waiting. To what do I owe the honor of your presence here? Miss Bennett, a report of a most alarming nature reached me several days ago. I was told that not only was your sister Jane on the point of being most advantageously married to Mr. Bingley, but that you, Miss Elizabeth, would in all likelihood be united to my nephew, Mr. Darcy. I am astonished at this, Lady Catherine. Why, the gentlemen of whom you speak, are they not even in the neighborhood? If not, they will be shortly, but that is hardly the issue. Do you not know that such a report is spread abroad? I never heard that it was. And can you likewise declare that there is no foundation for it? I do not pretend to possess equal frankness with your ladyship. You may ask questions which I shall not choose to answer. I insist on being satisfied. Has my nephew made you an offer of marriage? Such behavior as yours will never induce me to be explicit. Let me be rightly understood. This match can never take place. Mr. Darcy is engaged to my daughter. Now, what have you to say? Only this, that if he is so, you can have no reason to suppose that he will make an offer to me. Miss Bennet, I am not in the habit of brooking disappointment. That will make your ladyship's situation at present more pitiable. But it will have no effect on me. My daughter and nephew are formed for each other. They are descended on the maternal side from the same noble line, and on the father's from respectable, honorable, and ancient, though untitled, families. Mr. Darcy is a gentleman. I am a gentleman's daughter. So far, we are equal. Tell me, once and for all, are you engaged to him? No. No, I'm not. Oh, and... Will you promise me never to enter into such an engagement? I will promise only to act in that manner, which will, in my own opinion, constitute my happiness, without reference to you or to any person so wholly unconnected with me. Then you are determined to ruin Mr. Darcy in the opinion of all his friends. You have insulted me in every possible method, Lady Catherine. I must beg to return to the house. Oh, obstinate, headstrong girl. Well, and so Mr. Bingley is coming down again. Not that I care, though. He's nothing to us, you know. 
However, he's very welcome to come to Netherfield if he likes it. No, 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 Mrs. Bennett. You forced me into visiting Mr. Bingley last year. You promised if I went to see him, he'd marry one of my daughters. It ended in nothing. I'll not be sent on a fool's errand again. Dear Mrs. Bennett, the kind invitation your husband is most usually welcome, I... I had an overwhelming desire to visit your house again. An ambition which I must confess to Sherry. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bingley, you are a dear man. But it really was very naughty of you to stay away so long. I do hope that you and your family will forgive me. Oh, all of you must forgive Mr. Bingley. He was held in London by forces over which he had no control. It is enough that he's been returned to us by these same forces. I am most happy to have Mr. Bingley back with us again. Dearest Jane. There have been so many changes, Mr. Bingley. My daughter Lydia made a delightful match with Mr. Wickham. Oh. A charming young man. They've gone to the north. I, uh, I take it then, Mrs. Bennet, that uh, you prefer your daughter's husbands to uh, locate near at hand. But of course. I don't know what my girls would do without me if they were far away. Poor Lydia. Uh, how, how would you feel about the distance, uh, let us say, from here to Netherfield, Mrs. Bennet? Bingley, what are you trying to say? Elizabeth, Mr. Darcy. While Mr. Bingley is discovering yes, what Bingley. he is trying to say, yes. would it not be best if you and I inspected the garden? Dear Mr. Darcy, what a romantic notion. I am so very happy to see Jane and Mr. Bingley together again, Mr. Darcy. They are truly in love. Yes. I have known from the moment when you first told me at Hunsford. And so, knowing I was wrong, I went to Bingley and confessed that I had interfered. You told Mr. Bingley that you had kept him from Jane? I held nothing back. I told him all. Knowing your nature, it must have been very difficult for you. Apologies are never easy. But, Miss Elizabeth, there are others as well who have waited long for happiness only to fail because of their faults. Uh, tell me truly, are your feelings still what they were when I spoke to you at Hunsford? I would feel more sure of my answer if I had some assurance on your part that you were truly sympathetic. Then let me say that I love you and wish to marry you. Oh, then believe me, sir, when I tell you that my sentiments are very much changed in your favor since that night I cast you off. Oh, Miss Elizabeth, can you say this after my unpardonably conceited and prideful behavior? How can I find fault with you when it was I who opposed your pride with blind prejudice? No, I came to you proud, defiant, without a doubt of my reception. I, I was sure that you would take me as I had been sure that any other woman would have had me. But you showed me how insufficient I was to please a woman worthy of being pleased. Elizabeth. Dearest Darcy, the time has come to put the past behind us. Now let us look to the future and think only of the past as its remembrance gives us pleasure. <laughs> I've been listening to Pride and Prejudice, an NBC University Theater production of the Jane Austen novel starring Angela Lansbury as Elizabeth Bennett. Next week, at the same time, we will bring you another classic of Anglo-American literature, The Heart of Midlothian by Sir Walter Scott. The present semester of the NBC University Theater is devoted to the classics of Anglo-American literature from the time of Henry Fielding to that of Henry James. If you wish, you may learn more about these authors and their works by enrolling in the college-supervised courses now being offered in connection with the NBC University Theater. The University of Tulsa in Oklahoma, Kansas State Teachers College in Kansas, and Washington State College in the West have now completed their plans for offering such a course in the coming months, thus joining the University of Louisville, whose established home study plan is already serving listeners in another area of the nation. For information, then, as to how you may enhance your knowledge through these courses, 
Write to the NBC University Theater in care of the University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, Washington State College, Pullman, Washington, Kansas State Teachers College at Pittsburgh, Kansas, or the University of Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Pride and Prejudice was adapted for radio by Richard E. Davis. Our intermission commentator was the distinguished novelist I.A.R. Wiley. The intriguing Miss Elizabeth Bennett was portrayed by Angela Lansbury, who appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture The Sun Comes Up, starring Jeanette MacDonald, Lloyd Nolan, Claude Jarman Jr., and Lassie. Our cast included Norma Varden, Leslie Dennison, Constance Cavendish, Tom McKee, Ben Wright... Naomi Stevens, Evan Thomas, Philip Friend, Gray Stafford, Alma Lawton, Gloria Ann Simpson, Ina Ronsley. Your announcer, Don Stanley. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Dr. Albert Harris. The director of the University Theater is Andrew C. Love. Next week, be with us again for the NBC University Theater version of the Walter Scott novel, The Heart of Midlothian, starring Maureen O'Sullivan. <laughs> NBC University Theater has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Miss Elizabeth Bennett, a play from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice by A. A. Milne, newly adapted for radio by Peggy Wells. Miss Elizabeth Bennett. Man of good fortune. Oh, 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 o
Yeah, they say. Oh, what a fine thing for our girls to spend it. As soon as he sees them, he will fall in love with one of them. And therefore, you must visit him as soon as possible. Why should I visit him? A man so eager to fall in love must not waste his time asking me what I think of the weather. Oh, Mr. Bennett. No, no, you and the girls may go, or you may send them by themselves. Indeed, you must go, Mr. Bennett. Would it be impossible for us to visit him if you do not? You are over-scrupulous, my dear. Mr. Bingley will be very glad to see you, and I will send a letter by you to assure him of my hearty consent to his marrying whichever he likes of the girls. Oh, very well, then, if you're determined to neglect your daughters, I shall not say another word. How you can want to see Charlotte Lucas queening it at Netherfield Park is more than I can understand. Sir William and Lady Lucas are determined to go, merely on that account. And Charlotte, not a day less than 27, and not half as handsome as Jane, to say nothing of the others. Mary. Sir? You shall tell us. You are a young lady of deep reflection and read great books and make extracts. Would Miss Lucas be a suitable wife for a lively young man of little intelligence but with an amiable desire to please? Well, uh... Oh, no matter. I have decided that he shall have Jane. He'll never even see Jane since we are not to visit. He shall marry her by proxy. How do you know, sir, that he has an amiable desire to please? All lively young men of little intelligence desire to please, Lizzie. Uh, it is perhaps generous in me to describe as amiable what is but a form of vanity. Vanity takes many forms. That, Mary, is exactly what it takes. Uh, but, sir... Yes, Lizzie. Uh, not all young men are lively, nor of little intelligence. Nor all young women as quick as Elizabeth. Oh, but my word, I don't know what you're all talking about. When did you call on Mr. Bingley, sir, this morning? What's that? Your father visited at Netherfield Park. But he said he would do no such thing. Yes, Mama. But because he had done it. My dear Mr. Bennett, oh, do you hear that, girls? Your father has called at Netherfield. Oh, how good it was of you, my dear Mr. Bennett. But I knew I should persuade you at last. I was sure you loved your girls too well to neglect such an acquaintance for them. Did you like him, sir? Which, Jane? Which? Oh, Mr. Bingley, to be sure. I thought perhaps you meant Mr. Darcy. What? Is there another man at Netherfield Park? Oh. A friend of Mr. Bingley, sir? More than that, is he? Guide, philosopher, and friend. But mostly guide. Darcy says this, Darcy says that. So does Mr. Bingley. Did you see him? Is he gentlemanlike? Mr. Darcy has 10,000 oh. a year. One could hardly be more gentlemanlike than that. 10,000? <laughs> Young, handsome. He has an estate, of course. 10,000 a year. Oh, he has an estate somewhere. You may be sure. My dear. Himself. We must restrain ourselves. While it is now definitely settled that Bingley is to be one of my sons-in-law, I am sorry to say that we cannot count on Mr. Darcy as another. Oh. However, with Bingley and the sprinkling of officers, I shall do quite well. We must be careful what further commitments we make, or we shall become uh, congested. Besides, I'm expecting an addition to our family party. An addition? A gentleman, at least, I hope so, and a stranger. Has he a name, sir, or does he travel anonymously? He has a name, Lizzie, but your mother has asked me so repeatedly not to mention it in her hearing that I forbore to do so. Not that odious man coming to stay. That one. Who is he, ma'am? It's your cousin, Mr. Collins, to whom the estate is entailed, who, as soon as your father is dead, can turn us all out of this house just whenever he pleases. Let us look on the bright side, my dear. Let us flatter ourselves that I may survive you all. I think it's cruel to settle in the state away from a family of daughters in favour of a man whom nobody cares anything about. It is certainly a most iniquitous affair, and nothing can clear Mr. Collins of the guilt of inheriting Longbourn. However, as a clergyman, he is now sorry for it and has written to tell me so. Oh, a clergyman? Then he cannot ever be an officer. I must say I like an officer better than a clergyman. Does he say anything about the entail? He apologises for it and proposes to make amends. Oh. Why does he apologize? It is not his fault, and we cannot suppose he would help it if he could. Probably he will ask for one of the girls. That's what he means by making amends, you may be sure. That is what I meant by warning you against congestion. We have only Elizabeth free. <laughs> free to make my own choice, sir. Yes, that's right, my dear. We must be sensible about it. A clergyman is only a clergyman after all, and if this Mr. Darcy has 10,000 a year, you, you did say 10,000, Mr. Bennett. What I forgot to say is that Mr. Darcy is apparently earmarked for Miss Bingley, oh? which makes the extent of his fortune of less importance to us. Miss Bingley, indeed. Bingley has a sister? It was so arranged before I had any say in the matter. I only called upon him yesterday. Yesterday? You called yesterday? Oh, then he may return the call here today. 
you maybe oh. hear the news at moment? Oh, my dear, I think you should knock and hear when he returns the call. It would have a forward appearance, but... Well, I, I, I think, Jane, if you stayed, that would be natural. My eldest daughter... I think we should all go, Ma'am. It would have a worse appearance if one were to seem to have singled herself out for Mr. Bingley. Dear Jane, as if any man could think that of you. Or think it the less if you were surrounded by sisters whom he had forgotten as soon as he set eyes on you. I'm sure I have no wish to see him. He is not an officer, and I think very little of a man who is not an officer, I assure you. I must say, I think an officer in his coat looks uncommonly handsome. Did I tell you, ma'am, that the new officer is named Wicker? Oh, how very nice. Yes. Yes. Kitty and Lydia must be two of the silliest girls in the country. I have suspected it some time, but I am now convinced. Oh, well, you must not expect such girls to have the sense of their father and mother. When they get to our age, I dare say they will not think about officers any more than we do. I assure you, my dear, that even before I reached my present age, I was never one for officers. Uh, give me your attention a moment, Mr. Bennett. Uh, would you not say that the table would have a better appearance to the left? What? Yes. Yes, I'm right. It has a quality to the left there. Uh, Pray help me to move it, Mr. Bennett. For whom do we refurnish? Mr. Collins? Well, surely tomorrow would be soon enough. He's not due for two weeks. Oh, for Mr. Bingley, to be sure. He may be upon us at any moment. You are exciting yourself unnecessarily, my dear. He will not be upon us until you give him the invitation. He lacks sense, but his manners are good. My dear Mr. Bennett, permit me to know the correct conduct of a young man newly arrived in the neighbourhood. As soon as he has returned your visit, I shall ask him to dinner, and he will then be able to dance with the girls at the next assembly ball. But it's plain that he must return your visit first. Oh, well, credit me with some knowledge of good manners, I beg you. Your knowledge is only lacking in one particular. What's that? Mr. Bingley returned my visit this morning. Oh, I must have you dance. I hate to see you standing about by yourself in this stupid manner. <laughs> you had much better dance than hide in this alcove. I shall not dance, Bingley. You know how I detest it, unless I'm particularly acquainted with my partner. Oh. At such an assembly as this, it would be insupportable. Your sister is engaged, and there is not another woman in the ballroom I could bear to stand up with. Well, Darcy, I, I, I would not be as fastidious as you for a kingdom. Upon my honour, I never met with so many pleasant girls in my life. And most of them uncommonly pretty. You are dancing with the only handsome girl in the room, Charles. Ah, that's the most profound thing you have ever said in your life. Is she not a beautiful creature? Her eyes, her hair, her expression, her smile. Oh, but I must have you dance. Indeed, it was Miss Jane Bennett herself who sent me to persuade you. You had much better go back to her and enjoy her smiles. You are wasting your time with me as you would not be with her. Well, that's true. <laughs> oh, but now look. There is one of her sisters sitting on the sofa just around the corner, who is very pretty. And when I dined with them, seemed very agreeable. Do let me introduce you. Which do you mean? There. Ah, oh, yes. I have seen her. She is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me. And I am in no humor for young ladies who are slighted by other men. Slighted? Left over after they have chosen. Oh, and it's your own way. You are an unaccommodating dog. Or would be if I were not too polite to say so. Thank heaven I can enjoy myself in any company. I thank heaven. <laughs> Allow me to introduce myself, Sir William Lucas of Lucas Lodge. You may have heard of me at St. James's. Mm. What a charming amusement for young people this is, Mr. Darcy. There's nothing like dancing, after all. I consider it as one of the first refinements of polished society. Uh, do you not agree with me? Certainly, sir. It has the advantage also of being in vogue among the less polished societies. Uh -huh. Every savage can dance and would agree with you that there is nothing like it. Mm. Very true, sir. Very true. Oh, my dear Miss Eliza, why are you not dancing? Because I do not wish to, sir. Nonsense, nonsense. Come along. Mr. Darcy, you must allow me to present to you this young lady. Miss Elizabeth Bennett has a very desirable partner. You cannot refuse to dance, I'm sure, when so much beauty is before you. 
Overwhelmed, as he obviously is, by my beauty, Mr. Darcy may find it difficult to refuse, but fortunately I have nothing to overwhelm me. Indeed, Sir William, I have not the least intention of dancing. May I beg to be allowed the honour of your hand? No, Mr. Darcy, you may not be. Let the refusal seem to come from yourself rather than from me, and your pride will be saved. As you please. Come, Miss Eliza, you excel so much in the dance that it is cruel to deny me the happiness of seeing you. And though this gentleman dislikes the amusement in general, he can have no objection, I'm sure, to oblige us for one half hour. Uh, Mr. Darcy, sir, is like me, in that we only care about dancing with our friends. Indeed, we go so far sometimes as to refuse to meet a stranger until we are already acquainted with him. Uh, if you never meet a stranger until you become acquainted with him... Uh, do you become acquainted with it? That is a secret known only to Mr. Darcy and myself. He has my permission to reveal it to you. Your servant, sir. <laughs> Charming young lady. A great friend of my daughter Charlotte's. Very high-spirited, you not think, Mr. Darcy? Mm, just so. Ah, here is Miss Bingley approaching. A delightful young lady who has the honour of your friendship. Indeed, if rumour speaks true of something more than friendship. Believe me, Sir William, a rumour says anything which comes into its head. Ah. <laughs> well, you'll forgive me if I leave you. I promised my wife to make up a four quadrille. By all means. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, subject to your memory, Mr. Darcy. I should imagine not, Miss Bingley. You are considering how insupportable it would be to pass many evenings in this manner. Such society. Oh, I hardly agree with you. I was never more annoyed. The insipidity and yet the noise, the nothingness and yet the self-importance of all these people. Oh, what would I give to hear your strictures on them? You are wrong. My mind was much more agreeably engaged. I have been meditating on the very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes in the face of a pretty woman can bestow. Dare I guess the name of the lady who has inspired such reflection? I am sure you dare, but I am equally sure your guess would be a strange. And you shall tell me. Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Miss Elizabeth Bennet, indeed. How long has she been such a favourite? And when, pray, am I to wish you joy? I knew you would be wishing me joy. There is nothing travels so quick as a lady's imagination. Have you met your future mother-in-law yet? Future mother-in-law? Mrs. Bennet, a charming woman. Such tact, such quality, such good manners. Amongst so many future mothers-in-law, I shall not notice her. They have an aunt at Meryton, positively married to an attorney, and an uncle in trade. Oh, tell me you are not serious. Serious? In what? In admiring Miss Elizabeth Bennet's eyes. That is all I engage myself to do. It is you who would make other engagements for me. Oh, I was only teasing you. You know what is due to your position. I hope I shall always be sensible of that. It is not myself, but your brother, whom you have need to be anxious. Charles? Oh, you mean Jane Bennett. That means nothing. You are the last person who should say so. He admires her eyes, her hair, her expression, and her smile. He is almost married to her already. You will not allow it. Oh, promise If me. Charles comes to me for my advice, you know what it will be. And I can promise you to give it to him. But we are a long way from that yet. You overrate the easiness of falling in love. He has as little real feeling for her as she for him. Or is you for Miss Eliza, or she for you? Miss Elizabeth Bennet has every reason to dislike me, and I have no reason to be anything but indifferent to her dislike. <sighs> Yet I still think that she has fine eyes, Miss Bingley. Mr. Bingley is just what a young man ought to be, Lizzie. Sensible, good-humoured, lively. And I never saw such happy manners. So much ease with such perfect good breeding. Well, he certainly is very agreeable, and I give you leave to like him. You have liked many a stupid a person. Oh, dear me. Oh, Jane, you are a great deal too apt to like people. You never see a fault in anybody. I never heard you speak ill of a human being in my life. I would wish not to be hasty in censuring anyone, but I always speak what I think. I know you do, and it is that which makes me wonder, with your good sense to be so honestly blind to the nonsense of others. And so you like Miss Bingley, too? She's very pleasing when you converse with her. And I think we shall find her a charming neighbour. Mm. You will, Jane. She tells me that Mr. Darcy never speaks much unless among his intimate acquaintance. With them, he is remarkably agreeable. It seems, then, that we shall never know how remarkably agreeable Mr. Darcy is. He is proud, to be sure. But one cannot wonder that so very fine a young man 
with family, fortune, everything in his favor, should think highly of himself. I could easily forgive his pride if he had not mortified mine. It was remiss in him to have said what he did of my Lizzie, and foolish in him to think it. But he did not know you were sitting so close. He knew I was there, but did not know I had two ears. He did not mean it to be heard, I'm sure. He is much too gentlemanlike. Then that at least was unkind in him. For you have now made it clear that even to be tolerable to Mr. Darcy is a compliment of which he should have allowed me the benefit. Lizzie, hmm? you will not show Mr. Darcy that you do not think well of him. Dear Jane, he would not believe it possible if I did show him. <laughs> Beautifully, Miss Elizabeth. I was just about to say the same of you, Mr. Wickham, but it is too late now. You will never believe that I was not paying you a return for your own compliment. Tell me, how long has Mr. Darcy been in the neighbourhood? Darcy has come with Mr. Bingley, who has but just taken Netherfield. He is said to be a man of large property in Derbyshire. Pemberley, yes. Oh, you know Mr. Darcy. To my sorrow, alas. But how strange. He is a friend of yours. I would not say anything against a friend of yours. I have spoken 20 words with him. We were as rude to each other as if we'd been the oldest of friends. I must not put you against him. His father was one of the best men that ever breathed. That leaves me neither for nor against the son. Let's talk of something else. The subject is inexpressibly painful to uh, me. No, no, Mr. Wickham. You have chosen the subject, and in duty both to yourself and to him, you must go on with it. Even if my sense of justice allowed otherwise, my curiosity would protest. It keeps wondering... What connection there can be between a landowner in Derbyshire and an officer in Hertfordshire? And how Mr. Darcy's villainy can possibly exceed that which he's already shown by finding me not beautiful enough to dance with? But the connection is easily explained. Uh, my father had the care of the Pemberley estate. Old Mr. Darcy was my godfather and brought me up as his own son. He intended me for the church and when he died, bequeathed me the next presentation of the best living in his gift. I can never do justice to his kindness. He meant to provide for me amply. He always told me that he should, and he thought that he had done so. Oh, forgive me burdening you with all this, but your sympathy means so much to me. But I don't understand what has happened. How could the will be disregarded? Why are you not... There was just that informality in the terms of the bequest. Informality? But if the intention was clear... No man of honour could have doubted the intention. You mean that Mr. Darcy did doubt it? He chose to. But on what ground? It seems monstrous. I can only suppose from jealousy... It was his father's attachment to me that worked on him. He had not the temper to bear the sort of competition in which we stood, the sort of preference which was so often given me. But to treat you like that, to disregard his father's dying wishes, he deserves to be publicly disgraced. Some day he will be, but it shall not be by me. Till I can forget his father, I can never expose him. Oh. And now let us talk of your beautiful dancing. Indeed, dear, you dance and fancy. I do not disturb you, sir. You must consider yourself quite at liberty to come and go as you please in this house, Mr. Collins. If you have not yet presented your humble respects to your patroness, Lady Catherine, and would wish to indict a letter... That is very kind of you, sir. Very considerate and obliging. But I've already given myself the pleasure thrice since my arrival under your hospitable roof. Lady Catherine is condescending enough to take an interest even in the humblest of mankind. That is extremely handsome of her. She has even condescended to advise me to marry as soon as possible. Ah. Has she chosen the lady who is to be so honoured, or does she leave you a certain discretion in the matter? In her gracious way, she said that, provided she approves the choice, I may marry whomsoever I please. Nothing could be more gracious than that. Uh, no, indeed, indeed. Um, my dear sir, hmm? there is a serious matter upon which I must consult you. Indeed, it was for that purpose that I sought you out this morning. No doubt Mrs. Bennet has informed you of my object of carrying out my patroness's instructions to marry. And by choosing one of your daughters to make amends for the injustice which I seem to be doing them by inheriting Longbourn. Well, well, very handsome of you. Had her ladyship fixed upon any particular daughter, or was the matter left open? Uh, naturally, it was felt that the rights of Miss Jane as the eldest should be respected. Indeed, you can hardly have failed to notice the marked attentions which I've been paying her these last two days. In the press of other matters, I had failed to notice it. It did not, however, escape the notice of Mrs. Bennet, 
who mentioned in the kindest, most delicate way that her eldest daughter was likely to be soon engaged to a Mr. Bingley. Mm. It is in these circumstances, sir, that I'm hoping for your interest with your fair daughter, Elizabeth, when I solicit for the honour of a private audience with her in the course of the day. Ah. Your mind is made up on this matter. I conceive it to be a duty both... To... I mean on this question of a private audience. You would not allow me to be unobtrusively present in a corner somewhere with my back to you? Uh, well, I... No, I suppose not. Pity. Well... Oh, my dear, Mr. Collins, Lizzie and I were wondering where you were. As always, my dear, you arrive on the moment. Mr. Collins has something, has I suspect, much to say to Elizabeth. To Elizabeth? Oh, my dear Mr. Collins. Yes, certainly, my dear Mr. Collins. I'm sure Lizzie will be very happy, won't you, my dear? Uh, well, uh, uh, come, Mr. Bennett. I want you to give me your advice on the hanging of a mirror in the hall. It has been on my mind these two days. Uh, dear ma'am, uh, sir, do not go. I, I beg you, will not go. Mr. Collins can have nothing to say to me that anybody may not hear. Have no fear, Lizzie. I shall insist on hearing afterwards just what he did say. But the question of this mirror which has been on your mother's mind these two days... Yeah, Lizzie, her. I insist upon your staying and hearing Mr. Collins. As you will, ma'am. That's a good girl. And come, Mr. Bennett. Yes, now, my dear. I think... Don't miss Pray be seated, Miss Elizabeth. Uh, thank you, sir. I prefer to stand. I should feel more comfortable if you were seated. And I... Less. Uh, please say what you have to say. Very well. <clears throat> Miss Elizabeth, my attentions to you these last two days have been too marked to be mistaken. Indeed, as soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. But I... My reasons for marrying are, first, that I think it the right thing for every clergyman to set the example of matrimony in his parish. Secondly, I am convinced it will add greatly to my happiness. And thirdly, that it is the recommendation of the very noble lady whom I have the honour of calling patroness. Let me remark parenthetically that the notice and kindness of Lady Catherine de Berg are not the least of the advantages it is in my power to offer. But, Mr. Collins... Wait, please. I beg your pardon, sir. I thought you had finished. So much for my general intention in favour of matrimony. It remains to be told why my views were directed towards this house of Longbourn. The fact is that being to inherit this estate after the death of your honoured father, I resolved to choose a wife from among his daughters, that the loss to them might be as little possible when the melancholy event takes place. Uh, yeah. And now, nothing remains but to assure you, in the most animated language, of the violence of my affections. To fortune, I'm indifferent, and shall make no demand of that nature on your father, since I'm well aware that one thousand pounds in the four percent, which will not be yours till after your mother's decease, is all that you ever may be entitled to. However long delayed your small inheritance may be, no ungenerous reproach shall pass my lips after we are married. You are a little hasty, sir. You assume an answer which you have not yet allowed me to give. Let me give it without further loss of time. Accept my thanks for the compliment you pay me. Uh, believe that I am very sensible of the honour of your proposals. But understand that it is impossible for me to do otherwise than decline them. <laughs> believe me, my dear Miss Elizabeth. Your modesty, so far from doing you any disservice, rather adds to your other perfections. This is not modesty, sir. It is, as I prefer to think, common sense. I am perfectly serious in my refusal. You could not make me happy, and I'm convinced that I'm the last woman in the world who could make you so. Uh, nay, were your friend Lady Catherine to know me, I am persuaded that she would find me in every respect ill-qualified for the situation. I thank you for your offer, which now leaves you free to take possession of Longbourn whenever it falls, without any self-reproach. In return, I wish you very, very happy, and by refusing your hand, do all in my power to prevent your being otherwise. The matter may be considered, therefore, as finally settled. Um, my dear cousin, since my hand does not appear to me unworthy of your acceptance, I can only attribute your rejection of it to your desire to increase my love by suspense, according to the usual practice of elegant females. Oh, really, I do not know whether to laugh or to cry at you, for we seem to have no words with which to communicate with each other. If my no means yes, then what means no? I shall send my father to you. He shall speak for me. At least you will not mistake his behaviour for the affectation and coquetry of an elegant female. Oh, oh excuse me, Oh, what's this? What's this? Oh, can I believe my eyes? The way this it flung past me and, and you standing there alone, Mr. Collins? Has Elizabeth dared to refuse you? My dear madam, there is no reason for alarm. 
It is only such a refusal as must naturally flow from her bashful modesty and delicacy of character. Mm, bashful acceptance could flow just as easily. And if it comes to that, I'm not sure that Lizzie is so bashful. And a big Jane or Mary now. But depend upon it, Mr. Collins, she should be brought to reason. She's a very headstrong, foolish girl and doesn't know her own interest. But I will make her know it. Uh, pardon me for interrupting, madam. But if she is really headstrong and foolish, she would not be a very desirable wife for a man in my situation oh, but... who seeks for happiness from the marriage state. Liable to such defects of temper, she could not contribute much to my felicity. Oh, sir, you quite misunderstand me. Lizzie is only headstrong in such matters as these. In everything else, she is a model of good nature. Indeed, it's well known in the neighborhood how good to... Now, here she is with her father. Oh, Mr. Bennett, you're wanted immediately. We're all in an uproar. Lizzie vows she will not have Mr. Collins, and Mr. Collins vows that if she will not, then he will change his mind and not have her. In that case, who wants me? Well, of course, you must speak to Lizzie. Tell her that you insist on her marrying him. Doubtless, sir, you will wish to give a father's counsel and reproof to Miss Elizabeth in private. I will take my leave. Very well. Well, Lizzie, I understand that Mr. Collins has made you an offer of marriage. Is this true? Yes, sir. Very well. And this offer of marriage you have refused? Yes, sir. We now come to the point. Your mother insists upon your accepting it. Is it not so, Mrs. Bennett? Yes, or I will never see her again. An unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I will never see you again if you do. Oh, Mr. Doctor. Yes. How dare you? Oh, sir, who could have heard you? Oh, really, this is all but, but all is not lost. Mary? <laughs> Mary? <laughs> Mary? <laughs> only, Miss Jane. Three short days. Oh, oh. Miss Jane, what a chance I have missed. Yes. Yeah. I ought to have said three long days. Three long days away from you, Miss Jane. Oh. I, I, I am the biggest fool at compliments. <laughs> I think of them just too late. But why do you go to London, sir, if you're so anxious to get back? With well, some idea of Darcy's. He will have me accompany him. Oh. Ah, I know what you are thinking. Indeed you do not. No, no. You are thinking, who is this man Darcy, that Bingley should be at his beck and call? I assure you, I thought no such thing. Miss Bennet, you are in error. I think nothing of this man Darcy. It is true that he has an intimidating appearance, but your humble servant is not to be intimidated. <laughs> the truth is that I go to London to look after Mr. Darcy, uh, to keep the poor fellow out of mischief. <laughs> Miss Jane, mm -hmm. shall I give a ball when I come back? And oh. will you come to it? And will you dance with me? Oh, sir, I can think of nothing more delightful than that you should. Then that is enough. The matter is settled. And Darcy may go to bed if he chooses before it begins. <laughs> Is Mr. Darcy, is it not, whom I have the honour of addressing? My name is Darcy, sir. I am the Reverend William Collins, rector of Huntsford, near Westerham, Kent. Thanks to the gracious patronage of your esteemed aunt, the Lady Catherine de Bourg. It is in my power to assure you that her ladyship was well yesterday, Senna. I will ask you to be so kind when next you see her ladyship as to assure her that I also am well. I shall make it my first and humble duty, sir. I leave my cousins at Longbourn on the Saturday in time for the usual Sunday duties of a clergyman. Your cousins at Longbourn? You are related to the Bennet? Indeed, yes. For the estate is entailed to me. Ah. It was indeed this fact which turned my thoughts in the direction of Longbourn. It seemed to me that I should best satisfy the delicacy of my feelings with regard to the entail and carry out her ladyship's instructions to marry by making an offer for Miss Jane Bennet. And with this purpose... I regret, I sir, that I must postpone acquaintance with your matrimonial projects until another season. Good evening. Indeed, yes. Uh, it's time I return to my partner, Miss Charlotte Lucas, daughter of Sir William. Your servant, sir. Your very humble servant. Your servant. Oh, uh, Mr. Darcy, uh, have you seen my daughter, Jane? Oh, now I see her for myself, and just as I might have expected on Miss Bingley's arm as usual. <laughs> Such a charming young man, is he not? I declare I don't know when I've met a more perfect gentleman, and 
told the most Jane. Lady Lucas said to me only yesterday when I said how hard it was that if anything happened to Mr. Bennett, we could all be turned out of Longbourn to a moment's notice. She said, you will find it just as comfortable as Neverfield. <laughs> and, of course, I had to own that I knew what she meant, and indeed it may be any day now. Mr. Bennett is not thinking of dying immediately. Oh, Dar Darcy, how you do take me up? I meant to me that Mr. Bingley would be asking for my daughter Jane's hand. I see. Of course, I won't say that with her looks she might not have done better, but uh, I'm not one to stand in the way of my daughter. <laughs> I love her, Darcy. Upon my soul, I do. Jane is the loveliest creature I ever set eyes upon. She is good, she is amiable, she is clever. By which I mean clever enough for me. And in short, she has everything which I should want a young woman to have. Including a mother. Why, what's the matter with her mother? No, child. Well, I'm not asking her to live with me. You do not need to. She has already invited herself. Come, Darcy, you have no right to say that. Every right. She was telling me so herself just but, now. But she was going to live with me. In so many words. But, you do not know, perhaps, that Longbourn is entailed away from the daughters, so that when Mr. Bennett dies, Mrs. Bennett and her family must find some new home. As, for instance, Netherfield. Do you know all these things? People confide in me, Charles. I can tell you, for instance, that Mr. Collins, you know Mr. Collins, yes. is Miss Bennett's cousin, is next in the entail, and has come to Longbourn in order to marry her. That fellow married Jane? It is his design. But not hers. Her mother's. To marry her to you or to him or to another, provided she marries somebody who can support them all. I will not believe it of her. Jane never could marry that parson fellow. If her mother is going to force her into the marriage, then it is my duty to save her from it. You have a duty to yourself also, to your sister, to your friends. But, Charles. Charles, you cannot marry into this family. I say nothing of that inferiority of position, the trades of an uncle, the attorney, the whole social background of Miss Bennett's connections. And now this parson fellow, which you must have seen for yourself, the total want of propriety so uniformly betrayed by the mother and the three younger sisters. How can you live with that? And what are my own want of propriety if I draw back now? Except for the actual words, I have as good as offered myself to Miss Bennett. And I swear to you, Darcy, as good as being accepted. No, no, that is where you were wrong. I have watched Miss Jane with you. Her look, her manners, her open, cheerful behaviour. Placid, unruffled. Just as it has been in the company of any other man. That is not love, Charles. I tell you my word. It is true. I know no reason why she should love me. I, I, I'm a very ordinary fellow. Not brilliant like you. I think how well we are getting on together. And all the time I'm getting on well with myself... And she is looking on kindly and smiling sweetly and thinking perhaps of some other man. Me. Well, what do you want me to do? To come to London with me tomorrow. I was coming, I told Jane. And stay with me. Three short days, I said. We had a joke about that. I mean, I had a joke. Stay with me until... Until she has married this parson fellow or somebody. In. Somebody who hasn't got a friend to stand over him and... Oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. You, 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 you're a good friend, Darcy. And I expect you're right. Tell me, it isn't friendly to be always in the right. Now it's your turn to say something, Mr. Darcy. I talked about the dance, and you ought to make some kind of remark about the size of the room or the number of couples. Whatever you wish me to say shall be said, Miss Elizabeth. Very well. That will do for the present. Perhaps by and by I may observe that private dances are pleasanter than public ones, but now we may sit here and be silent for a little. Do you talk by rule, then, when you are dancing? Sometimes. One must speak a little, you know. It would look odd to be entirely silent for half an hour together. And yet, for the advantage of some, conversation ought to be arranged so that they may have as little trouble as possible. Are you consulting your own feelings in the present case, or gratifying mine? Both. But I have always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds. We are each of an unsocial, taciturn disposition, unwilling to speak until we can say something that will amaze the whole room and be handed down to posterity as a proverb. That is never a striking resemblance of your own character. How near it may be to mine, I cannot say. You think it a faithful portrait, undoubtedly. Oh, no, I must not decide on my own performance. Nor I on my own picture. So if I'm to praise your skill as a painter, you must exercise it on someone else. Let us say Mr. Bingley. Give me Bingley in a line. It... It would be a great responsibility to be married to him. 
You seem to have studied his character sufficiently well. Is there anything else one half so amusing as studying other people? The country, I imagine, supplies few subjects worthy of your talent. In a country neighborhood, you move in a very confined and unvarying society. Yes, but people themselves alter so much that there's something new to be observed in them forever. Let us hope, then, that you have a long life in front of you. But it certainly seems as if it will be an amusing one. Will your husband also alter from day to day? Or will he be the one constant in your ever-changing world? A constant in affection, I hope. But equally, I hope that each day will reveal some new attribute in him to deepen my affection. And to serve you as a source of amusement. If he loves me, he will not mind my laughing at him occasionally. The wisest and best of men. Nay, the wisest and best of their actions may be rendered ridiculous by a person whose first object in life is a joke. Certainly there are such people, but I hope I'm not one of them. I hope I never ridicule what is wise and good. Folly, nonsense, whims. Inconsistencies do divert me, I own, and I laugh at them whenever I can. Have you none of them yourself? It has been the study of my life to avoid those weaknesses which expose one to ridicule. Such as pride and vanity. Vanity is a weakness indeed, but pride. Where there is a real superiority of mind, pride will always be kept under good regulation. Mm -hmm. If pride is to be a virtue, then I must acquit you of every fault. I have faults enough. My temper is too little yielding. I cannot forget the follies and vices of others so soon as I ought. My good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. Uh, that is a failing indeed. Implacable resentment is a shade in a character. But you have chosen your fault well. I cannot laugh at it. You are safe from me. I cannot laugh at a man whose habit is to hate everybody. And yours to misunderstand them willfully. I would not do that. Indeed, I would not. You say that your good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. You are very cautious before you let it be forfeited. I am. And never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice. I have not. Those who never change their opinion ought to be secure of judging properly first. I would work upon my character again. No. I do not get on with it at all. I hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly. That may well be. And I would beg you, therefore, to put my portrait by, for there is reason to fear that at the moment the picture would reflect no credit on either of us. You refer to Mr. Wickham, do you not? Only in as far as you were referring to Mr. Wickham. We have all found him very charming. So I suppose. Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners as must ensure his making friends. Whether he be equally capable of retaining them is less certain. He has been so unlucky to lose your friendship, and in a manner which he is likely to suffer from all his life. He seems to have gained yours in its place, which would be compensation enough for any man. Oh, you are hateful. I meant it sincerely. For the first time in my life, I envy him. Can you defend your conduct to him? To my friends. But they do not require it of me. Oh, come. Let us dance. I beg you not to think, Lucas, that I am of the opinion that a ball of this nature, given by respectable people, can have any evil tendency. Or that I hold dancing to be incompatible with the duty of a clergyman. Oh, indeed, I yes. do not mean, however, to assert that we can be here justified in devoting too much of our time to dancing. For there are other things to be attended to. Indeed, the yes. rector of such a parish as her ladyship has bestowed upon me has much to do. In the first place, I am we will sure you must be very busy, Mr. Collins. I have always thought that a clergyman's work must be so interesting. Really? I have always thought that to be married to a clergyman must be so interesting. Yes, she but... would find so much in her husband's work to interest the... her. I, I feel that if she were really interested, she could be of so much help to him in his work. It is true, as you say, Miss Charlotte, that a clergyman's wife could add very greatly to his happiness and to the proper discharge of his duty. Nor do I reckon the notice and kindness of Lady Catherine de Bourgh as among the least of the advantages which it is in my power to offer the lady on whom I bestow my affection. Oh, indeed, no, Mr. Collins. I cannot think that any young woman could willfully refuse such a privilege. That is as may be. Certainly in no young woman of intelligent and modest disposition could the sense of her ladyship's condescension fail to excite feelings of awe and gratitude. Miss Charlotte, my attentions have been too marked to be mistaken. Almost as soon as I entered Hertfordshire, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. Oh, sir. It remains only to assure you in the most animated language of the violence of my affection. To fortune, I'm perfectly indifferent, knowing that your father's a real man. And now, Elizabeth.
Douglas, my dear, we can have a real talk undisturbed by men. <laughs> Mr. Collins will be showing my father the garden for half an hour yet. It is his chief pride. Mm. Indeed, he spends most of his time working in it, I'm thankful to say. I encourage it as much as possible, of course. The exercise is so helpful for him. You speak like a happy married woman, Charlotte. Naturally, my dear. Well, now, I want all your news. I cannot tell you how glad I am to have you at Huntsford to have somebody to talk with again. I mean a woman, of course, someone to gossip with. I am very glad to come, dear Charlotte. It was so good in Sir William to bring me with him to Kent. Oh, I had to have you. He would know none of the gossip, and I must have it all. <laughs> now tell me, oh, what should I have first? Jane. Jane, for sure. Jane and Mr. Bingley. Is anything settled? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately? But you were all... It is settled that she will never see him again. But how can that be? My mother wrote that he had not come back to Netherfield, but is not Jane in London? I'm sure she told me Jane was in London. These three months at my Aunt Gardner's. And Mr. Bingley has not called upon them? No. Perhaps he does not know she is there. His sister knows Jane and she have met. Then what keeps him away? Or shall we say who keeps him away? Hmm. I never did like that Miss Bingley. Nor I, Charlotte. Nor anybody, so far as I could discover, uh, save my dear Jane, who likes everybody. <laughs> But I do not think Mr. Bingley would take orders from his sister. Then who is the villain? Mr. Darcy? I can only suppose so. I, I cannot know for sure. Oh, did you know that the villain is in our midst at this moment? Mr. Darcy? How? Where? He is staying at Raisings. You know that he is Lady Catherine's nephew. I had forgotten. Oh, we have not spoken with him yet. He's only just come. But we are sure to be asked in after dinner one night while you are here. You would not mind seeing him again? Of course I shall not mind. We despise each other in the politest way. I am never so happy as when telling him that I hate him, and he never so courteous as when showing his indifference. <laughs> oh, what of Lydia? Has none of her officers asked for her? Not yet. <laughs> but I am troubled about her, Charlotte. She's so young and flighty. And now it seems the regiment is to move to Brighton, and nothing will please Lydia but that she must go too. Oh. Uh, Mrs. Forster, the colonel's wife, you remember, has asked her to stay with them. And what does Mr. Bennett say? He says that Lydia will never be easy until she's exposed herself in some public place or other, and that we can never expect her to do it with so little expense or inconvenience to her family as at Brighton. <laughs> Poor Eliza. All the troubles of the family seem to be yours. <laughs> oh, well, my dear... Oh, Charlotte! Oh, why, Mr. Oh, Collins? Quick, 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 quick. What is the matter? Come along, come along, Miss Ince. William, whatever is it? Look out of the window. Come, Charlotte. What can it be, Lydia? I must ask garden, and here is nothing but Lady Catherine and her daughter. That is not Lady Catherine. It is Mrs. Jenkinson and her young charge, Mr. Burke. Not even Lady Catherine. No, no. So that is the daughter. They say she's to marry Mr. Darcy, and that that is what he's come to Rosings for. Hmm. I like her appearance. She looks sickly and cross. She will make him a very proper wife. And she is rude, too, to keep Charlotte standing out in the wind. Yes. She will do for Darcy very well. Oh, well, it was a most pretty compliment that Mr. Berg should drive past on the very day of our arrival. But of course, one expects such courtesies from the elegantly bred. Charlotte is looking very well, Sir William. Yes, yes. Mr. Collins tells me that they go up to Rosie's regularly twice every week. All the same, I still think that she is looking very well. Well, what do you think, Miss Elizabeth? What do you think has happened? I have a surprise for you. I confess that it even surprises myself. It's even more than I could have hoped for. I am all eagerness to hear, Mr. Collins. We are to dine. The whole party is us to dine at Rosings tomorrow. Well, well, well. Who could well. have imagined we should have received such an invitation to dine there? <laughs> an invitation, moreover, including the whole party. So immediately after your arrival. Do you know, Miss Elizabeth, there are 143 windows of varying sizes in Rosings? I shall take your word for it, sir, and admire them all. Mr. Collins. Ah, oh, my dear, I was just telling my cousin about the windows at Rosings. Oh, yes, that reminds me. Have you seen that very pretty view of the wall from the Long Meadow, Papa? At well, the moment of the appearance, No, no, I do not mean that view from the arbor, but there is another very pretty glimpse of it. Do take my father, Mr. Collins. The light would be falling on the windows now in a very pretty way. Uh, that was what made me think of it. Oh, very well, then. No doubt you've still much to show my fair cousin within the house. Oh, I have so many things to show her, Mr. Collins, that you can safely leave it to me. Then shall we come, Sir William? By all means, by all means. He's made yourself quite at home, Miss Elizabeth. We lack the magnificence of rosings, but in our it humble way... It's the end of the meadow that you get the best glimpse from the middle is not near so far. Well, my dear, I'm <laughs> <laughs> You do it very 
well, Charlotte, but why the end of the meadow? Why, indeed? I shall give you three guesses. I dare not. <laughs> well, then, Mrs. Jenkinson said something, which I do not think Mr. Collins heard, for he was complimenting Mr. Berg upon her looks at the time. Mm -hmm. Very plain, she not? Oh, very. And so I stayed behind and took a peep from the corner of the road, and it is true... Mr. Darcy and his cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam, are riding over to call upon us. And from the end of the long meadow, you cannot see them riding up. And from the end of the long meadow is a very pretty glimpse of roses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I also thought Eliza did it, but I took Mr. Darcy into the garden. Then you could exert your charms on Colonel Fitzwilliam, who looked on Sunday as if he could fall in love very easily. Oh, Charlotte, dear, don't be silly. He is the younger son of an earl. Oh, then my charms will be wasted on him. It is my 50 pounds a year he'll be after. <laughs> oh, well, it was 55. Well, they will be coming at any moment. I do hear the clatter of their horses' hooves. I must be at the gate to welcome them. I must try. Oh, mention to Colonel Fitzwilliam that I had 10 pounds on my last birthday for my Uncle Gardiner. And may count on it again. <laughs> you doing with my counters? I do humbly beg your ladyship to forgive me, but it was to save your ladyship the labour of counting them. Did you win that last game? Uh, I'm afraid I, I... It looks as if you are not a very good card player, Sir William. Oh, well, perhaps I am a little out of practice, your ladyship. Mrs. Collins, you shall take Sir William's place. Oh, oh. And Sir William, you will take the place. Very. Uh, the windows give it a good proportion. Yes, Mr. Darcy. <laughs> Chicks, are they not? What a muse. Is it something that I have said? But I was forgetting. We had decided that you were to go through life being amused. No, no, please. I was not smiling at you. I assure oh. you, sir, I would never do that. It was just something my cousin had said. What is 27 from 143? Uh, the yes. answer is 116, but why? Uh, Mr. Collins told me yesterday that there were 143 windows at Rosings, and I promised to admire them all. I have now only 116 left. Uh, that is, if I am right to count the conservatory as one. I should like you to see the big west window at Pemberley. Is it open to the public on Wednesdays? Do you know Derbyshire at all? I know it very well, for I have an aunt, Mrs. Gardner, who was born there, and never tires of recounting its beauty. She does not live there now. She lives in London. She and my uncle are to take me with them to the lakes in July. But if we are to pass through her beloved Derbyshire, as I suppose we must, I do not see how we are ever to get there. If you are in the neighbourhood of Pemberley, I hope you will consider it worth a visit. I shall be away myself. But my housekeeper will show you everything you wish to see. Your invitation is doubly kind, sir, and I thank you. What is it you are saying? What is it you are talking of, Miss Bennett? I was talking of my aunt, madam. Ah, come over here, please. Uh, yes, madam. You have three younger sisters, have you not, Miss Bennett? Yes, ma'am. Are any of them out? Uh, yes, ma'am, all. All? What? All? Thank of you, out of what? Very odd. The younger ones out before the elder are married. Your younger sisters must be very young. Yes, my youngest is not 16. Uh, perhaps she is full young to be much in company. But really, ma'am, I think it would be very hard upon younger sisters that they should not have their share of society because the elder may not have the means or the inclination to marry early. Upon oh, my word, you give your opinion very decidedly for so young a person. Pray, what is your age? With three younger sisters grown up, your ladyship can hardly expect me to own it. Since you cannot be more than 20, I see no reason why you should conceal your age. I will admit to 20, ma'am. Ah. Mr. Collins, are you at my counters again? Really, this is astonishing. I see my cousin has wandered off, Miss Bennett. Our conversation was interrupted, Colonel Fitzwilliam. Uh, you do not play cards. I play with my sisters at home, but it is a different game. We are laughing all the time. <laughs> yes. Are you and Mr. Darcy in Kent for long? It is for him to say. I am to go with him to Pemberley, but he will arrange the when as he pleases. I am at his disposal for so long as he wants me. I wonder he did not marry to secure a lasting convenience of that kind. Uh, oh, true, he has Mr. Bingley. Do you know Mr. Bingley? Oh, yes. A very pleasant fellow. Great friend of Darcy's. Yes, Mr. Darcy takes a prodigious deal of care of him. From something my cousin was telling me, Bingley has every reason to be extremely indebted to him. Oh? Naturally, no names were mentioned, because if it were to get round to the lady's family, it would be most unpleasant. You may depend upon my not mentioning it, but It what... was only that he had just saved a friend 
from a most disastrous marriage. From the way he spoke, I was sure that he meant Bingley. I see. Did Mr. Darcy give you his reasons for this interference? I understood there were some very strong objections to the lady. And what arts did he use to separate them? <laughs> he did not talk to me of his own arts. He only told me of the result. I see. Colonel Fitzwilliam, Mr. Darcy's conduct does not suit my feelings. Pray excuse me. so my cousins went without me. Yes, they told me. You are better. Thank you. It was just a headache. It is gone now. I came over to Huntsford to inquire and to say goodbye. I am to leave early tomorrow. It was kind of you to call. Thank you. You have been in Kent three weeks, have you not? Mm. I expect you will be glad to get back to Derbyshire, or is it to London that you go? Yes. No. Oh. My plans are uncertain. It is no use. I struggle and struggle in vain. You have caught me. I cannot escape. Mr. Darcy. I cannot do without the light in your eyes, the sound of your voice. They go with me everywhere. In vain, in vain have I struggled to escape them. I love you. This is impossible. No, I know how ridiculous I'm making myself to be doing the very thing against which I have so often warned others. To be opposing my inclination to all that propriety and common sense recommend. To degrade myself from my own rank and station of the summons of a lovely face and a lively mind. But you are worth the sacrifice, Elizabeth. All these days since I have been at Rosings, I have been trying to find some fault in you which would bring me back to my senses and convince me of the impossibility, the unseemliness of such a marriage. In vain I watched you, in vain I struggled. Well, so be it. I love you. I must marry you. Miss Bennet, I ask you to be my wife. Mr. Darcy, at least I can thank you for asking, for admitting the right of choice even to one in my inferior position. Other gratitude than this I cannot show. I am sorry to give pain to anyone, but in this case it has been most unconsciously done and should not last long. The propriety and common sense, which so nearly restrained you from a declaration, will easily console you now that I have rejected it. Rejected? Astonishing as it must seem to you, rejected. And is this all that you have to say to me? Am I to be allowed to ask why, with so little endeavour at civility, you refuse my offer? I might as well ask why, with so evident a design of insulting me. You chose to tell me that you like me against your will, against your reason, even against your courage. Does not this give me some excuse for anger? But I have other provocations. Do you think that any consideration would tempt me to accept the man who has been the means of ruining, perhaps forever, the happiness of a most beloved sister? I understand. It is for your sister Jane that you are so indignant. Can you deny that it was you who had so hurt her? I admit that I did everything in my power to separate my friend from your sister and that I rejoiced in my success. To him I have been kinder than to myself. But it is not only on this that my dislike is founded. You defend yourself as a true friend of Mr. Bingley's. But in what respect have you been a true friend of Mr. Wickham's? Well, I remember, you have always taken a great interest in Mr. Wickham. Who that knows what his misfortunes have been can help feeling an interest in him? His misfortunes? You have reduced him to poverty. And now you treat the mention of his misfortunes with contempt and ridicule. Shame on you, Mr. Darcy. And that is your opinion of me. I thank you for explaining so fully. My faults are heavy indeed. But perhaps they would have been overlooked if I had not hurt your pride by an honest confession of the scruples which had restrained me from speaking before. Can you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your connections? To congratulate myself after meeting your mother and your younger sisters on the hope of marrying into your family? Mr. Darcy! From the first moment of my acquaintance with you, your ill manners, your arrogance, your conceit, your disdain for the feelings of others had formed my opinion of you. And I had not known you two weeks before I knew that you were the last man in the world whom I could ever be prevailed on to marry. I thank you. I now understand your feelings perfectly. And have only to be ashamed of what my know have been. Forgive me for taking up more of your time, but I would like to say this. Whatever we have thought of each other in the past, or think at this moment. At least I have never doubted your intelligence, nor you, my pride. And as far as that pride is the arrogance you condemn, I shall not defend it. But there is a pride, Miss Bennet, which one takes in one's honour and one's good name. Apart from your dislike of me, you have brought two accusations against me. 
This is the last occasion on which we shall meet. My last opportunity, therefore, to stay in defense of my honor, that which I have decided now requires to be said. I shall listen to anything you wish to say. First, then, in respect of your sister Jane and Bingley. I have given my reasons for thinking such a marriage unsuitable, but I will ask you to believe that never for one moment did I suppose that your sister's heart was seriously touched. I have seen them together often, and I can only say that her serenity deceived me. Had I known, I should have regretted the marriage equally for my friend. But I should not have opposed it. Thank you, sir. My mind is in no condition for argument on the subject, but I shall remember what you have said. That is all I ask. And the other? The other is a much more serious accusation. I do not propose to make a long story of Mr. Wickham, but here are the plain, dull facts on which you have put so attractive a gloss. The story of himself is true thus far, that he lived at Pemberley, the son of my father's steward, that my father, attracted by his engaging manners, held a high opinion of him, and that hoping that the church would be his profession, had intended to provide for him. My own opinion of him was not so high. Mr. Wickham is, in fact, a man of vicious character, entitled to no woman's respect. I do not believe it. It is your jealousy which makes you say so. My father died five years ago, leaving Mr. Wickham a legacy of a thousand pounds. He also recommended to me in his will that a valuable living should be given to him as soon as it should become vacant. Within six months, Mr. Wickham came to me and said that he had decided not to go into the church. At his own suggestion, he resigned all claims on the living and accepted in return £3,000. That ended the matter and seemed to end our connection. He took his money to London, where he lived, as I heard, a life of idleness and dissipation. Three years later, the living became vacant. And he then had the impudence to claim it on the grounds that my father had always intended it for him. You will not be surprised that I refused his claim. It is just your story against his. I do not believe it. I have now to tell you something which I had hoped never to speak of again. I do not need to ask from you a pledge of absolute secrecy. My deeply loved sister was left to the guardianship of Colonel Fitzwilliam and myself. A year ago, she was taken from school and sent for her health sake to the sea in the companionship of a lady whom we supposed we could trust. Mr. Wickham, who had, of course, known her as a child at Pemberley, learned of this and followed her. His charms persuaded her to believe herself in love with him and to consent to an elopement. Unknown to him, however, she had written me a farewell letter, and I arrived just in time to prevent it. My sister was but fifteen, which must be her excuse. Mr. Wickham's excuse was that she had a fortune of £30,000 and that he could think of no more complete way of being revenged upon me. Horrible! Horrible! I will not believe it. As an executor of my father's will, no less than as my cousin and intimate friend, Colonel Fitzwilliam is in equal possession of all these facts. If your abhorrence of me should make my word valueless, you cannot be prevented by the same cause from confiding in him. That is all I wish to say. Mr. Darcy, I, I cannot think now. I, all that you have said is just so many words, which I shall remember later. Perhaps we may both be able to profit by remembering later what the other has said. Goodbye. Goodbye. God bless you, Elizabeth. I saw you through the trees sitting on this seat. Welcome to Pemberley. Uh, they told us at the house that you would not be here until tomorrow, Mr. Darcy, and we asked in the village. My too. friends will not arrive until tomorrow, but I had suddenly to come in advance of them on some business with my steward. I am with my uncle and aunt Gardiner. They have just left me to walk on a little. My aunt was born near Pemberley. I remember. You once told me. Oh, we thought you were away as the grounds were open to the public. 
Even so, I did not want... But my aunt was so anxious to come. I could not... I also remember that I once invited you to come. Uh, Yes, but that was before. I I mean, I... I hope very much, now that you are here, that you will let me show you something of my home. You are tired, perhaps. I am a little tired. We have been seeing so much... Miss Bennett, I have always wished for you to meet my sister. Will you? Oh, but I have always wondered what she is like. I, I mean, I have heard... Well, now you shall discover for yourself. I think, I hope, that you will love her. I am sure that she will love you. And so now, if you will present me to Mrs. Gardner, we can make what arrangements the meeting will best suit her. You are being very kind, sir. Kind to myself. Let me give you an arm if you are tired. Thank you. Have you remarked on the extraordinary beauty of the day? It has been wonderfully fine all the week. Ah. I had not noticed it. Is your mother still having hysterics, Jane? She's still upstairs, sir. She does not leave her room. Hmm. Oh, how could Lydia? Lydia's capacity of disgracing herself and her family has never been under question. All that was uncertain was the opportunity. Don't you think, sir, that perhaps they have got married? Can you think, Jane, of any reason why a man like Wickham should want to marry a penniless girl like Lydia? If we don't bribe him to do it. In her letter, she said they were to go to Gretna Green. Doubtless Wickham told her they were to go to Gretna Green. Then do you suppose them to be in London? Where else can they be so well hidden? Oh, it is difficult to sit and wait and be able to do nothing. Difficult for you, Jane, but to me this waiting is but a breathing space between bursts of activity. You forget how at the first news I hurried off to Brighton. It is true that I learned nothing of their plans by this, but nobody can say that I was inactive. Now, so soon as your uncle and aunt have brought Lizzie back from Derbyshire, I shall be up and away with them to London. You've not heard from Elizabeth since you wrote to tell her? They will be here as soon as a letter. They would start at once. They should be here tonight. Lizzie is a good girl. She will not reproach me. She will reproach herself, as I do. You? In all this business, the two people who have nothing with which to reproach themselves are you and Lizzie. Lizzie and I knew Mr. Wickham's true character. Mr. Darcy had told her, and we had wondered whether to make it known, but thought it kinder, since Mr. Wickham was leaving the neighbourhood, to say nothing. If only we had spoken. If you had spoken, you would only have made Wickham more attractive. Handsome, charming, and a villain. Who could resist him? Poor Jane. How you must have suffered through all this. How I have longed for you, dear Lizzie, just to be alone with you again. My loving thoughts were in advance of me all through that miserable journey yesterday, hurrying to get to you. You told me you'd met Mr. Darcy again. Mm. Did you see him before you left? Did he know? He knew. He came upon me as I was reading your dreadful letter. Oh, Jane. You told him. He found me crying. Even he would be kind at such a time. Even he. It seems that I must defend him. To think that I should have to defend anyone against Jane. I I only meant that I have been wrong about him. He has been kindness itself to all three of us, all the time that we were at Pemberley. I see. Did you know that Netherfield was to be opened again? Did you not know that I had seen Mr. Bingley again at Pemberley? You saw him? How was he? Well, and looking forward to coming back to Netherfield, perhaps to meeting somebody again. It is not possible that he... That anybody could want to know us now? To be connected with a family is so disgraced. Not now, no. Miss Elizabeth Bennet? Lady Catherine. Ah, and I suppose you are Miss Jane Bennet? Uh, yes, this is my sister Jane. Uh, Jane, this is Lady Catherine de Bourgh, of whom you have heard. Your ladyship. Yes. You both have a look. That is what catches a man. Were you wishing to see my mother, Lady Catherine? I wish to see your sister. Alone. Uh, Jane, dear, I do not know what Lady Catherine has come to say, but I I think I'd better hear it. Of course. Pray excuse me. You can be at no loss, Miss Bennet, to understand the reason of my journey here. 
Your own conscience must tell you why I come. You are mistaken, madam. I cannot account for it at all. Then I will be frank with you. A report of a most alarming nature has reached me from Pemberley. I was told that not only was your sister Jane likely to be advantageously married, but that you, Miss Elizabeth Bennet, would shortly be united to my own nephew, Mr. Darcy. But, though I know it to be a scandalous falsehood, I instantly resolved upon setting off of this place that I might make my sentiments known to you. With what object, if you knew it to be untrue? To insist upon having such a scandalous report publicly contradicted. Your coming to Longbourn to see me and my family will surely be regarded as confirmation of it, if indeed such a report is in existence. Miss Bennet, I insist upon being satisfied. Has my nephew made you an offer of marriage? Your ladyship has declared it to be impossible. Impossible? While he remained in his right senses. But you may have drawn him from his duty by your arts and allurements. If I had, I should naturally be the last person to confess it. Miss Bennet, do you know who I am? I am not accustomed to being treated like this. As Mr. Darcy's nearest relation, I have the right to know his most private concern. But not the right to know my... Nor does your manner of asking induce me to grant it to you as a favour. Then let me tell you this. Mr. Darcy is engaged to my daughter. Now, what have you to say? Only this. That if he is so, you can have no reason to suppose he will make an offer to me. The engagement between them is of a peculiar kind. The union was planned while they were in their cradles by his mother and hers. It was always our dearest wish. And is that wish, that resolve, now to be shattered by the intrusion of a young woman of inferior birth and of no social importance? Lady Catherine, if Mr. Darcy does not regard an engagement planned for him in his cradle as binding upon him 25 years later, how can you possibly suppose that I, who was not even alive then, shall regard it as binding upon me? Miss Bennet, you will make me lose my temper directly. I am not used to being answered back in this way. Nor I to being told by a stranger whose hand I may accept in marriage. Tell me once for all, are you engaged to Mr. Darcy? I am not. Ah. And will you promise me never to enter into such an engagement? I will make no promise of the kind. Wait. To all the objections I have urged, I have yet another. I know of your youngest sister's elopement with Wickham. You know? With suitable expressions of horror and disgust, Mr. Collins has informed me of what, no doubt, is the common talk of this village. Is such a girl to be my nephew's sister? Would you disgrace him forever? You can have now nothing further to say. You have insulted me in every possible method. I must beg you to leave. Very well. You refuse to obey the claims of duty, honor, and gratitude. You are determined to ruin Mr. Darcy in the opinion of all his friends and make him the contempt of the world. Very well. I shall now know how to act. I, however, am still a little uncertain. Would your ladyship wish me to ring, or would you prefer to leave with as little ceremony as you arrive? I take no leave of you, Miss Bennet. I send no compliments to your mother. You deserve no such attention. I am most seriously displeased. Oh. <laughs> I thought I'd die with laughing, didn't you, Wickham? <laughs> Very funny. But don't make so much noise. That's a good girl. I don't want to be turned out of my lodging. <laughs> yes. Good afternoon. Ah, it is the great Mr. Darcy. The great Mr. Darcy in person. <laughs> well, well, well. And how comes the great Mr. Darcy to be honouring our humble London abode? I wish to speak to you on business, Wickham. Speak on, Darcy. Open your heart to us. I would prefer to speak to you alone. But I am not sure that I want to speak to you at all, Darcy. Either alone or in company. I think it will be to your advantage. My advantage, eh? Mm, very well. Lydia, you can go and look at yourself in your mirror for five minutes. It will amuse you. You won't let him try to get you away from me. Run along, that's a good girl. You shall hear all about it afterwards. Now, mind, that's a promise. <laughs> hmm. A pretty creature, say, for a month or two. What do you think? You are not married to her. <laughs> married? Don't be reasonable. I want a rich wife, Darcy. I nearly got one once, and somebody interfered. You are in debt, I imagine. Damnably so. To what extent? 
London, Brighton, Merton, say 3,000 pounds. And you are resigning your commission? Let us say that my commission is resigning me. It is possible that you might achieve that rich wife if you do not set your hopes too high. And what do you suggest, Mr. Darcy, at a nice, comfortable height? Miss Lydia Bennett. <laughs> With 1,000 pounds due on her mother's death... That's your first real joke, Darcy. With practice, you'll be quite entertaining. Miss Lydia Bennett, with £2,000 on her wedding day, with all her husband's debts paid, and with a commission purchased for him in another regiment, in another part of the country where he can make a fresh start. Ah, we are going to talk business then. Well, is this an offer from Mr. Bennett? On behalf of Mr. Bennett. I see. It will be useful to know just why you have this great interest in my matrimonial affairs. You may take it, if you will, that I feel responsible for you. I'm delighted to hear it. Well, when your sense of responsibility is just a little more pronounced, say to the extent of another £5,000 or so, then you may come to me again. The terms are, as I've said, £2,000 settled on your wife, a commission purchased for you, and your debt paid to a limit of £3,000, but not beyond. My dear Darcy, do you think I'm a fool? I am giving you an opportunity to prove that you are not. Perhaps you would like a day or two in which to consult your creditors. They will certainly wish to consult you. I shall be in London until the end of the week. You know where to find me. Here, yeah, Darcy. Damn that fellow. Damn. Has he gone? Oh, what did he want? Come and sit on my knee. <laughs> Let's have a look at you. Oh, well. How would you like to get married? Oh, Lord, I suppose we ought to someday. Oh, oh Wickham, I've just thought. When I'm married, I shall go in before my elder sisters and I can chaperone them and get them husbands. Oh, won't that be fun? Let's get married at once. <laughs> it is a delightful thing to be sure, girls, to have a daughter well married. And now that Mr. Bingley has come amongst us again and may be here at any moment, perhaps I shall have another daughter married. <laughs> Then, Lizzie, that'll only leave you and Mary, and you, Kitty. And if you take Mr. Collins, as I always yes, wanted yes. to... Yes, riding up now, Mama. Mr. Bingley, riding up now? Oh, Jane must be told at once. There's a gentleman with him. Oh? La, it looks like the man that Lydia was telling me about that used to be here before. Mr. What's-his-name? The very proud man. Mr. Darcy. Mm. Oh, well, any friend of Mr. Bingley's will always be welcome, but I must say I hate the very sight of him. Jane! Jane, make haste and hurry down. No, no, wait. I'll come here. Uh, Kitty, if we can be not gone to the village yet, tell him that Mr. Darcy has come. He will not want to meet him. Lord, Lizzie, how silly you are. All that is over long ago. They're the greatest of friends now. And it was Mr. Darcy bought him his commission. And Mr. Oh, Darcy... Oh, child. It was my Uncle Gardiner. It was Darcy. Because he was at the church when they were married and stood with Wickham and signed the register. Because Lydia... Oh, Lord. I promised Lydia I wouldn't say a word because... Because she promised Wickham, and Wickham promised Darcy, and Darcy made my Uncle Gardner promise him. So now you must promise me... And that then, with as little delay as possible, the whole world will know. Well, I'm glad you told me, even if you have no right to. But Darcy, is it possible? Well, Lizzie, look who I have brought. Isn't that a pleasant surprise? Mr. Bingley come to see us again. Yes. Oh, and Mr. Darcy. Yes. I suppose you've heard, Mr. Bingley, that I've had one of my daughters married recently. Indeed, madam. Yes, and perhaps you saw it, Mr. Darcy. I did, madam, and I congratulate you. It is a delightful thing to be sure to have a daughter well married, but it's hard to lose a loving child. They go down to Newcastle, a place quite northward, it seems, where Mr. Wickham's regiment is stationed, for he has now gone into the regulars. Yes, madam, and is Miss Bennet quite well? My daughter Jane... Oh, I think I saw my daughter Jane in the small parlour. Uh, Kitty, take Mr. Bingley to the small blue parlour and see if your sister Jane is there. Yes, Mama. And then uh, come up to my room. I have something I wish you to help me at. Yes, Mama. Lead the way, Kitty, to the blue or the pink or to any other coloured parlour. I shall be there behind you. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is odd, is it not, Mr. Darcy, that I should have my youngest daughter married before my eldest? One would naturally expect it to happen the other way round, the eldest before the youngest. I am sure, madam, that the eldest will not be long in following her sister's example. Ah, oh, that is as maybe. Jane's heart is not easily won. She did have a partiality for a young man last winter, but the feeling wore off. I hope, madam, that that does not refer to my friend Bingley, seeing that he has come today to lay himself at the feet of Miss Bennet. 
in the hope that she has not entirely forgotten him. Lay himself at... Uh, uh, Kitty! Kitty! I want you, my dear. Is it true, Mr. Darcy, that Mr. Bingley has come to ask for Jane? To judge from his impatience on the way here, he has already asked for her. Dear, dear Jane, to know that she will be happy at last, that is almost happiness enough. You make me ashamed that I have postponed it for so long. <sighs> Mr. Darcy, I have just heard what I was not intended to hear, but I cannot keep silence. Let me thank you again and again for your noble generosity to my sister Lydia, nay, to all of us. How did you know? I did not mean you to know. It was Kitty whose thoughtlessness betrayed you, but it did not tell me all that I wanted to hear. It was you who found them, you who made him marry her, your money which paid his debt. Please. How you must have hated it, pleading with him. What mortifications must you have borne for us? And now there's nothing to say but thank you. If you will thank me, let it be for yourself alone. All that I did was what I thought you would like me to do. Elizabeth, you are too generous to trifle with me. If your feelings are still what they were, tell me, and I shall trouble you no more. Mine are unchanged. I called you selfish, then. Do you think that I am still calling you selfish? I said I loved you, then. Do you think that I can ever stop loving you? Can you not? Never. I think that I could now begin. Oh, Elizabeth. Dearest, <laughs> loveliest Elizabeth. I love you. I love you. Oh. How did you begin? My beauty you withstood from the first. My manners to you were always bordering on the uncivil. Of my character you could have no knowledge. Was it my impertinence which you so loved? The liveliness of your mind. You may as well call it impertinence. It was little else. I had never met anybody like you. You were you. <laughs> Alas, I feel that must have been said before to other women. But I shall not complain of it. And now... Tell me when you forgave me for the horrible things I said to you. I forgave you the horrible things you had said to me as soon as I was calm enough to remember the abominable things I had said to you. <laughs> yes. Perhaps we had better not quarrel for the greater share of blame for that evening. We have both of us improved in civility since then. Or is it that I like you a little more? When did you decide to like me a little more? When I met you at Pemberley, knowing by then how I had misjudged you knowing myself for the ignorant, prejudiced young woman that I showed myself to be. Why did you come back to me when I told you never to insult me with your addresses again? It was when Lady Catherine told me of her visit to you. For I knew that if you had been irrevocably against me, you would have acknowledged it frankly to her. It determined me to try my fortune once more. Dear Lady Catherine, she has been of infinite use, which ought to make her happy, for she loves to be of use. <laughs> <laughs> have I made you happy, Elizabeth? Dearest, I'm the happiest creature in the world. I'm happier even than Jane is now. She only smiles. I laugh. <laughs> is this very odd? Surely you were in one another's arms in the room which I've just left. Uh, oh, I beg your pardon. I, I see that I'm to have another son-in-law. Sir. Uh, please, go now, Darcy. You shall speak to my father afterwards. Whenever you wish, Elizabeth. I'm to be found in almost any room where two young people are embracing. <laughs> Come here, Lizzie. Who is that? So you are to make a better match even than Jane. Indeed, sir. I have not thought of it like that. Darcy is rich to be sure. But that will make you happy. He will make me happy. Lizzie... You've been the only person in this house with whom I could ever share a smile. Perhaps for that reason, the only one to whom I can now speak seriously. We've... We have been two friends in a strange country, enjoying the comedy which the inhabitants have played for us. Now you're to set off for a new country alone. And you will find that comedy is very often but a tragic escape from reality. That is well enough for me, but not for you. I know your disposition. I know that you could never be happy 
unless you truly esteemed and loved your husband. Oh, my child, let me not have the grief of seeing you unable to respect your partner in life. You do not know what it means. Dearest, dearest father, believe me, I pray you. I do esteem him. I do love him. A little while ago, you were letting it be known that you hated him. A hundred years ago, stupid and ignorant creature that I was. As long ago as that. Uh, it seems that I have been serious without provocation. And you will be properly miserable without him? I am afraid so, sir. It is true that I love him. And that for many weeks now, I, I've known his true character and how little worthy of him I am. You must indeed be respectable if my Lizzie is not worthy of him. Well, I should have given him my consent in any case, because he is the kind of man to whom I should never dare refuse anything which he condescended to ask. Oh. And I shall now give it to you, Lizzie, because you are the kind of girl to whom I could never refuse anything which would make her happy. Oh, thank you, sir. And will you come and stay with us sometimes at Pemberley? Continually. In a little while, you will feel that you are coming to stay with me. Oh, now I am really happy. I admire all my three sons-in-law highly. Wickham, perhaps, is my favourite. <laughs> but I shall like yours quite as well as Jane's. <laughs> I must tell you, sir, it was he, not my Uncle Gardiner, who found Lydia, who paid all Wickham's debts and brought about the marriage. Darcy? Well, well, this is a day of wonders indeed. Mm. And so Darcy did everything. Yes. That will save me a world of trouble and economy. Had it been as I understood your uncle's doing, I must and would have paid him. But these violent young lovers carry everything their own way. I shall offer to discharge my debt. He will rant and storm about his love for you, and there will be an end of the matter. You'd better send him to me at once. Yes, sir. Dearest Papa, thank you. Send him along. Yes, sir. Oh, Lizzie. Yes, sir. If any young men come for Mary or Kitty, say that I shall be at leisure in about five minutes. <laughs> Miss Elizabeth Bennett, dramatized by A.A. Milne from Jane Austen's novel Pride and Prejudice, was adapted for radio by Peggy Wells. Elizabeth Bennett was played by Kika Markham and Mr. Darcy by Derek Jacobi. Of the other members of the Bennett family, Mrs. Bennett was played by Vivian Chatterton. Mr. Bennett by Preston Lockwood, Miss Bennett, Jane by Leanne Orkin, Mary, Lydia and Kitty Bennett by Carol Marsh, Sean Davis and Alexa Romanis. Lady Catherine de Berg was played by Lydia Sherwood, Charles Bingley, Victor Lucas, Miss Bingley, Margaret Robertson, George Wickham, Frederick Treves, Sir William Lucas, Geoffrey Winkert, Miss Charlotte Lucas, Rosalind Shanks, Colonel Fitzwilliam, Lockwood West, and Mr. Collins, Michael Rothwell. Miss Elizabeth Bennett was produced by David Davis. In Toad of Toad Hall by A. A. Milne, which has been adapted from Kenneth Graham's classic story, The Wind in the Willows, you can hear Derek Smith as Toad, Bernard Cribbins as Rat, Richard Goulden as Mole, Cyril Luckham as Badger, and Hugh Paddock as the Judge. The Fraser Simpson music has been especially adapted for this radio production by Peter Hope.
the river bank. A warm morning in spring. Nurse was knitting a sock that seems to have fallen asleep. This leaves Marigold to amuse herself. She's lying on her front and talking down the telephone. At least she has the trumpet of one daffodil to her ear and of another to her mouth and has apparently just got on to the exchange. Hello? Is that the exchange? I want Riverbank 1001. Hello? Is that the Water Rat's house? Is that Mr Rat speaking? <gasps> Good morning, Mr Rat. This is Marigold speaking. Yes, well, almost alone. Nurse is here, but she's asleep. How's Mr Badger and Mr Mole? Oh, haven't you seen him? Well, I expect he's very busy spring cleaning. You see, when your house is all basement, there's such a lot of spring cleaning to be done. Yes, I prefer Riverside residence too. Oh, may I really come one day? How lovely! Oh, no, not tomorrow. I'm having tea with Mr Toad. Oh, yes, conceited, but so nice. <laughs> oh, will you really? Well, and if Mr. I Mo declare, Miss Marigold, you do think of funny things. Oh, nurse is awake. Goodbye. Have you been overhearing, Nurse? I couldn't help it, dearie. You're that funny. With your Mr. Rat and Mr. Toad and Mr. Badger and all. Just as if they were human beings. Oh, but so they are. Human beings? Yes, I mean, they're as human to themselves as as we are to us. <laughs> well, it's no good, dearie. I can't follow it. I mean, they must seem quite big and grown up and human to each other. And if we lived in their world, then they'd seem big and grown up to us, just like real people. Oh, now fancy that. You might almost have seen them, the way you talk. Well, I have. Never. Yes, one morning. I came out here early, or ever so early. Nobody was up. You weren't up, and the birds weren't up, and even the sun wasn't up. And everything was so still that there was no sound in all the world, except just the wind in the willows, whispering ever so gently. Well, and what happened? Well, I sat there and waited for everything to wake up. And then, by and by, I heard something. Music, very thin and clear and far off. And then, well, then there was the sun and it was daylight. And it seemed as if I'd just woken up myself. But it was all different. Something had happened. I didn't know what, but I seemed to understand more than I did before. To have been with them. Oh, yes. I can hear something. Listen, oh, that's the music again. Quick, hide. Grief and stretch and scrabble and scrooge, scrooge and scrabble. Scrape and scratch, up we go, up we go. Pop. Oh, oh, this is fine. This is better than whitewash. Hang spring cleaning. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. Blow spring cleaning. Is that a river? Oh, my, oh, my. Bother spring cleaning. Oh, that? Hello, Mole. Hello, uh, Walter Rat. Don't seem to have seen you about before. Well, I, I don't go out very much as a rule. Prefer home life, I know. Very good thing, too, in its way. Yes, you see, I, uh, uh, this is a river, isn't it? The river? Well, I've never seen a river before. Never seen a... No. You've never... No. Well, I... Well, what have you been doing, then? Is it as nice as that? Nice? My dear young friend, believe me, it's the only thing. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about by a river. Simply messing, messing about by a river. Or in a river, or on a river, it doesn't matter which. But then, what do you do? Well, nothing. Just mess about. Oh. That's the charm of it. You're always busy, oh. and yet you never do anything in particular. Mm. And when you've done it, there's always something else to do. Oh, yes. And you can do it if you like, yes. but you'd much better not. Yes. Oh. And so you've 
never even seen a river before? Well, well, well. I'm afraid you must think me very ignorant. Oh, not at all. Naturally, not being used to it. Look here. What are you doing today? Well, I, 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 I was spring cleaning. On a day like this? Yes, you see, that's just it. Sometimes I seem to hear a voice within me say, whitewash. And then another voice says, hang whitewash. And I don't quite know which of the voice. I don't, qu- I don't. Hmm? What? Hang whitewash. <laughs> <laughs> that's yes. the spirit. Well, what I was about to suggest mm. was a trifle of lunch here on the riverbank. Ooh. And then I'd take you round and introduce you to a few of my friends. Uh, does that appeal does to you at all? Does it appeal to me? Hey? Does it appeal? Oh, my, oh, my, oh, yes. my. Oh, uh, there, there, there. You don't want to get too excited. It's only just a trifle of lunch. Cold tongue, cold ham, cold chicken, Ooh. salad, French rolls, cress sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, Ooh. bloater paste, tin peaches, meringues, Ooh. ginger beer, lemonade, milk, chocolate, oranges, nothing special. Oh, only just stop, a trifle stop. of oh, lunch. Oh, my, oh, my. Oh, what a day. <laughs> well, that's all right. You'll feel better soon. Uh, now, you just sit here on this heap of leaves. Don't go falling into the river yeah, or anything yeah, like that, yeah. and I'll be back in two minutes with oh, the luncheon basket. Mr. Oh, my, oh, what a day. very next time this happens, I shall be exceedingly angry. I've had to speak about it before, and I don't want to speak about it again. But I will not have people sitting down on me just as if I were part of the landscape. Now, who is it this time? Speak up. Oh, please, Mr. Badge, it's only me. Well, uh, if it's only you, uh, that makes a difference. I I don't want to be hard on you, uh, but I put it to you that when an animal is being particularly busy underneath a few leaves, thinking very deeply about things, giving himself up to very serious reflection, he does not want to be disturbed. And it is disturbing, my little fellow, to have somebody sitting down carelessly on your person and stretching his legs in an independent sort of way and... and Excuse me, you. Hello, wise Mr. Badger. Oh, Ratty, my dear little man, delighted to see you. I was just telling this little fellow... Oh, by the way, let me introduce you. My friend, Mr. Mole. Oh, don't mention it. Any friend of yours, Ratty. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Badger? I'm very proud to meet you, and I'm sure I'm extremely sorry... Oh, that's all right, that's all right. Any friend of Ratty's may sit down where he likes and when he likes... Oh, I'll know the reason why. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, and what are you two little fellows doing? Oh, just having a trifle of lunch. Uh, Stay and join us, won't you? Oh, do, Mr. Badger. It's a a picnic. Mm, Yes, well, picnics aren't too much in my line. Uh, We've got company coming? Well, only Mole and myself, unless Toad happens along. And it's cold tongue, cold chicken, salad, French rolls, crisp sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs. Well, if you're sure there's no company, I'll just sit here. You know, Ratty, I never did like society. I can't say I see much in it myself. Sensible animal. Uh, What about your friend, Mr Mole? Oh, I lead a very quiet life, Mr Badger. A field mouse or two drops in from time to time. Perhaps half a dozen of them will come carol singing at Christmas. Mm. But beyond that, I hardly see anybody. Oh, well, that's right, Ratty. Your little friend promises well. Uh, yes, but you're sitting on the lunch. He has the we... right Can't... ideas. Uh... How different from one whom we could mention? Toad? Oh, Toad is all right. Ah, me. Oh, I've heard of the great Mr. Toad. Must be a very nice animal. Mm, So simple, so good-natured, so affectionate. Perhaps he's not very clever. We can't all be geniuses. It may be that he is both boastful and conceited, but Mm. he has some great qualities, has Toady? If it were not for the desire to shine before his acquaintances, what a much more dependable animal Toad would be. Mm. I knew his father... I knew his grandfather. I knew his uncle, the Archdeacon. Ah, me. Cheer up, old badger. We'll take him in hand one day and make a better animal of him. Indeed, we must. It is a duty I owe to his father. You and me and our friend, the mole here, Mm -hmm. we'll take him in hand and make a better animal of him. That is, if we have any more of his nonsense. That's right, Badger. But he's a good fellow, Toady. Doesn't mean any harm, you know, just his way. What is his uh, way? Uh, You tell him, Rat. Crazes. 
He always has crazes. First it's for sailing, and then it's for punting, and then it's for astronomy, and then it's for carriage horses, and whatever it is, he always has the most expensive, and lots of them, and knows all about it, or thinks he does. And, oh, just get up a moment, please, Badger, you're sitting on the luncheon basket. I knew basket. his father. I knew his uncle. His, the, uh... what, whatever it is, he must have the best. And then in a week... He's forgotten all about it and started something else. Society. That's what's undone him. The craving to shine. It's very sad, my young friend. Very sad. I knew his grandfather. Oh, dear, dear. What his poor father would have said. Hello! Hello, Tony! I thought he'd come along soon. You see, he likes company. Ah, me. Hello, you fellows. This <laughs> is splendid. Oh. <laughs> Hello, old badger, dear old rabbit. Hello, you. <laughs> and dear old badger, how are you? So, so. Splendid, splendid. Over my friend, Mr. Mole. Oh, how are you? Splendid, well. <laughs> that's good. And old rabbit. <gasps> and. Badger! We were talking about you, my young friend. Ah, oh, well, the penalty of fame, eh, Ratty? One gets talked about, one is discussed, one is a topic of conversation, one is speculated about. <laughs> there it is, one can't help it. <laughs> well, Ratty, old man, and how are you? Uh, I'm all right. We were just going to have a trifle of lunch. You'd better join us. I say, Badger, old man, you're sitting on the lunch basket. No, I... no, no. You all come up to my house. Come up to Toad Hall. I'll give you lunch, the finest lunch you ever had. But, but, but there's cold tongue, cold ham, cold chicken, salad, french rolls, hard-boiled sandwiches, <laughs> and... <laughs> you wait till you see mine. Ratty knows, eh, Ratty? They're quite famous, been referred to in books. Another select little luncheon party, a toad hall. <laughs> oh, now, now, toad. Well... I'll get up and be moving. Oh, thank you very much, old chap. That's <laughs> right, we'll all be moving. It's only a step to Toad Hall. Jacobean residence. Um, Tudor, surely. Uh, with bits of Tudor. That's the uh, finest house on the river. You'll like it. I'm sure I shall. Well, goodbye, my young oh, friend. Goodbye. We shall meet again. And before very long, if I'm not mistaken... Goodbye, Ratty. Are you sure you won't stay to lunch? But you're coming to lunch with me, old badger. Nobody is coming to lunch with you, Toad. Uh, Many a time I have lunched at Toad Hall with your father. An animal of few words, but of what an intellect. Ah, me. How different from... I will not go into that now. Hour after hour, when lunch was cleared away, we would sit there meditating... I knew your grandfather, worthy animal that he was. Many a time have I lunched with him at Toad Hall. Little did he think, as we sat there reflecting, that one day... But I shall refer to that later. Goodbye, my unhappy young friend. Oh, we... Oh. Isn't Mr. Badger feeling very well? Poor old Badger, he gets that way sometimes. No fire, no spirit, no, no, what's the word? Oh, oh, eh, long. <laughs> well, well, we can't all have him. What about lunch? Yes, he's coming, Toad, he's coming. Now try one of these sandwiches. Oh. Uh, got the corkscrew? Oh. Good. Let me open you one of these bottles. <laughs> Sit down, Ratty, make you so yes. comfortable. Uh, have you got everything you want, Molly? Yes, thank you. That's right. Mm. Oh. 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 <laughs> well, now, Toadie, <laughs> and what have you been doing lately, eh? Boating? Haven't seen you on the river this last day or two. The river? Boating? Bah! Hmm? Silly boyish amusement. I've given that up long ago. Sheer waste of time. No, I have discovered the real thing. The only genuine occupation. And what's that? Um, help yourself, Mo. Well, no, well, well, what is mm. it? Come up to dirt all and you shall see. Oh, pass the sandwiches, Mo. There's a good fellow. <laughs> uh, seen any of the uh, wild wooders lately? No. Well, who in the wild wood? They live over there in the wild wood. We don't go there very much, we river bankers. Aren't they, aren't they very nice people over there? Uh, well, the squirrels are all right, and the rabbits, of course. But there are others, weasels and stoats and Ooh. ferrets and so on. Well, they daren't show their noses round Toad Hall, that they daren't. Pass the rags, man. There's a good fellow. 
Shh, shh, shh. Oh, there you are. I've been looking for you everywhere. Now, isn't this lucky? Just at the psycho, the psycho something moment. What's the word? Uh, encyclopedia. That is, if you ask me. Well, I didn't ask you. Betty, you know the word. Uh, introduce me to your friends, won't you? I do get so frightfully left out of it. My dear friends, Mr. Rat, Mr. Mole, this is my horse, Alfred. Oh, Pleased yeah, to yeah. meet you. <laughs> If you're coming my way, you must let me take you. Only I do like a little conversation. Encyclopedia, that was the word you wanted. So this is the latest. Absolutely the very latest. There isn't a more beautiful caravan, a more compact one, a more... Uh, oh, what's the word? Heavy. A more up-to-date one, a more... So this is the latest craze. I understand now, Moly. Boating's played out. He's tired of it. Done with it. Don't blame me. I wasn't consulted about this at all. But if I had been, I should have said boats. Stick to boats. My dear old rat, you don't understand. Mm. Boating, well, a pleasant amusement for the young. I say nothing against it, but there is real life for you in that little cart. The open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling down And the ups. Oh, uh, nobody consults me. Nobody minds what I think. Well, what do you think of it, Molly? I think it's lovely. Glad you like it. What about starting this afternoon? Uh, I beg your pardon. Did I overhear you say something about starting? Starting? That's what he said. I'm not even consulted. Come on. We'll just put the rest of the lunch inside. Come on, Molly. Use oh, the hand. Oh, oh, Ratty. Come on, Ratty, old fellow. Ratty. This is the real life for a gentleman. Talk about your old river. Come on, Molly. Give us a hand. I don't oh. talk about my river, you know I don't, Toad. <laughs> but I think about it. I think about it all the time. Well, I'll, I'll do whatever you like, Ratty. We won't go. Mm. I want to stay with you mm. and, uh, and and learn about your river. No, no, we'd better see it out now. It wouldn't be safe for him to go off by himself. It won't take long. His crazies never do. When I was young... What? It was considered bad manners to whisper and leave people out of conversation. Uh -huh. <laughs> My own view, since asked, of the climatic conditions is that the present anticyclonic disturbance... Now then, are you all ready? No. Now you get up there, Mo. Are you on the other side, Ratty. Well, would you rather... Oh, Ratty, well, I told, uh, are you going to lead him? Mm. I, I will if you like. You uh, sure you don't mind? Right, then I'll get up here. Oh, 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 oh. Now then, right to work. You mark my words, no good would come of this, but don't blame me, that's all. Don't blame me afterwards. Psychological, that was the word he wanted, not encyclopedia. I thought it seemed funny somehow. Psychological! <laughs> System spring a leak. <laughs> On Sunday morning, may his collar squeak. <laughs> may all his laces tie themselves in knots. <laughs> and may his fountain pen make frequent blots. <laughs> may he forget to wind his watch at night. <laughs> and may his dancing pumps be much too tight. <laughs> <laughs> may he always tell him where it's will be welcome by the very sound. Down with the toad.
villains! You scoundrels, you highwaymen, you, you, you road hogs, that's the word. Always come to me if you want the right word. Road hogs. You road hogs! I'll have the law of you rushing about the country at 50 miles an hour, overturning people's caravans. I'll write to all the papers about you. I'll take you through all the courts. Oh, oh Toady. How are you feeling now, Toady? Mole, come and give us a hand with yes. poor old Toad. Oh, yes. I'm afraid he's pretty bad. I said that no good would come of it, and now you see. A cataclysm. That's what the old things be. Speak to us, Toady, old man. How is it? Boop, boop. Boop, boop. Boop, boop. What's he saying? I think he thinks he's the motor car. It's all right, Mr. Toad. All right now. We'll make them sit up, Toad. We'll have the law of them. We'll get you another little cart. We'll make them pay for it. Another? Oh, thank you, thank you. Not at all. Don't mention it. Only too delighted. <laughs> Glorious, stirring sight. The poetry of motion. The real way to travel. The only way to travel. Here today, in the middle of next week, tomorrow. Oh, bliss. Oh, rapture. Oh, boop, boop. Oh, stop being an ass, Toad. And to think that I never knew all those wasted years that lie behind me. I never knew. I never even dreamt. Now, look here, Toad. Pull yourself together. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I've done with carts forever. Hoddy little carts. Common little carts. Canary colored carts. Poop, poop. <laughs> what are we to do with him? Oh, I see what it is. I recognize the symptoms. He's in the grip of a new craze. Oh, well, come along. Let's get him home. Yes, come along, Alfred. One of the most distressing cases which has come under our notice. Very sad. Very sad. Poop, poop. What's that? <laughs> pa! I, I, I said, <clears throat> Pa! And, uh, Pa! 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 What was that? <laughs> Silly of me. Just an echo. Something to do with the acoustics. Uh, listen. Red! Oh, well, perhaps it doesn't work sometimes. <laughs> Something to do with the direction of the wind. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I'll try again. <clears throat> Red! Well, come, come, come and do it. Come, come and do it, if you dare. <laughs> yes, that's all you can do, laugh. Anyone can laugh. <laughs> it's very funny, isn't it? Where are you going, Well, never no, 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 you mind where I'm going. I, I'm going to see Badger. That's where I'm going. My friend, Mr. Badger, I'm calling on my old and valued boon companion, the fierce and terrible Badger. <laughs> <laughs> Badger doesn't live here, Toad. Yeah, yes, he does. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here he is. Ah, oh, my dear Badger, how are you? <laughs> do, do, do you think so? Well, you're looking splendid yourself. I never saw you looking fiercer. I said, fiercer! This way, my dear Badger. Goodbye. Two blames and mumps to the miserable toad. Toad, toad, down with toad. Toad, toad, down with toad. Frostbite and hiccups to the miserable toad. <laughs> oh, what, what, what's that? Oh, oh, it's nothing. 
I'm not frightened. I do wish Ratty was here. He's so comforting, is Ratty. Or the brave Mr. Toad. He frightened them all away. Oh, what's that? Ratty always said, don't go into the wild wood. That's what he always said. Oh, Ratty, I do wish you were here. It's so much more friendly with two. So much more What's that? Who is it? Oh, oh. Who is it? What is it? Oh, no. Oh, rat, rat, oh, oh dear, rat. Oh, oh there, rat. there, there. Oh, rat, oh. I've been so frightened you can't sing. Oh, oh, poor old mole. Oh, what a rotten time you've had. Never mind, we'll soon be home now. How would a little mulled ale strike you oh. after you've got into slippers, of course? I made the fire up specially. Oh, you think of everything, ratty. Well, shall we start? Yeah. oh. Oh, Ratty, mm. I don't know how to tell you, and I'm afraid you'll never want me for a companion again, but I can't, I simply can't go all that way now. Tired? Aching all over. <gasps> oh, Ratty, do forgive me. I feel as if I must just sit here forever and ever and ever. And ever. Oh. I'm not, not a bit frightened now you're with me, and I, I think I want to go to sleep. Well, that's all right, but we can't stop here. Oh, no. Suppose we go and dig in that mound there and see if we can't make some sort of a shelter out of the snow and the wind yes. and have a good rest and yes. then start for home a little bit later on. Yes. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. What? Mm, how's oh, that? Oh, just as you like. Well, come on, then. Yeah. Oh, my leg. Oh, my poor sin. Oh, my eye. Oh, poor old mole. You don't seem to be having much luck today, do you? What is it? Hurt your shin? Let's have a look at it. Oh, I must have tripped over a stump or something. Oh, my, oh, my. Oh, it's a very clean cut. That was never done by a stump. Looks like the sharp edge of something metal. It's funny. Well, never mind what done it. It hurts just the same whatever done it. Wait a moment. What is it? I thought so. What is it? <laughs> Come and see. Hello, a door scraper. How very careless of somebody. Well, don't you see what it means? Well, of course, I see what it means. It means that some very forgetful person has left his door scraper lying about right in the middle of the wild wood where it's sure to trip everybody up. Oh. Somebody ought to write to him oh, about it. Oh, Mole, how stupid you are. There. Now, what's that? Well, it looks like a doormat. It is a doormat. And what does that tell you? Nothing, Rat. Absolutely nothing. Who ever heard of a doormat telling anybody anything? They simply don't do it. They're not that sort. Hmm. They... Well, what have you found now? Oh, there. What do you read there? Oh, wait a minute. Mr. Badger. Hmm? Do not disturb until Easter Saturday. Oh, Rat. What do you think of that? Rat, you're a wonder, that's what you are. I see it all now. You argued it out step by step from the moment when I fell and cut my shin and you looked at the cut and your majestic mind said to itself, door scraper. <laughs> and did it stop there? No, your powerful brain went on working. It said to itself... Y yes, yes, but now let's... Uh, get... Your powerful brain well... said to itself, where is a scraper? <laughs> there must be a mat. <laughs> Yes, quite so, quite so. Now, we must get on. Come on, Mole. I have noticed before, said the wise Mr. Rat, that where there's a scraper, there must be a mat. <laughs> and did you stop there? Mm. No, your intellect still went on working. It said grandly to itself, where there's a doormat, yes. there must be... A door. Exactly. And now that we've found it... Said I, the wise Mr. Rat, I have noticed before that where there's a door, man, there must be a door. You know, Rat, you're simply wasted here amongst us fellows. Only I had your head. Yes, but as you haven't, uh, I suppose you're going to sit on that snow and talk all night. Uh, now wake up a bit and hang on to this bell pull while I hammer. All right. Now oh, come on, Mole. Said the wise Mr. Rat, I have often heard tell 
that where there's a bell pull, well, there must be a bell. Yeah, what? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Yes, a bell. Of course. Yes, a bell. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. What is it? Who is it? Speak up. Hello, Badger. It's me, Rat, and my friend Mole. Oh. And we've lost our way in the snow, oh, and my. Mole's that tired you never did. Oh, my. Oh, well, well. Rat and his friend oh. Mole. Oh. Well, come along oh. in, both of you, at once. Oh. Why, you must oh. be perished. Yes, yes, well, yeah. I'm never lost in the snow. <laughs> yeah, and dear. your friend that tired. Oh, oh, yes. oh well, oh, well. Oh. And in the wild wood at this time of night? Oh. No. What will you do first? Toast your toes a bit? <laughs> uh, I was uh, just glancing at the paper. <laughs> or supper now and Ooh. toast your toes afterwards. <sighs> it's all ready. I, I was expecting one or two friends might drop in. Oh, I think I should like supper at once, please, Mr. Badger. That's right, Mole. Sensible animal. Um, uh, what about you, Rat? Well, just as you like. Mm. Fine old place this, isn't it, Mole? What? Oh, no, grand. Mama. Won't your friend try some of those pickles? Oh, well, try nice. a pickle, Mole? Yes, very nice. Well, oh, thank you. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> I've been wanting to see you, fellows, because I've heard very grave reports of our mutual friend, Toad. Oh, Toad. Tut, tut, tut. Oh, Toad. Tut, tut, tut. Mm. Is his case as hopeless as one has heard? Going from bad to worse. That's all you can say about him, isn't it, Mole? Mm. Well, Paul. Mm. Here's another smash-up only last week, and a bad one. How many has he had? Cars or smashes? Oh, well, same thing with Toad, really. The last was the seventh. Alas, alas. I knew his father. I knew his grandfather. Many's the time. <laughs> alas. Poor, witless animal. I see you really ought to try some of this beef, Ratchet. Oh, no, thanks, really. I don't know when I've tasted better. Look, oughtn't mm. we to do something, Badger? We're his friends. Yes, you're right. The hour has come. Yeah, well, yeah. What hour? Uh, whose hour, you should say, Mo? Toad's hour, the hour of Toad. Oh, well, well mm. done, Badger. Well, teach him to be a sensible Toad. We'll rescue the poor unhappy animal. We'll convert him. He'll be the most converted toad that ever was before we finish with him. Mm. Now, the first step is to get him here and reason with him. You know how it is in the present weather. I don't go about much, naturally. Of course. Oh, no. Of course. But once Toad is here... Then how to get him? That's the problem. Let us apply our minds to it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. What? Mm. Who What's ever's that? that? I say you ought to try some of this beef. Oh, Toadie, whatever's the matter? Another accident? Well, what's happened? Wild wooders? <laughs> an, an unfortunate breakdown in my car. A, a, a loose nut, some trifling mishap. Left me stranded at the edge of the wood, far from home. Oh, yes. I, I bethought me of my good friend Badger. He would lend me a sleeping suit and put me up for the night. <laughs> well, um, as I came whistling through the wood... Yes, yes. Wrecking not of danger, I was suddenly seized upon by a gang of rascally ferrets. Oh, I, I set about them lighteheartedly. Ching, 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 clang, yes, ching, ching, yes. ching. At the most, there was uh, no more than a dozen of them, when suddenly, uh, to my horror, uh, they were reinforced by a posse of scoundrelly weasels. Oh, I see. It was then, Ratty and my dear friend Mole, mm. that I wished I had your assistance. Twelve of the rascals, yes! Is. But a dozen of them is a different matter. If only you and Mo could have taken a couple of them mm. off my hands, there might have been a different story to tell. Ching, 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 yeah. clang, ching, oh, ching. Yes. As it was, a rear guard action was forced upon me. A step by step, ching, ching, clang, clang, step by step, Ooh, ching, clang, ching, clang, step by step, step. Yeah. Uh, step uh, I... Won't you sit down again, Toad? Oh. <laughs> 
Thank you. <laughs> the moment has come, I think, don't you? Yes, I think so. Uh, you agree? Yes. I say, you fellow, what is all this? Toad. Uh, I knew your father, worthy animal that he was. I knew your grandfather. It was also my privilege to be slightly acquainted with your uncle, the Archdeacon. Of that I shall speak further directly. Oh. The question I wish to ask you now is this. At the beginning of the breathless story of adventure to which we have just been listening, you mentioned a motor car. Boop, boop. You implied further that this motor car had suddenly lost its efficiency. Am I right in supposing that just at this moment your narrative hovered for an instant on the confines of truth? What do you mean? Oh, really, Toad? He couldn't have put it more plainly. I asked you, Toad, if it is indeed a fact that your eighth motor car is now in as fragmentary a condition as the previous seven. <laughs> I had a little accident. Thank you. I think that in that case we may begin the treatment. Yes, I think uh, so. You agree? Yes. Say, you fellows, what is all this? Now then, Toad. You've disregarded all the warnings we've given you. You've gone on squandering the money your father left you and you're getting us animals a bad name in the district by your furious driving and your smashes and your rows with the police. We have decided, my friend Ratty here and Mole and I that it is time we saved you from yourself. I am going to make one more effort to bring you to reason. You will come with me into my study and there you will hear some facts about yourself. I say the study because on second thoughts I have decided for the sake of your revered grandfather to spare you the pain of a public reproof. Yes, Badger. Thank you, Badger. Well, that's no good. Talking to Toad will never cure him. He'll say anything. Yes. We must do something. Mm. Yes, yes. What's the matter, old fellow? You seem melancholy. <laughs> Too much beef? No, Ratty, it isn't that. It was just... Oh, never mind. I spill right directly. Why, whatever is it? Oh, nothing, Ratty, nothing. I was just admiring Badger's great big house and comparing it with my own little home, which, which, which I haven't seen lately. I should be better soon. You don't know what you must think of me. Oh, poor old Mole. Been rather an exciting day, hasn't it? And then the same sort of pickles. Tell me about Mole End. We might go and pay it a visit tomorrow if you've nothing better to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, oh. Hmm? Wouldn't be fine enough for you, Ratty. Oh. You're used to great big places and fine houses. I noticed directly you, we came in how you stood with your back to the fire so grandly and easily, just as though there was nothing to you. Well, you tucked into the beef, old chap. Yeah, uh, did I? Rather. Made yourself quite at home. I said to myself at once, Mole is used to going out, I said. Ooh. Weekend parties at big country houses, I said. That's nothing to Mole, I did, said. Did, did you really, Ratty? Oh, rather. Spotted it at once. Well, of course, there were features about Mole Inn which made it rather a... Uh, rather... Uh, rather uh, a feature. Rather, yes. Mm. Uh, yes, the statues. I picked up some statues here and there. <laughs> You'd hardly think how it livened up the place. <laughs> There was, uh, there was Garibaldi and the infant Samuel and Queen Victoria and other Italian heroes dotted about in odd corners. It, it, it had a very pleasing effect, my friends used to tell oh, me. Oh, I should like to have seen that, Mole. I should indeed. That must have been very striking. Yes, and it was just about now that they used to come carol singing. Well, Garibaldi and the others? Yes. No, 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 the field mice, yes. Oh, yes, of course, yes. Quite an institution they were. They never passed me over. They always came to Mole End last. And I used to give them hot drinks and supper sometimes, well, when I could afford it. Yes. Yes, I remember now hearing about it. And what a fine place Mole End was. Did you really, mm, Yes. Because it, it wasn't very big. It, well, between ourselves, I don't much care about these big places. Cosy and tasteful. That's what I always heard about Mole End. Oh, Ratty, you are a good friend. I like being with you. Good old Mole. <laughs> oh. Sit down there, Toad. Oh. My friends, 
I am pleased to inform you that Toad has at last seen the error of his ways. He is truly sorry for his misguided conduct in the past, and he has undertaken to give up motor cars entirely and forever in the future. I have his solemn promise to that effect. Oh, Toadie, I am glad. Mm, well, there is only one thing which remains to be done. Toad, I want you solemnly to repeat before your friends here what you fully admitted to me in the study just now. First, you are sorry for what you have done and see the folly of it all. No, I'm not sorry. But it wasn't no. folly at all. It was simply glorious. Oh, oh, yes. oh, I thought so. You backsliding animal. Didn't you tell me just now in there? Oh, yes, it's in there. I'd have said it anything in there. You're so eloquent, dear Badger, and so moving. And so convincing, and put all your points so frightfully well. You can do what you like with me in there, but thinking it over out here, I see that I'm not a bit sorry, really. So it's no earthly good saying I am now, is it? Oh, 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 oh. Then you don't promise never to touch a motor car again? Well, of course I don't. On the contrary, I faithfully promise the very first motor car I see, off I go in it. Boop, boop, oh, boom, there boom, you are, Molly. I told boom, you so. Very well, then. Since you won't yield to persuasion, we'll try what force can do. Oh. I feared it would come to this all along. You'll stay with me, Toad, until a cure has been effected. My friends, Rat mm. and Mole, will also stay with me and help me to look after you. Mm. It's going to be a tedious business, but we will see it out. Yes, indeed. Boop, boop. Boop, boop. Boop, boop. Hello, you fellows. N not off yet? Just going. Toad's quiet now, but uh, keep an eye on him. Yes. I don't trust him. That's all right. I believe he's worse than Badger think. Huh? Look after him well, poor old Toad. That's all right. Mm. Coming, Mole. He's coming. Coming. Goodbye. Goodbye, Toad. Goodbye, dear old Mole. Oh, what a morning. I don't think I ever remember such a morning. When I was young, we always had mornings like this. Now, old boy, we're going to have a jolly morning together. So jump up and I'll do my best to amuse you. Oh, dear kind rat, how little you realise my condition <laughs> and how very far I am from jumping up now, if ever. But don't, don't trouble about me. I hate being a burden to my friends, and I don't expect to be one much longer. Well, I hope not, too. You've been a fine bother to us all this time. You have really, Toad. Weeks and weeks. And now, in weather like this, and the boating season just beginning, oh, it's too bad of you. I'm a nuisance to my friends. I know, I know. I was thinking about my river yesterday evening, and yes. I, I wrote a little poem. Yeah. Do you think you'd like to hear it? Well... As you will, my dear Ratty. It may comfort my last eyes. It, it's about the ducks. I used to have such fun with them, you know. You know when they stand on their heads suddenly? Well, then I dive down and tickle their necks and they come up all spluttering and angry and shaking their feathers at me. Of course, they aren't angry, really, because it's all fun. And then I used to sit on the bank in the sun and pretend I was coming in after them again. <laughs> ducks ditty. <laughs> Along the backwater through the rushes tall Ducks are a-dabbling up tails all Ducks' tails, drakes' tails, yellow feet a-quiver Yellow bills all out of sight, busy in the river Everyone for what he likes, we like to be Heads down, tails up, dabbling free High in the blue above, swift swirl and call We are down a-dabbling up tails all Thank you. I'm glad to have heard it. Ratty. Ratty? <laughs> oh, yes? I, I wonder if I could bother you, but no, 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 no. You've been too kind already. Oh, why, what is it? You know we'd do anything for you, all of us. Then could I beg you for the last time, probably, to step round to the village as quickly as possible. <laughs> <coughs> Even now it may be too late and fetch the doctor. But... What do you want a doctor for? Oh, surely you've noticed. But no, 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 no. Why should you forget that I asked? Naturally, you want to go on with your poetry. Have you... Have you ever done anything in the way of 
Epitaph. Ep Look here, old man, of course I'll fetch a doctor to you if you really want one, but it hasn't come to that yet. You're imagining. <laughs> now, let's talk about something more cheerful. I fear, dear friend, the talk can do little in a case like this, or, mm. or doctors either, for that matter. Oh. And by the way, yes. by the way in the village, yes. would you mind asking my lawyer to step up? Your lawyer? Oh, he must be bad. All right, Toad, I'll go. Thank you. I'll bring the doctor and the lawyer, and we'll be back as quickly as we can. You're a good fellow, Rat. It's goodbye, old boy. Keep your spirits up. Goodbye. <sighs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Smart piece of work, that. Brain against brute force and brain came out on the top. It's bound to. Poor old ratty. Oh, oh, oh. Won't he catch it when Badger gets back? The world has held great heroes, as history books have shown. But never a name to go down to fame compared with that of two. One judge. Yes, yes. Twelve jury. Go, go. Quack, quack. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. One policeman witness. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> Here. Now, don't you go moving or you muddle me. One policeman witness and one prisoner. Hello, that's funny. Where's the prisoner? Oh. Well, I know I brought him in, Mr. Usher. Oh. Toad, where are you? Here I am. Oh. Oh. What are you doing there? Come down out of it. That's where his lordship sits. Oh, I thought this was where the prisoners went. Yeah, what a cheat. Silence! Silence for his lordship! Silence! 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 Stop saying silence! Stop saying silence! Stop saying silence! Oh, worse than ever! Try them with a hush, Mr. Hasher. Hush! Yes. Well, please understand once and for all that unless I have complete and utter hush, it will be impossible for the prisoner to be tried. I don't want to be tried. Impossible for him to be tried, but not impossible for him to be severely sentenced. Alack, alack, oh, hapless toe. That was fun, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. The judge will deliver his usual song to the jury. <laughs> if an animal errs or a citizen sins, whether rabbit or weasel or ferret, he is certain as soon as the trial begins that I'll polish him off with celerity. <laughs> and I always come down like a cartload of bricks. On toads, on toads and their tricks. <laughs> my methods are quick and my eyes on the clock to avoid the delay which a jury hates. Especially so in a toads in the dock. For there's something in toads which infuriates. So I always come down like a truckload of coal. On toads, on toads in a hole, toads in a hole. <laughs> Friends and fellow citizens, we see before us, cowering in the dark, one of the most notorious and hardened malefactors of our time, the indigenous Toad. I'm not indigenous. Well, if you're not, you very soon will be. <laughs> we see before us, I say, this monster of iniquity. And it is our duty to try him fairly and without prejudice and to sentence him to the very sharpest term of imprisonment that we can think of so as to learn him not to do it again. We shall then adjourn for lunch. <laughs> so, I proceed to the charge. The counts against the prisoner are as follows. Oh. Is that all? By the way, is the jury all present? I particularly want the jury to hear this. Just call them out and see. Certainly, my lord. Mr. Turkey. Gobble, gobble. Mr. Duck. Quack, quack. Four squirrels. Yeah. Six rabbits. Yeah. I object. Oh. What's the matter? Who is it? What? What? Ah, ah. 
Ratty, my little friend. Is it you? I'm delighted to see you. If you'll just wait until I have got this ruffian off my hands, we can have a little talk. What about lunching with me? <laughs> Go on, please, Mr. Usher. Six rabbits. Yeah. I object, my lord. Object? One of the rabbits is a weasel. I'm not. I'm a rabbit. He is a weasel. Oh, dear, dear. The difference of opinion. Mr. Mr. Usher, uh, what are we to do? What, uh, what does one do? He says he's a rabbit, my lord, and he ought to know. Oh, well, there's something in that. You can't make a mistake about a thing of that sort. He is a weasel. I'm not. That proves it. Why should you say you aren't if you aren't? But of course he says he aren't if he aren't. I mean, if he aren't, then he aren't. So naturally he says he aren't. But he wouldn't say he wasn't if he wasn't. The other rabbits didn't say they wasn't. Why didn't they say they wasn't? Because they aren't. Just make a note that I shall want a glass of iced water if this goes on. Of course, if you aren't, you don't say you aren't. But if you weren't, you would say you were. But you wouldn't say you aren't if you weren't. And on the other hand, if you aren't, I... I, I mm, mm, mm. I think we'd better begin this trial all over again. Yes, my lord, much the best way. Uh, you can tell me your objections afterwards when we have this desperate ruffian safely lodged in a dungeon. He's a weasel, I know he's a weasel. You can see he's a weasel. It isn't fair. There, there, there. We'll talk about it calmly at lunch. But I'm one. Nice saddle of mutton and red currant jelly. Ooh. It's a, it's a shame. That's what it is, when everybody knows what the weasels are. I'm a rabbit, aren't no. I a rabbit? Say I'm a rabbit, quick. Yes, yes, yes. There you are. Naturally, there are lots of different kinds of rabbit. And I'm one of the different kinds. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're yes, not. I am. You're yes. Yes. you brat. Ratty, for my sake. Now then, Mr. Usher, all over again. Mr. Turkey. Gobble, gobble. Mr. Duck. Quack, quack. Four squirrels. Yeah. Five ordinary rabbits. Yeah. One different kind of rabbit. Yeah. That's the lot, my lad. Uh, what about me? What is this? One Alfred. Yeah. Lead it out, Constable. Very well, sir. All right, all right. I only just look in. No history to call. That's what's the matter with them all. No history to call. <laughs> now then, we haven't too much time. The accounts against the prisoner are as follows. First, that he did maliciously steal a valuable motor car without so much as a with your leave or a by your leave. Second, that being in the said motor car, he did drive recklessly and to the common danger. Third, that on being apprehended, he was guilty of gross impertinence to the rural police. And now then, Toad, what have you got to say about all that? I wasn't driving recklessly. I was just going along quietly at about 70 miles an hour. Oh, I saw a policeman in front of me. Naturally, I quickened up to see if he wanted anything. Same as anyone else would have done who's fond of policemen. Recklessly and to the common danger. Oh, rubbish. And what did you call me, eh? Now, how can I remember? Um, officer? Constable? Sergeant? No, you didn't. And now we're getting at it. What did he call you? Fat face. Oh, 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 this oh, is... Terrible! This had years to my life. You mean to tell me that this ruffian, this incorrigible rogue, who I'm about to sentence to a severe term of penal servitude, had the audacity to call a representative of the law, fat face? Oh, Tony! Lackalacko, hapless animal! Fat face? Did I hear right? Fat face? We don't want to make a song about it. I told you what he called me, and that's what he called me. Fat face. I didn't mean him any more than anyone else. I just murmured the expression to myself. It's a way I have. I'm that sort of person. He admits he has passed the expression fat face, me lud, and that's good enough for any ordinary jury. Speaking as a special kind of rabbit, I say that it's good enough for me. Weasel! Shut up! Very well. We have the prisoner condemned out of his own mouth using the most frightful cheek to a member of the rural police. We shall now sentence him severely. <laughs> Wait a bit, my lord. There's that little matter of stealing a valuable motor car without so much as a with your leave or a by your leave. Well, does it matter? I mean, compared with this unspeakable impertinence to which the prisoner has already confessed. Well, it adds more to the sentence like that. Ah. 
Ah, well, in that case, we must certainly go into the matter. Well, Toad, what have you got to say about that? Oh, oh, oh well, I, 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 I didn't mean to steal it. It was this way. I was just having a bit of lunch at an inn when I heard outside... Boop, boop. Boop, boop. You heard what? Boop, boop. Boop, boop. Imitation of motor car. Oh. Poop, poop. Poop, poop. Poop. No, I don't seem to get it. Oh. Well, then, uh, two gentlemen uh, came into lunch, and as soon as I'd finished mine, I went outside to look at their car. I thought there couldn't be any harm, only just uh, looking at it, so I looked at it. And then, naturally, I began to say to myself, I wonder if this car starts easily. So I wound it up uh, just to see. <laughs> And then, naturally, I stepped into the driver's seat just as I always do. And then, I saw a policeman with a very fat, with a very nice expression, a very, very handsome policeman. And he said, You're going at 170 miles an hour. And I said, Of course, if you say so, dear, Mr. Policeman. And then, All this makes it worse, doesn't it? Much worse. Yes, I thought so. So it means we can give him a stiffer sentence? A much stiffer one. Good. You were saying to... <clears throat> May I say a few words oh, now, oh, my lord? Who is this? Mr. Badger, a well-known and highly respected member of the community. Oh, so it is, so it is. Well, Mr. Badger... Alack, alack, oh, hapless toad, oh, ill-fated animal... Is it a recitation? I knew his father. I knew his grandfather. I knew his uncle, the archdeacon. Oh, this makes it very serious indeed. Many an afternoon have I spent in communion with his father at Toad Hall, oh. one of the most attractive riverside residences, with carriage sweep. Dear, dear, with carriage sweep, you say? Unhappy day. Oh, feckless Toad. Oh, rash and ill-advised animal. Mm. Oh, most interesting. We are all indebted to Mr. Badger for his profound and helpful observations. <clears throat> now, I think we can proceed to business. Guilty! Cause he's guilty! What? Mr. Usher, will you please tell us what is the very stiffest penalty we can impose for each of the three offences for which the prisoner stands convicted? Without, of course, giving him the benefit of the doubt, because there isn't any. Well, my lad, some people would consider that stealing a valuable motor car was the worst offence. Yes, indeed. And so it is. Mm -hmm. But cheeking the police oh. carries the severest penalty. And so it should. And so it ought. And yes. Suppose you were to say yes. a year for the theft, uh, yeah. which is mild, mm -hmm. three years for the furious driving, mm -hmm. which is lenient, and yes. 15 years for the cheat, which is purely nominal. Yes. Those figures, if added together correctly, tot up to 19 years. That's right! So you'd better make it around 20 and be on the safe side. Yes. Well, I don't mind if it isn't quite right. Say it! An excellent suggestion, Mr. Usher. Now, prisoner, pull yourself together and try and stand up straight. It's going to be 20 years for you this time. And mind, if you appear before us again on any charge, whatever, we shall have to deal with you very seriously. Yeah, yeah. Shut up. 20 years! Don't forget... Now then, prisoner, before the rest of us adjourn for lunch, is there anything you would like to say in the nature of a farewell speech? Any last words or valedictory utterances? Well, yes, I had something. Well, well what is it? Well, I'm, I'm very sorry, but... <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Fat face! Oh, fat face! Me! All of you! All a whole lot of you! Oh, 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 well, oh, oh, the ungrateful things to say. I am the great, the magnificent, the incomprehensible Toad. Oh, oh, Toady boasting again. To call me after all I've done for him. Fat face. The omnipotent Toad. <laughs> the world has held great heroes, as history books have showed. 
but never a name to go down to fame compared with that of Joe. Cast him into the dungeon! The queen and the ladies in waiting sat in the window and sewed. She cried, look who's that handsome man. They answered, Mr. Toad, Mr. Toad, head face, oh, 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 Mr. Toad. Oh, 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 oh. Good morning, woman. Did you sleep well? Sleep well. How could I sleep well? Immured in a dark and noise dungeon like this. Well, some do. Look, I brought your breakfast. Uh, yeah. Then you'll oblige me by taking it away again. Oh, cheer up. There's always hope. Hope? <laughs> How can I hope ever to be set at large again? Who have been imprisoned so justly for stealing so, so handsome a motor car? in such an audacious manner and for such lurid and imaginative cheek bestowed upon such a red, fat-faced policeman. Well, there is that, of course. <laughs> oh, oh, but stupid animal that I was, now I must languish in this dungeon. Oh, unhappy and forsaken toad. Nice hot butter toast. Oh, too. despairing. What? Did you say hot butter toast? I made it myself and my father oh. said... Here's the key of number 87, he said, and you can take him his breakfast. He's the most notorious, dangerous animal in the country, <laughs> said Father. And how we shall keep him under lock and key, goodness only knows. Did he say that? His very <laughs> words. And you can take him a couple of old crusts for his breakfast, said my father, because I must starve and break his indomitable spirit, otherwise he'll get the better of me. <laughs> well, of course, one has one's reputation. So I said, yes, Father. And as soon as his back was turned, I said to myself, what a shame. And I made this nice hot butter toast. Mm. Any prisoners ever been known to escape from this castle? Huh? Never. Mm. Well, I must see what I can do. I must give my mind to it uh, one day. Excellent hot butter toast, this. I've been giving my mind to it lately. Mm, that's the only way to make really good toast. No, I didn't mean that. I meant to escaping. I think I see a way in which you might do it. You're going to help me? Yes. I have an aunt who's a washerwoman. Oh, there, there, never mind. Think no more about it. I have several aunts who ought to be washerwomen. Ah, do be quiet a minute, Toad. You know, you talk too much. That's your trouble. Oh. Now, my aunt does the washing for all the prisoners in the castle. Yeah. Well, naturally, we keep anything like that in the family. Well, of course. You know. She brings the washing back of a Friday morning. Well, that's today. Yes. Now, you're very rich, or at least you're always telling me so. <laughs> And for a few pounds, I think I could persuade her to lend you her dress and bonnet and so on, and you could yes. escape as the castle washerwoman. Oh, You're very much alike in some ways, particularly about the vicar. We are not. I have a very elegant figure for what I am. So is my aunt for what she is. You have it your own way. You horrid, proud, ungrateful oh. animal. When I'm trying to help no, you, no, no, I no, suppose no. you want to go off in a coach and car. No, 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 please, please, you are a good, kind, clever girl. And I am indeed a proud and stupid toad. Introduce me to your worthy aunt. If you'll be so kind, it'd be a privilege to meet her. Mm, that's better. With a little trouble, you'd make quite a nice toad. <laughs> This is Mr. Toad, my aunt. Good morning. Good morning, dear lady. Charming weather we're having, are we not? Blessed dine. Your niece tells me that you attend to the, um, that is, you have under your charge the, uh, the habiliments, the more the, uh, mutable habiliments of the inhabitants of the castle. Delightful profession, I'm sure. Is this the one? Yes. I watch. So do I, every other day. I, I told you the idea, didn't I, aunt? Is that the money? Well, just a little. I, I haven't counted it. I have. Oh. Here you are. 
Here's the clothes. <laughs> My dear lady, I am eternally <laughs> your debtor. <laughs> uh, should you ever find yourself in the neighborhood of Toad Hall, a visit whether professional or social, uh, now how, how do we get into the... Oh, here, I'll help you. You told him the condition. Oh, condition. My aunt thinks she ought to be gagged and bound so as to look as if she'd been overcome. And you'd like it too, because you wanted to leave the castle in style. An excellent idea. So much more in keeping with my character. <laughs> I brought a bit of rope along in case like... Got an handkerchief. Of course I got an handkerchief. Then you gags me first. Oh. Help. What? Help. 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 Help! Um, silence, woman! Else I gag thee! Help! 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 Thou hast brought it on thyself! Help! A little tighter, I tell you! A marine on my cackling tongue! Oh, thou marine! Now then, Phoebe, let us ahead with this robe! Oh, how brave you are! Oh, 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 a neat bit of work! Mm. Ah. Uh, now then, how do I get into this? Oh, no, silly, not like that. No. Here, here, give it to me. Mm-hmm. Give it to me. Now, a curtain. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, a shawl. <laughs> <laughs> now, the bonnet. Oh. oh, well, upon my word, you're the very living image of her. Oh, oh. What's the matter with her? She wants to say something, I think. <laughs> Too ugly. Here, give me the gag. Oh, good. Now then, Toad, we must hurry. I'll take you to the end of the corridor, and then you go straight down the stairs. And if any of the jailers stop you and chaff you a bit, because she's very popular, Aunt oh, I shouldn't have thought it. Now, goodbye and good luck. Goodbye. And don't forget, you're a washerwoman. Oh, 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 What was that? That's funny. That sounded like Toad's voice. <laughs> yes, if Toad had been anywhere but where he is, poor unfortunate animal, I should have said... <laughs> it is! It's Toady outside in the river! You in the hand, Ralph! I'm a bad <laughs> Oh, Toad! Toad, but this is... What's the matter? No strength left. I know. <laughs> But however, however... You, you'll have to pull me in. I'm about to... Yes, right. Count. Oh. Oh. There. Oh. 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 Poor old Toady. And as wet as wet. Hmm. And am I wrong? Or are you disguised in parts as a washerwoman who's seen better days? <laughs> That's more like you. Escaped, eh? In disguise. That's much better. We'll soon have you all right. Oh, my dear Ratty, the times I've been through since I saw you last, you simply can't think. Yes, well, when you've got those horrible things off and cleaned yourself up a bit... The times, you... the trials, such sufferings and also nobly born. Yes, you'll find some dry clothes upstairs. Such escapes, such disguises, such subterfuges, all so cleverly planned and carried out. Yes, right, so well. <laughs> Both in prison, I got out of it, of course, stole a horse, rode away on it, humbugged everybody, made him do exactly what I wanted. Oh, I am a smart toad and no mistake. Oh, oh, oh. Now, what do you think my very last exploit was? I don't know, Toad. Now, just stop swaggering oh. and be off and change your clothes. Badger and mole being directly. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. The mole and the badger. Hey, what's become of them? The dear, dear fellows. I'd forgotten all about it. Well, may you ask. Why, what? You'll hear in good time. Badger himself may prefer to break the news to you. Now, be off and prepare yourself. Ah. Yeah. Why, what's the matter? I say, hmm? is this mirror of yours working? Well, of course. Why? Well, well I, I hoped... You, you see, it's the first time I've seen myself. No, no, you're quite right, Ratty. Nobody could carry off a costume like this. Uh, I, I'll go and change. <laughs> Toad was a-wallowing. Do you know? Hello, here you are, I say. What do you think? Toad's back. Toad back? Where? Here. Where? Cleaning. You ought to have seen him, Mole. He'd have made you laugh. Unhappy animal. <laughs> he escaped. Mm, so he says, but you know what Toad is. I would speak with him. He's just having a wash. This is no time for washing. We have work before us tonight, hard fighting. Washing can wait. 
Where do you think I should have been if at the crisis of my life I had stopped to wash? Well, uh, Where would my revered father have been yes. if he had put soap before strategy? Well, Where would my beloved grandfather? Yes, uh, so there, oh, Mole, oh, oh, thank hello. you, Mole. Yes, I heard all about his beloved grandfather this morning, most in. <laughs> hello, you fellows. So oh, oh. Welcome home, Toad. Alas, what am I saying? Home, indeed. This is a poor homecoming, unhappy Toad. What? What's the matter? Oh, Toadie, haven't you heard? Heard what? Well, this Toad and the Weasel. The Wild Wooders. Have they been and gone? And taken Toad all. Been living there ever since. Yes, going on simply anyhow. Lying in bed half the day. Breakfast at all hours. Yes, beating your grub and drinking your drink. Making bad jokes about you, singing vulgar songs. About, uh, About... About, well, about prisons and magistrates and policemen. Horrid personal songs and no humour in them. Mm, That's what's happened, Toad. No one presenting it hasn't. Mm, And and they're all telling everybody that they've come to stay for good. Oh, hell. They are. I'll jolly soon see about that. Yes, but how? Well, 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 now, uh, well what I shall do... Well, of course, what you ought to do... No, you ought to do nothing of this sort. Well, of course, he... Well, I know the best I've been offered about right enough. This is my house. Just a moment. Just a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. Be quiet, all of you. Toad. Yes, Badger. When you got into trouble a short time ago and brought disgrace upon your own name and shame and sorrow upon your friends, I resolved that on your return from your enforced seclusion, I would take the first opportunity of pointing out to you the folly of your ways. Yes, Badger. Thank you, Badger. I even went so far as to jot down a few rough notes on the subject. Uh, uh, where are they, Rat? Oh, here you are. Ah, thank you. To make suet dumplings... Oh, it, so... it, it's the other side. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, here we are. I'd rather have that bit about the dumplings if it's all the same to me. <clears throat> One, conceit and its consequences. Two, reverend uncle, grief of. Three, toad, wither, tending. But the moment for all this is past. Oh, well, just as you like that, old man. <clears throat> now... I'm going to tell you a great secret. We are too few to attack from the front, but there is an underground passage that leads from the riverbank right up into the middle of Toad Hall. Oh, nonsense, Badger. I know every inch of Toad Hall, inside and out. You've been listening to gossip. That's what you've been Right up into the middle of Toad Hall. When your father, who was a particular friend of mine, told me about it, he said, Don't tell my son. He means well, he said, but he's very light and irresponsible in his character, he said, and simply cannot hold his tongue. <laughs> this, this passage, how shall we use it? Tonight the chief weasel is giving a banquet. It's his birthday. While they are all feasting, careless of the morrow, we four, armed to the teeth, will creep silently by way of the passage into the butler's pantry. Oh, yes, that squeaky board in the butler's pantry. Arm to the teeth, you and Rat by one door. Yes, Badger. And me and Mole by the other. Yes, Badger. Also armed to the teeth, we shall... Creep out of the pantry. With our pistols and swords and sticks. And rush in on them. And whack them and whack them and whack them and whack them. Exactly. You've caught the spirit of it perfectly. Good, Toad. I'll learn them to steal my house. Teach them, Toad, not learn them. But we don't want to teach them. Toad's quite right. We want to learn them, and what's more, we're going to. When night comes on, and the owls are hooting, and rabbits back to their holes are scooting, and weasels wearing his evening suiting, a walloping we will go, a walloping we will go. A walloping we will go We'll take off our braces and take off our coats And learn the weasels and ferrets and stoats Who said so? Rat says so Mole says so Toad says so Badger says so We'll take off our braces and take off our coats And talk to the weasels and ferrets and stoats I haven't got any braces Oh Mole hasn't got any braces. Toad will lend him a pair of embroidered silk braces. Oh. We'll take off our braces and take off our coats and wallop the weasels and ferrets and stoats. We'll take off our braces and take off our coats and wallop the weasels and ferrets and stoats. And one of the weasels and ferrets and stones. When night comes on and the bats are betting 
And rabbits back in the holes are chatting. And weasels wearing his opera hatting. A walloping we will go. A walloping we will go. A walloping we will go. We'll take off our collars and take off our coats and learn the weasels and ferrets and stoats. Who said so? Rat says so. Mole says so. Toad says so. Better says so. We'll take off our collars and take off our coats and talk to the weasels and ferrets and stoats. I haven't got any collar. <laughs> Mole hasn't got any collar. No. Rat will lend him a nice clean. Oh. Fairly clean collar. Oh. We'll take off our braces and collars and coats and wallop the weasels and ferrets and stoats. We'll take off our braces and collars and coats and wallop the weasels and ferrets and stoats. And wallop the weasels and ferrets and stoats. Badger, 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 badger says so. I say so. Now then, to rest, all of you, we start at nine o'clock for the secret passage, and we must be fresh for it. <laughs> Friends and fellow animals, before we part this evening, I have one final toast to propose. It is a toast which on all occasions has something of solemnity in it, something even of sadness, but never more so than on this occasion. Absent friends. Absent friends. With this toast, I couple first the name of our kind host, Mr. Toad. <laughs> it is a personal sorrow to every one of us that he is not among us tonight. Aww. Let me sing you a little song which I have composed on the subject. Toad, he went a pleasuring gaily down the road. They put him in prison for 20 years. Poor old Toad. Poor old Toad. Poor old Toad. They put him in prison for 20 years. Poor old Toad. <laughs> Toad, he had a beautiful house and most refined of it. They put him in prison for 50 years. Poor old Toad. Poor old Toad. Poor old Toad. They put him in prison for 50 years. Poor old Toad. <laughs> He had much money and good, carefully bestowed. They put him in prison for 90 years. Poor old Toad. Poor old Toad. Poor old Toad. They put him in prison for 90 years. Poor old Toad. Poor old Toad. thinking of our good host, Mr. Toad, we must not forget our other absent friends, Mr. Badger, Mr. Rat, and Mr. Moon. <laughs> Fellow animals, I give you the toast, absent friends. Absent friends. Absent friends. What's that? <laughs> Up the badger! Good evening.
evening, you ferret. Do you sing at all? Uh, no, 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 sir, please, sir. Not just a little song. No, 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 sir. I never, no, 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 singing. Not just a funny little song about a poor old toad. No, 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 sir. Well, try. Go on, try, try. Poor old toad. I'll learn you to sing it over there. They're all prisoners here, toad. I'm looking after them. There, that's the lot. Oh, pity, I was just beginning to enjoy it. <laughs> uh, what about your little party of rats? Uh, they're surrendered. I thought they might come in useful, waiting on us and so on. Well, if any of them wants to go on for a bit longer... <laughs> ah, now then, Toad, stir your stumps, look lively. I want some grub, I do. We've got your house back for you. You don't offer us so much as a sandwich. Uh, just a moment, Badger. What about the sentries? Sentries, well, yes. They may still be at their posts. Sentries? Oh, they've run away far enough by now, haven't they, Moly? Oh, is that why they yes, have... Well, I think it will be safer if Mole and I just... Sensible rat there spake the voice of wisdom. <laughs> uh, you and I and Mole... No, don't you bother, Badger. Mole and I can do it quite easily. When evenly. I go walloping, I go walloping. So do no. I! You do nothing of the sort, Toad! You've asked us to stay to supper, and we're staying to supper. Well, where is the supper? If this isn't your house, say so, and Mole can entertain us. The prisoners will help you get it ready, Toady. Oh, all right. Oh, don't forget the wine, Toad, because we shall want to drink your health. Yes. Oh, and you'll have to make a speech. <laughs> all right. That's all right. You leave that to me. Now then, a bustle up, you. Yes, sir, come up, sir. <laughs> Got a pencil in, have you? Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, I dare say all you young fellows are wondering what I'm writing. Please, sir, yes, sir. Well, I'm just jotting down a few rough notes. Oh, sir. Just a few rough notes for a little entertainment I've sketched out. A little informal sing-song or conversazione to celebrate my return. Yes, sir. Thank <laughs> you, sir. Something like this. Oh, 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 one speech by Toad. And then I make a note. There'll be other speeches by Toad during the evening just so as to reassure people. Yes, sir. Two address by Toad. Toad. <laughs> Three imitations of various bird notes. Tweet, tweet, you know the sort of thing. By a toad. <laughs> Four song by a toad. <laughs> Composed by himself. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Five other compositions by a toad. <laughs> sung by the composer. <laughs> Six song for he's a jolly good fellow. Sung by Badger Redmo. <laughs> <laughs> It's all just a few rough notes. Uh, could you give us a song now, sir? Uh, uh, give it to an eye. Please, sir. Oh, well, I don't know. Why won't you stand on this, sir? Well, perhaps. Oh, <laughs> now, now, this is just a little song. And it's called When the Toad Came Home. Uh, yes, sir. Maybe you'll sing it, sir. Oh, certainly, certainly. When the Toad Came Home. When the Toad Came Home. There was panic in the parlour, there was howling in the hall, there was crying in the cowshed and a snotting in the stall, there was smashing in our window, there was crashing in our door, there was bashing of the enemy who fainted on the floor when the toad came home. There was panic in the parlour, there was howling in the hall, there was crying in the cowshed and a snorting in the stall, there was smashing in a window, there was crashing in a door, there was bashing on the enemy who fainted on the floor when the toad came home. Toad, toad get down at once! Oh, it's no good, I know him, he's practically in a trance. Let him have his evening out. Talk to him in the morning. Talking's no good to toad. All the same, I'll talk to him. Let him have his hour first. Oh, all right. You know, I say there's something about that too. Would you, you can I come and dance with oh, you? It's very Young still is yes, well. if you'll excuse me, Badger, I love dancing as well. Oh, well, well, well. Well, well, uh, no, well. Uh, there was welcoming to Badger when he joined the merry throng. I could do it for a little, but I can't go on for long. Goodbye. Bye. Marigold, Marigold, wake up, dear. You've been dreaming. Nurse, nurse. 
It's time we went, dear. In Toad of Toad Hall, by A. A. Milne, Toad was played by Derek Smith, Rat, Bernard Cribbins, Mole, Richard Goulden, Badger, Cyril Luckham, The Judge, Hugh Paddock, Nurse, Diana Bishop, Marigold, Tina Heath, Alfred, Brian Haynes, Weasel, William Fox, Stoat, Fraser Carr, Barrett, William Slay, Phoebe, Kate Binchy, Usher, Terry Scully, Policeman, Ronald Herdman, The Washerwoman, Joe Manning Wilson, James Ferret, Sam Dastor, Henry Weasel, Nigel Graham, The Duck was John Forrest, and The Turkey, Andrew Rivers. The music was especially adapted by Peter Hope, and the play was produced by Martin Jenkins.